Space Rogues, The Epic Adventure of Will Calder, Space Smuggler, Book One. Written by John Wilker. Performed by K.C. Johnston. Part One, Chapter One. Jailbreak. The two prisoners, surrounded by almost a dozen Partharians, walk down the corridor of the battleship. There's no mistaking its design as Partharian. Octagonal walls with harsh white lighting and bare metal grating for the floor, with a faint odor of moss. The entire entourage is making their way towards the small prisoner's gallery for the prisoner's afternoon meal. Excuse me, sounded a voice behind the group. As the group turns, prisoners and jailers alike, they come face to face with a single biped standing in the corridor. The stranger is wearing a long brown coat over some type of spacesuit with integrated body armor. Their head is completely covered by a form-fitting helmet and face mask. The entire faceplate is mirrored and outlined in a blue glow. The intruder raises two pulse pistols into the air. Blasts ring out, dropping six of the Partherian guards. As the rest scatter, the two prisoners fall to the floor, the metal grating pressing against them. The stranger is still standing in the center of the corridor, the faint sparkle of a personal energy shield visible. Blaster bolts are striking the shield, causing it to ripple and flicker. The personal shield is absorbing more hits than most off-the-shelf models are capable of. It's clearly a modified version meant to handle serious abuse. The mystery figure leaps from one side of the corridor to the other, then runs straight at the remaining guards, leaping up and over them, firing with every step, guards dropping left and right. Within ten seconds, the remaining Partherians are unconscious. You know, you could have helped, the stranger says, moving to stand over the two prisoners, who are still lying prone and partially hidden by an unconscious Partherian. The prisoners crawl out from under their previously conscious captor. With what? Our shackled hands? A harsh rebuke, maybe? The female prisoner asks, frowning as she helps her companion up. Who are you? What are you? What do you want? Both prisoners are wearing standard Partherian prisoner coveralls, a single jumpsuit with pockets, a zipper up the center, numbers printed on the back and the right breast. Prisoner jumpsuit designs are apparently universal. The masked figure looks up and down the corridor, holding up one finger for quiet. We better go. I didn't go to the trouble of busting you two out just to get zapped by Partherians. More are coming, and they'll be more prepared than these goobers. The stranger turns and walks quickly down the corridor. Hey, wait, the female prisoner shouts. Where are you going? She and her companion run after the stranger, following the strange jumpsuit around a corner and into a side corridor. Here the deck plating has been lifted up and away, revealing a distinctly fresh burn hole in the hull. The edges are still faintly red. The stranger turns to the prisoners. Lucky the Partherians keep their brig on the lowest decks. Watch the edges. They're still a little hot. Without another word, the intruder jumps down the hole. Hearing shouts from down the corridor, the two prisoners exchange a glance and then follow the stranger into the hole, one after the other. Partherians aren't known for their intellect, but what they lack in the brains department, they make up for in size. Two meters tall and at least a meter wide, their corridors are wide because they are. To most other races, Partherian warships are distinctly ugly, apparently made with function in mind rather than form. They are angular and blocky, with thickly armored hulls and weapons everywhere. They resemble a child's toy block, with engines set into one face and weapons mounted on all the rest. This particular battleship is in deep space, transiting between a Partherian outpost world and the home system. Not sure it is good luck or not that this is the ship tasked with transport versus a faster courier-class ship, the stranger thought to himself. Landing with a soft thud thanks to the gravity field around the boarding tube. The intruder steps to one side. Ghost, get ready to go, he stated quietly, deactivating their personal shield and smoothly retracting the face shield on their headgear. He is human, 
somewhere in his mid-thirties and about six feet tall. Working, a sterile male voice replies. The prisoners land softly next to him. The woman looks at him. Human, she says, sounding as shocked as if their savior was a goldfish. If she knew what a goldfish was. While she does know what a human is, they're not exactly commonplace in this sector. Her tall companion looks just as confused. Do you want explanations or do you want to be as far away from that Partherian ship as possible? The human calls over his shoulder as he heads off, the prisoners hot on his heels. Our stealth shields will keep them confused for a bit, but the hole in the floor will be a dead giveaway, more so if we're still on the other end of that hole. From hidden speakers, the same cool male voice says, Boarding tubes retracted. Airlock sealed. Ready to depart. Great, thanks, the stranger says as the trio arrives at the bridge of the ship. He plops down into the pilot command station and begins working the console. And away we go! The ship lurches and tilts to one side as it increases the distance between them and the now fully alert battleship. The stranger flips a few switches just before the ship rattles and shakes. That's weird. They must have gotten some upgraded sensors from someone. Partherian sensors shouldn't be able to lock onto us that well. Ghost, deploy weapons and fire aft guns. Keep them busy. The ship lurches as the human pilot twists the ship this way and that, avoiding blazing plasma blasts from the battleship. Acknowledged. The sound of hull plating moving and mechanical parts adjusting and shifting can be heard throughout the ship, followed by the telltale whine of energy weapons firing and recharging. The ship lurches again. The prisoners are holding on to the rails. What's going on? What can we do? The woman asks. Sparks erupt from a nearby station and she rushes to it, her training taking over to check the position and extinguish any flames. The stranger is whipping the ship back and forth, evading the more powerful weapons fire. Damn it, he shouts. Hold on to something. He grabs a slide lever and pushes it forward to the stops. On the main display, the stars that were careening past steady, then stretched out into a flash of light. Their rescuer lets out a whoop and leans back in his chair. Well, he says grinning, that was exciting. The ghost. Once the ship has stabilized, the stranger pilot turns to his guests. Okay, now we can chat. Those big dummies won't be able to track us at FTL, so even if they've got better sensors than I expected, we're clear. He stands up and offers his hand. I'm Will, Will Calder. You're on my ship, the ghost. When neither of the prisoners reach for his hand, he holds his arms out expansively, spinning in a slow circle. The female prisoner, who has been walking from console to console in the crowded space, now turns. This is an Ankaran ship. It is less a question and more of a statement. You are good, Will smiles broadly, clearly impressed. I'd be surprised if you didn't identify it, but yeah, the ghost is an Ankaran raptor, though modified a bit over the years. Ankaran raptors are essentially pocket warships, small, fast, and agile, and with enough firepower to take on ships many times their size. The Ankaran are master shipbuilders, supplying many different races with warships, science vessels, and even commercial ships. The ships of all classes and sizes are made in the Ankaran shipyards. They're expensive, so they're usually rare outside of militaries, whether corporate or government-run, and well-funded research outposts. The Raptor space frame was popular for a time since it only required a small crew to operate, but could travel for extended periods of time and cover vast distances between supply stops. For years, the Ankaran sold to anyone with enough credits to pay their fees, until the GC and the Peacekeepers insisted on a more exclusive agreement. And you're Zephyr, Will says. No last name because that's what you peacekeepers do. And your big friend here is Maxim. Also, no last name. You're both peacekeepers, or were, until recently. Now you're fugitives of the Partherian hegemony. Maxim finally speaks up. 
We were set up. We're innocent. His voice is as deep as one might expect from a person as big as he is. His stoic appearance matches his tone. Everything that has happened so far doesn't seem to have phased him. He's right. We're innocent. We were framed. Zephyr looks Will up and down. Are you really human? Shrugging, Will glances at the console behind him. Honestly, I don't care. And yes, I am. Typical bounty hunter scum. Maxim takes a step toward Will. I wouldn't, Will warns. One word and Ghost will send a few thousand volts through you. Won't kill you, but you'll wake up with a killer headache. Raising her hands, Zephyr turns from Maxim to Will. What can we tell you to make you believe us? Handing us over to the Peacekeeper Command is a death sentence for both of us, and I assume you're not going to hand us back to the Bartherians. Is there a bounty? How much is it? Maybe we can pay more. Work off the debt or something. She pauses before looking at Will again. And really, you're human? Since when are humans out here? I didn't even know you had space flight. Has the GC lifted the ban? Will stands and walks over to another station. Bounty? There's no bounty on you. In fact, there's no record of you other than a news blurb buried in the feeds about two rogue peacekeepers captured by the Partherians for trafficking and contraband. The peacekeepers didn't even try to negotiate getting you back. Hate to break it to you, but you've been disavowed. As for your other question, yes, I am a human flesh and blood. Red blood, in case you were going to ask. As to how I got out here, it's a long story. I'm pretty sure I'm the only one which suits me just fine. And no, the GC hasn't lifted the ban. He starts flipping switches and adjusting settings. Zephyr assumes he's getting ready to make a call to Peacekeeper Command. Look, she says, whether you believe us or not, or even care, it doesn't matter. We're trying to stop a war. The peacekeepers are planning to stir up a few regional brush fires to force unaffiliated systems to join GC. We found out and got set up. I'm guessing the Partherians got an anonymous tip that a peacekeeper shuttle was carrying contraband through their territory. And what do you know? They found us. Our superiors hid something. We were never told what it was we were accused of carrying. Will looks up from what he is doing. Go figure, right? Group calls themselves peacekeepers, works for the hugest galactic government. You'd think they'd consider it a job well done, with the peace and all, but nope. Always looking for more reasons to exist and expand your power base. Y'all are a lot like humans, you know that? Remind me to tell you about my bank. There's no need to insult us, Maxim says, a sour look on his face. So far he has not moved from where he stopped a minute before. Arms crossed, eyes scanning the small space. He's a big one, Will thinks. What he means is that greed is universal, Zephyr says, staring hard at Will. So if there's no bounty, why did you rescue us from the Partherians? Turning away from the display, Will gestures to the nearest seats and walks back to his pilot station. Tell me the whole story. We've got a while before we get there. Where? Maxim asks, taking a seat. Zephyr sits too and turns to Will. It's not that long a story, but here goes. Maxim and I are, were, part of a special operations detail. Our commander was a centurion named Janus. At this, Will makes a face, but Zephyr presses on. I was working on some signal intercepts from, from non-peacekeeper sources. When I stumbled across a feed that was Peacekeeper in origin, from the command complex I was in. Somehow it had been collected and bundled in with the intercepts, likely due to the destination. When I opened it, I saw that Janus and several other high-ranking officers in Peacekeeper Command were planning several attacks throughout the frontier, but not attacks by Peacekeepers. They were funding rebel groups to destabilize independent systems, attacks with the goal of creating panic to increase the need for peacekeeper services and, more importantly to them, peacekeeper ships. In these ships, nearly ten in all, systems, that is, ten new systems joining the GC 
would be huge, obviously. The data files must have had metadata tracking on them, because no sooner had I read the transcripts than I was summoned to Janice's office. The look on her face is pained. I take it you didn't go to his office, Will interjects wryly. How's the big guy here fit in? Zephyr looks at Maxim. No, I didn't. I called Maxim. He's my partner. Wait, like work partner or you two are bumping uglies? Will says, looking more interested than he has for the whole conversation, leaning forward. This is getting interesting. Bumping what? How dare you? Maxim leaps out of his seat, and before he can remember Will's earlier warning or take the five steps needed to cross the distance between them, Will utters an unfamiliar word and a bolt of blue current arcs from the ceiling, cutting through Maxim to the deck plates and dropping the huge peacekeeper to the ground. Maxim! Zephyr is out of her seat and at his side in a blink of an eye. Will barely even reacts. Okay, then. That answers that. Oh, and he'll be fine. It's a very mild shock, especially for a peacekeeper. I did warn him. You were there. You heard me. This isn't my fault. As he speaks, Maxim starts to stir, and Zephyr helps her colleague back to his seat. After a few muttered words, something, something human, she turns to Will. Yes, he's my lover. I told him what we'd found, and we'd agreed to flee, to take the information to Tarsus. We were en route when the Partherians attacked us. Will looks Zareth in the eye. Cool. I actually don't care, but it's good to know as much about your crew as possible. To say his smile is broad would be an understatement. Ghost, please show our new crew to their crew quarters. One of the larger berths, please. Acknowledged. The cool male voice of the ship replies. The door to the bridge opens and a wall panel lights up. Please follow the illuminated wall panel. Helping Maxim out the door, Zephyr turns back to face Will. Thank you. Are all humans as, well, weird as you? You've no idea, he says, already turning back to the pilot console, as the door to the bridge closes behind them. Breakfast The ship's central crew space is made up of a lounge area, a kitchenette with a table, built into the side of the room, and a few other bits and pieces to make the space somewhat homey. So, where are we going? Zephyr asks from across the table. She and Maxim had been holed up in their quarters since the previous night. Their quarters aboard the ship aren't half bad considering the type of ship this is. Will had the computer keep an eye on them when he finally went to bed, and when he woke up, they were both in the galley cooking. Good morning, you two, Will says, punching buttons on a machine. We're going to fury. He holds up his hand as both of their heads snap around to face him, mouths making what would be in other circumstances a comical O shape. Hey, don't burn that bacon, it's the last until I get more. What's bacon? Maxim asks before Zephyr makes a signal to cut him off. Fury is a hellhole, even the peacekeepers don't like to go there. Maxim mutters, going back to shoving the bacon around the pan. He's not wrong. Zephyr says, not taking her eyes off Will. She is still in her prisoner jumpsuit, just like Maxim. But at least it looks and smells like they've showered. No, he's not, Will says calmly, still focusing on the machine. And I completely agree. Unfortunately, that doesn't change anything. We're going to Fury. We're going because you two need new identities. And there aren't many places to do that. You also need gear. I've got some spare this and that, but you'll need your own stuff too. Especially things that need to fit right and weapons you like to use. The machine he's harassing finally makes some grumpy sounding beeps and a few thunks before beginning to dispense coffee. Now we're talking, he sighs, sliding bacon onto a plate in the center of the table. Maxim turns to Will. We have no money. Zephyr, who had gotten up, now sits next to him with a bowl of something Will doesn't recognize and starts scooping steaming piles of it onto her and Maxim's plate. Where'd that come from? Will wonders. 
She looks over at Will, eyebrows raised. He nods. Why not? She drops a pile of steaming something on a third plate. Maxim grabs some bacon, putting it on his plate. We have no money, he repeats. Then he takes a bite and his eyebrows shoot up in surprise. This is delicious. Will smiles. I know, right? On behalf of all humanity. You're welcome. We don't have much to offer the galactic community, but we do have bacon. As for the money, consider it a loan against future payment, future cuts, whatever. I can't use you if you're easily tracked. Still running around in Partherian prisoner jumpsuits. He sniffs the pile of something on his plate and digs in, shoving a piece of bacon into his mouth with it. I don't know what this is, he says, or where you found it in my galley, but it's not bad. He takes a moment to chew his food and then adds, There's a few shops I trust down there, and a hacker I know who can get you new wrist comms and idents. They watch as he shuffles a few more bites of the mysterious stuff and bacon into his mouth. Then he takes a sip of his coffee and continues. There's also someone I need to see. We're gonna need some money. It wasn't cheap figuring out where you'd be. Plus, now outfitting you as well. It's not my first choice for work, but it'll pay well. Whatever it is, and as far as things go, I trust the source. Trust might be a strong word to use, Will reflects ruefully. But he doesn't have many friends in the sector. Zephyr grabs another strip of bacon. This really is quite good. Bacon, you said? What's it made of? Will grins and stifles a laugh. Ask me another time. Humans, Maxim says, watching the display before turning to his food. Fury. Fury is one of those planets that no one wants to be on, but is still somehow overcrowded. A mix of people are to be found there. Some are there to prey on others. Some have been left behind for various reasons, and some simply don't know any better. Then there are those who fall in the none of these categories, who tend to be the most dangerous of all. Each time he comes to Fury, Will tries to carry himself like he is part of this fourth group. It mostly works, like walking through a tough neighborhood as a kid, trying to look like you belong, like you are tougher than those around you, hoping that everyone buys it. Or in the very worst case, just acting like the craziest person around. Will has done both on Fury. The ghost sets down on a landing pad near the outer edge of the spaceport. Even though it is by no means a large ship, its size means that it can't fit closer to the center, where the smaller personal yachts and many cargo haulers dock. Also, Will has noticed that its very nature tends to make spaceport controllers want to keep it tucked away from the most foot traffic. Warships, even small ones, even sitting on the ground, make folks nervous. So they usually try to keep them out of sight. As the cargo ramp hits the surface with a soft thud, Will walks out, followed by Zephyr and Maxim, who finally changed out of their prisoner jumpsuits. Zephyr has found a pair of maintenance overalls to wear, likely left over from before Will took ownership of the ghost. And Maxim is trying to make do with some of Will's clothes, and it's barely working, Will realizes, looking the peacekeepers over. Okay, you two, take this. He hands them a PAD, P-A-D-D, -D, a personal AI data device. At least that's what Will assumes it means. He's never actually asked anyone, but everyone he ever met knows the name. It's a map and list of places to go. It also has your allowed budget. And it's tied to the ghost and my wrist com. Meet me back at the ship in six talks. If you get done early, then when you get to the ship, just ask for access. It'll call me and I'll let you back in. I assume this doesn't need saying, but I'm going to say it anyways. The flight deck and engineering spaces aren't accessible to you without me around. He looks at them both. Also, don't do anything to draw attention to yourselves. The peacekeepers here on Fury would rather not deal with issues... But if anyone has been paying attention to the wanted bulletins, you could end up in trouble. Also, don't get killed. And where will you be? Zephyr asks, already thumbing through the list on the pad. Aren't you worried we'll run out on you, not come back? She glances up from the list, looking Will straight in the eyes. By all means, I'm not entirely convinced you're going to be worth all this effort. 
but I'm curious and bored, so he shrugs. Oh, and also, where would you go? You've only got the funds I gave you, which the pad will only disperse at the locations assigned, and we'll lock down if I suspect anything and send it the necessary command. And even if you run out on me, after your shopping spree, where would you go? No ship, no friends, wanted by the Partherians and, by extension, the Peacekeepers. As for where I'll be, none of your business. He has a point, Maxim says, before turning and walking away. Zephyr stares at Will a moment longer, then follows after the large ex-Peacekeeper. Will watches them go, turns to his wrist comm, and dials up a comm listing. He whistles a tune, singing under his breath. Walk like an Egyptian, da da da. Oh, hi, yeah, is uh, Zarix there? Tell him it's Will Calder. Yeah, he'll know me. Just do it, jeez. Cool, I'll be there in a half talk. He closes the connection and whistles a little more. Blonde waitresses take their trays, they spin around, and they cross the floor. He chooses a different exit out of the spaceport than the two ex-peacekeepers took. It's a 15-minute walk from where the ghost is docked to the nearest pedestrian exit. The spaceport is designed like every other spaceport Will has ever seen. Essentially a massive stadium-shaped hangar with no roof. The structure itself is a mix of government offices and for-rent commercial space, mostly import-export businesses, some tourist companies and the like. The spaceport is only about five stories tall, but is at least a kilometer in diameter, with several hundred ships spread out around the interior space. Chapter 2 Shopping The two ex-peacekeepers walked through the crowded streets of the spaceport shopping district. Will had no clothes to fit either of them on board the Ghost, and Maxim is eager to get out of his two-sizes-too-small outfit. The first stop on their list is a clothier. The note attached to the map reads, Don't get fancy. Love, Will. The shop isn't overly impressive, though it has a front door, which itself is quite an accomplishment for Fury. As soon as the two enter, the shopkeeper emerges from the back room. It is a small creature. Zephyr isn't really sure what race, but it's definitely bipedal, and has all the right body parts she expects in all the places she expects them, at least as far as she can see. Hello there, travelers. You've come to the right place, it exclaims, suddenly revealing two sets of arms, all four of which wave emphatically. It looks them both up and down. Don't we have our work cut out for us? I'm Mordo, owner of this fine establishment and master clothier. He points to Zephyr and then to one of the dressing rooms. You, in there. Then to Maxim. You, in that one. My, you're large. You know that's an extra fee for using so much fabric. Two hours later, the two leave the shop in a waving mordo with several bags under each arm, clad in entirely new outfits. Zephyr looks over at Maxim. This might become difficult if each stop ends with so much merchandise, and clothes are likely the lightest of our purchases. Zephyr is not sure she's ever owned this many clothes, and they have spent less than three quarters of what Will assigned to them. Maxim grunts his agreement. He looks left and right, then lets out an ear-splitting whistle, and a small cart bot comes trundling towards them. It stops a few paces away and opens a hatch in its cargo area. Please place items inside the cargo area, it chirps. Will this rental be a one-stop fare, or shall I follow you for more shopping? The hatch closes and Maxim moves to place his thumb on the small biometric reader and stops suddenly looking at the bot. Passcode only, he says. No biometrics and follow us. There'll be a few stops. The bot takes a moment, then replies. That method is less secure. Please verbally accept the updated terms, then provide passcode. Maxim sighs. I accept the updated terms. Your passcode is Terminus. Bravo. Nine. One. Eight. Four. Four. Delta. End passcode. Accepted, the bot replies. Follow us. Maxim looks at Zephyr, smiling. She enjoys seeing him like this. It's so rare. He waves both hands at her. See? Problem solved. Zephyr checks the pad. 
crossing off the first item on the list, clothes, and looks at the next item. Smiling, she holds the pad up for Maxim to see. He smiles too. Finally. They head off in the indicated direction to find a weapons dealer named Prux. Prux turns out to be an old and scarred Quillant who, aside from being an arms dealer, owes Will a favor or two. The two ex-peacekeepers are like children in a candy shop. They start in the front with the pistols and grenades, picking things up, holding them, aiming them. Some get put back on the wall, others into a small bin Prux is holding as she follows them around her shop. After the pistols and assorted small arms, they move on to rifles. And as Maxim puts it, the fun stuff. After an hour of happily grabbing weapons, comparing them against others, changing what's in the bin, and then changing them back again, Prux leads them to the back of the room. I have something special, she says, that I think just might be right for you. Meetings Will walks confidently into the bar. At least, he thinks of it as a bar. It kind of looks like a TGI Fridays, except instead of tchotchkes everywhere, this place has small animal skins, weapons, and various bits of technology he can't readily identify. The crowd is what you'd expect at a shithole bar, near a shithole spaceport, on a shithole planet. As such, Will is armed with his personal shield charged and ready to activate at only a simple hand gesture. The place is dark, but it isn't hard to know where Zarix will be. He's usually in back, at a booth with the privacy screen active, two guards of unidentifiable race and gender standing ready on either side. Sure enough, straight back from the door, Will sees exactly that. He heads to the bar and makes eye contact with the barkeeper. Give me a grum. He touches his wrist comm, sending the payment as the barkeeper hands him a glass of something that looks and tastes like a beer. Will has never figured out how grum is made, or what it's made from. If he's honest with himself, he doesn't want to know, since real beer is nearly impossible to get without a trip home, and that's not high on his list of things to do anytime soon. He takes his drink to the back of the bar in the direction of the booth and the two goons. They watch him coming and don't move until he's right in front of the booth's privacy screen. Then they each take a step towards the middle, creating a wall of goon right in front of him. Hi, goons! Will says cheerily, he's expecting me. One of the goons lifts his wrist comm and whispers into it. Since the thing isn't speaking standard, it could have shouted. Will wouldn't have understood it any better. A few seconds pass, then something chirps on an earpiece. One goon looks at the other goon and nods. Without a word, they part, and the privacy screen fades away with a shimmer. Will slips into the booth. No sooner has he scooted to the middle of the bench than the privacy screen reactivates with a slight pop sizzle. He can still see out through the hazy energy barrier, but now no one can see in. He knows. Well, well, if it isn't my favorite. What are you again? The being across the table from Will, Zarix, is a trend ball, and a particularly ugly one at that. Standing about two meters tall with two arms, two legs, a prehensile tail, and a face like a velociraptor, the Arquillians are a pretty scary race. Most are pacifists. Zarix is not. Will had met him shortly after acquiring the ghost, when he needed some funds in his account, and he'd been happy to take whatever job Zarix needed doing. Some of them still woke Will up at night, even now. Will took a sip of his grum, never taking his gaze off Zarix. Arquillians have wide-set eyes, so looking one in the eyes is often impossible. Will chooses instead to stare at a spot in the center of the crime boss's head. I'm a human, you ugly lizard. He smiles at the look of incomprehension on Zarek's face. You have work? Zarek shakes his head, making a combined hiss and clucking sound, which never fails to freak Will out. I didn't think you were taking those types of jobs anymore. Well, since I was in the sector, I figured I'd say hello and check. I'm not looking for anything too out there, but I picked up some crew I could use an easy win to get the bank accounts back up to where I'm comfortable. Zarix makes a show of consulting his risk com as if he keeps a file called Super Sketchy and Illegal Things to Hire Out for .txt on it, then looks up at Will. Well, 
You're in luck, my human friend. I do have something not too out there that might be just the right thing for you in that ship of yours. The past. Mission Control. This is Discovery One. Do you read? Will Calder, NASA astronaut, is looking at a dead console. This is not good, he mutters before repeating his call. The mission had been going smoothly, with this small experimental space pod operating within all expected areas. The small revolutionary power plant was running. The energy-filled emitters were all properly charged leading up to the experiment, and the navigation settings were locked into the beacon orbiting Jupiter. So what had gone wrong? The pod is now drifting in empty space. Will can't see any planets anywhere, which might mean he was just past Earth or Jupiter or somewhere in deep space. If he can just get the power plant rebooted, it had scrammed when whatever it was had happened. Then that'd be a start in figuring out where he was. The navigation system is, in theory, so advanced it can pick out his location just by comparing the visible stars until it finds a familiar constellation. But that has only been tested in limited ways back home, so... Unfortunately, NASA opted to send a moderately smart but very skilled pilot on this first mission instead of an engineer or physicist or astronomer, all of which are skills that would be valuable right about now. Okay, here we go. Will mutters to the pod as he wiggles around in his seat to get access to the small hatch into the reactor compartment. He silently crosses his fingers that he doesn't have a spacewalk. I hate spacewalks, he thinks to himself. Discovery One was never designed to be worked on in situ, but certainly allowances had been made given the unknowns. Will hadn't thought much about it before, but he is happy for all those allowances now wriggling around in the cramped access space behind a seat. He is fussing with a component when something clicks, and boom, lights start coming back on. Mission control, he says quickly. This is Discovery One, transmitting in the blind. I've got the reactor restarted and am waiting for it to complete its spin-up cycle before I try any other systems. Will knows this broadcast is likely a waste of time, and possibly air if he can't get the scrubbers up and running, but it's policy. Apparently it has helped astronauts in this situation to stay sane longer. Will has his doubts, but he follows protocols. The console in front of him beeps, then one by one, lights and displays stay to wake up. It's so good to see you all, Will says, slapping the console. I hope you have good news for me. Within minutes, the entire pod is back online, reactor at 100%, life support at 100%, navigational sensors at 100%, maneuvering thrusters at 100%, FTL field generator offline. Shit! Will punches the console with the FTL field generator controls on it. Well, hell. Mission control, this is Discovery 1. All systems have successfully rebooted, except one. The FTL field generator seems to be offline. I'm going to try and restart it again, see if it's just a software bug. I honestly don't know what I'll do after that. Two reboots later and the computer still reports that the highly experimental device, designed to create an energy field around the ship to propel it faster than light, is offline. Over 100 automated drone tests had gone perfectly, all the way to Jupiter and back. This is only the second manned attempt, and Will is now adrift somewhere around the orbit of Neptune, very far from Jupiter. He's tried all the diagnostics he can from inside the pod. It might be spacewalk time to get out and check the exterior of the pod. It's difficult to imagine something is wrong out there. There's been no collisions, and technically the FTL field generator had worked the first time since it got him here to the outer edge of the solar system. But what else is there to do? Sit here and do nothing? Will knows no rescue is coming. At least with life support working, he's able to cycle air out of the cockpit and store it, versus having to lose it, which would mean opening the pod to space. Unfortunately, that's as far as the good news goes. The pod is fine. All the emitters are where they should be, 
and look undamaged. Well, shit. Will stands on the pod, his magnetic boots holding him on its surface. There's nothing to see in any direction but stars. There are worse views, that's for sure, he says, debating whether it'd be better to die standing here atop his crippled craft or go back inside and have a few more days of life with the rations and life support system running. Tough call. He climbs back into the pod and closes the hatch. At least for now, he's not completely without hope. But there's still time to change his mind, of course. Clean Slates The last stop on their shopping trip is the one Zephyr has been dreading ever since they left the ship. They're standing in front of what might be considered a storefront, except there's nothing to indicate that it's open for business or ever has been. And a lot to indicate, or at least trying to suggest, that it's presently abandoned. But the address is on Will's map. So this must be the place. She looks around, then knocks on the door. After a minute, she knocks again. Still nothing. Looking at the pad, she sees a note from Will attached to this entry. Knock three times, then two times, then five times. Oops, did it wrong. She looks up at Maxim, then knocks the pattern in the file. She shrugs. The door opens a crack. It's dark inside the store. Who are you? A high-pitched voice says from about Maxim's waist level. Will, uh, Maxim, what did he say his last name was? Wait, I remember. Calder. Will Calder sent us. He's a human. Says he knows you. The door opens wider. Come in, then. A small three-fingered hand waves them in. As soon as the door closes, the lights come on, slowly, so it's not too blinding. But Zephyr immediately sees that they're standing in an anteroom behind the storefront, one that's apparently well-protected. The fields she can see shimmering are far more powerful-looking than just privacy screens. Behind the door is a small creature, green, about a meter in height, wearing a multi-pocketed jumpsuit with various tools tucked in here and there. Brillac, she thinks the race is called. So, what do you want? The creature asks, walking back towards one of the screens, which shimmers as he passes through it. I'm busy. The field stays powered down, so Zephyr and Maxim follow, finding themselves in a workshop. Screens and wrist comms are lying everywhere in various states of disassembly. Parts from things Zephyr can't identify cover most of the workbench surface. We need new identities, she says. New wrist comms, the works. You got credits? The small creature hops up on a stool in front of a bank of monitors. The works ain't cheap, and there's no bulk discount. Zephyr accesses the section of the pad marked for this part of their shopping trip and sends the funds. We'll need our records completely wiped, everywhere, even in Peacekeeper datasets. You came to the right guy, then. I can do it. It'll take about a talk. You can wait over there. The creature points to what looks like an attempt at making a comfortable lounge. Zephyr catches Maxim's grimace. One at a time, they are asked over to the bank of consoles in this place to rest their palm on a reader. They have no idents. The Partherians had taken them. Well, you two are in some deep dren. Will is certainly hanging around interesting company these days. Partherians and peacekeepers? Grolak. That's a lot of trouble. The creature looks up from his array of screens. Will hooked you up. Ben Ari is the best. Zephyr assumes he means himself. You have wrist comms? He holds out his tiny green hand. No, sorry. We'll need new ones. Will rescued us from a Partherian battleship. All we had on us was the jumpsuits they put us in. The funds we just transferred should be sufficient. When the small being looks like he's about to start negotiating, Maxim does his best grimacing growl. Fine, fine. Go pick out what you want from the fabricator. Ben Ari waves his hand towards the opposite corner of the room. The fabricator is an older model, but it's still loaded with plenty of designs. Maxim picks out one that is as close to a military design as he can get, all angles and bulkiness. He places his arm in the scanning area and watches as a beam of light passes up and down his forearm. Zephyr selects a more sleek design, contoured to her forearm. From across the room, Ben Ari says only, 
Excellent choices. Then he gets back to work. Chapter 3 Time to go. Ben Ari is working at his terminal, muttering to himself. Maxim and Zephyr are sitting in the customer lounge, watching an episodic vid drama set on a space station. Suddenly, the diminutive alien jumps from his stool, knocking over a piece of equipment that neither ex peacekeeper recognizes. Were you two followed? He shrieks. He taps on his wrist comm and energy fields spring to life around the front entry area. Maxim and Zephyr look at each other. No, and we didn't even leave our cargo bot outside. We sent it to the spaceport to wait. Why? Both are standing now, looking tense. Ben Ari runs back to the primary workstation and tosses them each a wrist comm. These are done. We have company. Someone must have spotted you. He waves his hand in a gesture that must have been a trigger motion, as several screens light up suddenly, showing external views of the storefront. At least a dozen peacekeepers are standing in the street outside the front door. One of them is holding what looks like a doorbuster, a device designed to hack into a door security protocols, and failing that, to generate an explosion to blow said door in. Maxim and Zephyr both draw their newly acquired sidearms, looking around for defensible positions. There's no shortage of junk in the space, but none of it seems like it'll stop a blaster bolt, and certainly not a dozen or two of them. Good luck! Ben Ari screams from a doorway that neither ex-peacekeeper could say was there a moment ago. It is already starting to close after him. Wait! Zephyr calls, racing towards the closing door. She reaches it just in time to jam her pulse pistol into the gap. Come on, Maxim! He rushes over, and they both pry the door open just enough to slip through. The door clicks closed behind them, and up ahead they see the small Braylac trundling along a secret hallway. Ben Ari groans loud enough that they can hear, then shouts over his shoulder, Come on, then. You better not slow me down or get me noticed and killed. Somewhere along the way, the small green-skinned being has grabbed a scaled-down energy rifle. Maxim decides to ask about that later. They're in a hallway running along the back wall of the store, which reaches well past where the store ended. Does this hallway go into the shop next door? What is next door? Maxim can't recall. He's getting sloppy. He can't remember whether it was open or closed or just an abandoned shop. He'd never have made that mistake a cycle ago when he was a peacekeeper. Lives depended on knowing these things. They've barely run five meters when the building shakes. Through the wall, they can hear shouting. The breach team is following peacekeeper protocol, announcing themselves loudly while stunner grenades explode all around. The sound of failing energy shields can clearly be heard, too. It is doubtful Ben Ari expected his defenses to come up against peacekeepers. Is this hallway shielded? If not, the peacekeepers will pick up their body heat in seconds. Seeming to sense Maxim's thoughts, Ben Ari calls back, Don't worry, I've reinforced this hallway. We should be clear for at least another few ticks. Then you two are on your own. I don't want you dragging me down or getting me shot. Maxim growls under his breath. Without warning, Ben Ari breaks left through a hatchway that's barely visible in the wall. Suddenly, they're in the alley behind the shops, about four stalls down. There's trash on both sides of the door, and Zephyr realizes that this is intentional. Behind the piles, they're clear of the secret hallway and able to look up and down the alley without being seen by anyone else in the alley. A good thing, because six peacekeepers are standing around the back door of the store Ben Ari recently called home. Okay, bye, the creature whispers to them before heading off in the opposite direction. Maxim isn't even sure he knows the name of the spaceport or the city that surrounds it, but he assumes it's a common name to match the nondescript nature of the place. All that's visible is rundown buildings, shops, and residences. Nothing looks new, certainly nothing shines, as it's all uniformly covered with a layer of grime, which he can only hope is just dirt. You know where you are, right? Zephyr whispers after the retreating hacker. You're not safe either. Help us get to the spaceport, and we can keep you safe. Will will keep you safe. Ben Ari stops and stands for a few seconds, considering. Then he turns his head. Fine, 
Come on. He continues on, this time at a run. The three are soon running as fast and as quiet as they can, the small green-skinned hacker in the lead, winding this way and that through what feels like progressively more disgusting alleyways. Where are we going? Maxim whispers. Luckily, his peacekeeper training means that even as fast as Ben Ari is running, it's no more than a fast walk for Maxim. The spaceport isn't in this direction. I know that. You think I don't know that? I've lived in this piece of crap joint for the last five cycles. You think I don't know where the spaceport is? Ben Ari screech whispers, without turning his head. I have a cache a few blocks from here. We'll stop there, then head to your ship. As far as the two ex-peacekeepers can tell, they're not being pursued. There's no indication they were seen leaving Ben Ari's workshop. Knowing what to look and listen for, both are as certain as they can be that no drones are following them. It isn't a 100% certainty, but it is the best they can manage. Peacekeeper drones are meant to be quiet, but not silent, which is a good thing. Peacekeepers don't launch drones unless they need to, so it's possible they aren't taking this issue seriously, given the location. Ben Ari comes to a stop, brushing dirt and grime off a control pad next to a door that looks nearly rusted shut. He punches in a code and with a louder than ideal groan, the door slides inward. Squeezing through the gap, the little hacker whispers back, Come on, push that closed when you get in. When Zephyr and Maxim enter the small space beyond, they find themselves speechless. No more than three meters wide in each direction, the room is packed with shelves and piles of equipment and weapons. Ben Ari is running from rack to rack, climbing, grabbing, tossing. He's swapping out things he has in his pockets for new things, none of which Maxim or Zephyr recognize. The pockets of his jumpsuit are beginning to bulge, and there's a large pack in the middle of the room nearly full. I just need another minute, he pants. What's the rush? Maxim asks, just as the lighting shifts from harsh white to red. A speaker hidden somewhere in the room emits three sharp beeps, then goes silent. What was that? Maxim and Zephyr are looking all around the chamber. That, you big jinx, means they're here. Well, not here, here, but on this block. Someone tripped one of my early warning sensors. They're placed all around the ends of the alley. Ben Ari climbs down one set of shelves, drops something in the pack, and is immediately up another set of shelves rummaging around for something else. They must have a drone or two in the area and it spotted us leaving. The alarm means they're in the alleyway we just came from. How are we going to get out of here? Is there another exit? Zephyr asks, looking around the room, not seeing another door or a hallway, other than the one they've come from. It's not an ideal space for a last stand, but at least the doorway is a natural choke point. Dropping back to the ground and slipping another unidentifiable piece of tech into the pack, Ben Ari closes the pack and looks at the ex-peacekeepers. I hope your sense of smell isn't very strong. He hefts the bag and shoves some things aside to reveal a grate in the floor. Oh no, whispers Zephyr. Please no. The team grows more. Will is walking back through one of the food vendor's alleys when he sees a troop of peacekeepers crossing to the next intersection, heading for, among other things, the shopping district. It could be anything. Peacekeepers aren't exactly commonplace on Fury, but seeing them isn't unheard of. Even on a planet like Fury, if the criminal is valuable enough, the peacekeepers will show up. Oh shit, Will mutters, as casually as he can, he whispers into his wrist com. Ghost, begin pre-flight procedures. He drops his arm back down without even waiting for the voice of the ship to confirm his order. Will turns down a street that will take him more directly to the spaceport. If his two new crew members are in trouble, they need to figure out on their own. If they can get to the ghost, he can get them off planet. But there isn't much he can do against a full squad of armed peacekeepers especially when there is likely far more than one squad. If word has gotten around about his crew members, they're screwed. Shit, 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 he mutters as he winds his way through the crowd and the stalls hawking all manner of food, or things that might be food. 
He has a sidearm, but a fat lot of good it'll do him in this scenario. As he crosses from the city into the spaceport proper, he sees two large peacekeeper troop transports sitting on the tarmac. Shit, 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 he mutters, as he walks as fast as he can, trying to look as inconspicuous as he can. Each transport holds two squads, so there are at least four full peacekeeper squads in the area. The downside of being the only human in the sector, at least as far as Will knows, is that you stand out in a crowd. Plenty of races look a lot like humans. Peacekeepers, for example, look pretty close, except for the spots, and the entirely different internal arrangement of organs, and the cranial ridges where their hair should be. Ankarans are similar too, except for the bluish tint to their skin, and the dexterous tail. A few others look similar, but no one seems to be an exact match. And so a human walking fast across the spaceport isn't that easy to ignore. Hey, you there, stop, an amplified voice rings out. Shit, Will mutters again and slows down. He concentrates on looking as innocent as he can. Who, me? He says, slowly raising his hands away from his side, the universal gesture for, don't shoot me. Where are you going? A peacekeeper walks up to Will, rifle at their side. With the face shield down, Will can't tell one trooper from another, which is likely done on purpose. Faceless armies are more terrifying, after all. What's your business here? Show me your ident, please. Oh, uh, me? I'm just going to my ship, officer. Did I do something wrong? Will tries to look sheepish as he transmits his ident from his wristcom. Well, it's an ident, one of many Will has purchased over the years. This one is from a small-time cargo hauler who barely makes the payments on his cargo ship. Hopefully the trooper won't be too nosy since there's no actual ship here at the spaceport that would match the record in the ident. Will is now rethinking his previous frugality when it comes to buying fake idents. What kind of name is Han Solo? The opaque face shield moves from the pad the trooper is holding to Will's face. Well, I certainly didn't just make it up. Is there a problem here? They seem to be just harassing people at random, so Will decides to play the umbrage card. See if he can't speed things along. Look, no offense, officer, but every fraction of a talk I spend with you, I'm not billing. He's tapping his foot now, doing his best to casually keep his long coat over his pistol. A weapon on fury isn't illegal, and it'd be more suspicious to be unarmed. But there's no reason to give the trooper any reason to start asking more questions or to dig deeper into Will's identity. The trooper holds up their pad so Will can see it. Seen either of these two? They're considered armed and dangerous. Well, at least Will knows for sure now why the peacekeepers are on fury. Someone must have spotted them on their shopping trip because right there in living color, using what's likely the prisoner intake photos from the Partherians, are Maxim and Zephyr. Nope, never seen them. They're Pelorians? Didn't know you guys ever went rogue. Or whatever. Will Tuts as the trooper lowers the pad. No one is perfect. They were last seen in the shopping district behind this spaceport, so be careful. And if you see anything, call it in. Don't engage them. Sure thing. I'll do that. That all? Toe still tapping, one hand on his hip. Will is looking as put out as he possibly can. That's it. Carry on, citizen. The trooper turns to walk away, and Will spins on his heel to head toward the back of the spaceport. It's going to be tricky, if not impossible, for Zephyr and Maxim to get to the ghost. Well, shit. All that money down the drain. He shakes his head. Now I gotta start looking for new sidekicks all over again. Fuck. Everyone's here. I might have to have my nose surgically removed after this. Her voice sounding nasally as her fingers pinch her nose. This is disgusting. You two can't turn your smell off? That sucks. Makes this much easier. Maybe try breathing through your mouth? Ben Ari suggests from the front of their little group as they trudge through the sewers under the spaceport. You sure you know where this ship is? Once we pop back up to the surface, I doubt we'll have more than a few fractions of a talk before a drone or some sharp-eyed trooper spots us. I'm still not sure being with you two is really the safe bet. 
but running around a spaceport is definitely a bad idea. If your map of this facility is accurate, the ship is where we point it, Maxim says, doing his best to breathe only through his mouth, but somehow still smelling the foul mix of, well, he doesn't know what and doesn't want to, and also somehow tasting it. As it is, he's convinced that they'll be burning their boots and possibly their pants the moment they get to the ghost. Such a waste of brand new clothes. A few minutes later, they come to a halt. The faint light from above is filtering down into the drain from a metal grate overhead. Ben Ari looks around and then down at the pad he's holding. Okay, I think this is as close as we're going to get to Will's ship. Big man, you hoist me up. I'll take a look around before we make a break for it. And if you don't see his ship, Zephyr asks, then we're well and truly Grolacked the little being says, for the first time sounding as deadly serious as the situation warrants. There are plenty of other gates, but I somehow doubt your ride is going to wait around forever for you to return, especially if he's picked up on the peacekeeper's presence. I can't imagine he likes you that much. Maxim lifts ben up above his head, and they hear the scraping of metal as the small hacker lifts the grate and looks around. You said it was an Ankaran raptor, right? He whispers down. Yes, Maxim answers as a small foot kicks him in the face. I'll never be clean again, he mutters, spitting something onto the ground. Then it's right there. Good job on the location, you two. It's maybe a hundred meters away. Smart to park it this far out. I don't see any troopers and drones would be a flight hazard. Okay, ready? He looks down at Maxim under his feet and Zephyr next to him. Both nod. Ben Ari slides the metal grate aside and leaps off Maxim's shoulders. He doesn't reappear. That little slime weasel, Zephyr hisses as she climbs up Maxim's back and out of the hole. Seconds later, she leans down, bracing herself to help the much larger man climb up out of the sewer. About halfway to the ghost, a tiny green being with a huge backpack is trotting as fast as his little legs will carry him. Maxim climbs up and out of the opening and slides the grate back into place. The two take off at a run for the relative safety of the ghost. As they overtake Ben Ari, they lift him and his huge backpack off the ground. Zephyr takes the bag while Maxim takes the wriggling and screeching Ben Ari. Don't make me drop you, Maxim hisses, and the little hacker goes quiet. As they approach the ghost, Zephyr sees Will sitting in a chair at the top of the cargo ramp, reading something on a pad. He puts the pad down on his lap and looks up at their approach, slowly raising a blaster pistol. You know, I didn't think I'd see you two again. I'm pretty impressed. Oh, hey, Benny. He waves as they stop at the foot of the ramp. Why'd you bring him with you? He points the pistol at Ben Ari. Ben Ari wriggles free of Maxim's grip as they enter the cargo area, dropping with a thud. You burned me, you crab neck. Peacekeeper stormed my workshop, then followed us to one of my caches. I can't stay here now. He stomps off up into the crew compartment of the ship, shouting back, Oh, and I saved them. You're welcome. Will looks at Zephyr and Maxim. Three things. First, unlock your bot, and I'll get it unloaded, since you can't be seen. He points to where the dutiful little cargo bot is sitting near the edge of the ghost's cargo ramp. Maxim hadn't even noticed it there in their haste to get on board. Then take those clothes off, toss them out on the tarmac, and get showered. He throws them some overalls, much like the ones Zephyr had worn into the shopping district. Maxim walks back down towards the bot, reciting his authorization code, and begins stripping out of his utterly disgusting brand new outfit. I like these boots, he mutters as he tosses them, grime encrusted, out of the hold. The Past Will has been sitting in his crippled space pod for a day, transmitting his automated distress call, watching the onboard diagnostics fail, then fail again, then again. He's debating his next steps. Stay here adrift for another, what, two days based on his supply levels? Or sit on the hull until his suit air runs out? Or there's always the small pill in a pouch on the chest plate of his suit, a pill every astronaut ever has taken with them on their missions. A pill none of them have ever had to use. Not exactly the first I was hoping for. 
He's reaching for the pill when a blinding light fills the small cockpit. What the? He can't see anything but the light. He's looking all over, trying to understand what's happening. As the light gets closer and closer, until he finally sees the edges of it, lowering down over his craft. Or is he rising? It's hard to tell in space with no other objects relative to him. As the light fades, he feels his pods settle on something. He looks around and sees he's in some type of ship. That much is obvious. It must be a cargo hold or shuttle bay or something. There are no other vessels around and it's not that large a space. So he decides it's a cargo hold. Why is he in it? He seals his suit. Who knows what atmosphere is out there? Neither his suit or the pod were designed to look for breathable atmosphere, let alone test it. Then he pops the hatch on the cockpit and crawls out. Damn this flight suit, he thinks. No external speakers or mic, so he can't talk to anyone he does find without opening the visor, or if they breathe methane, he's definitely toast. Shit. He can't see anyone. Maybe the ship is automated? Then he feels deck plates rumble a little and can feel footsteps. He spins around and sees three aliens standing in front of him. Two have weapons pointed at him. The other looks unarmed, but is wearing a long coat and some kind of spacesuit under it. None of them have masks on or any type of breathing equipment, but they're all very clearly different species. So they all breathe the same atmosphere. While Will looks at the trio, a fourth alien appears and walks over to his pod. It crawls up into the cockpit and connects a hand terminal to it. Aliens use Thunderbolt? Will looks at the three in front of him, then the alien crawling around his pod and back to the three. They're talking. He can see their lips moving, but his suit isn't set up for audio once sealed, so he can only hear muffled sounds. He's trembling, standing in front of four aliens two of which are armed and pointing their weapons at him. The one he assumes is the leader waves to get his attention. He, she, it. Will isn't sure, but assumes the alien is male. It makes a gesture that looks like he wants Will to remove his helmet. Well, I was about to commit suicide, so I guess if they breathe methane, the end result is the same, he says to himself as he unseals the helmet and lifts it up off his head. Hi there, the lead alien says. I'm Langsham, the captain of this ship, and you are? Uh, hi. Will blinks a few dozen times. I'm, uh, think it's damaged? One of the armed aliens asks Langsham, who elbows it in the side and makes a growling sound. I'm, uh, Will, Will Calder, from Denver, D Denver, Colorado, in, uh, America, the United States of America, um, on planet Earth. Will stammers. They speak English? He thinks to himself. Okay, well, hello, Will Calder, from Denvar, Colorado, planet Earth. As I said, I am Langsham. This is my ship, the Reaper, and we picked up your beacon. He looks over at the smaller alien still pawing at Will's craft. Anything we could use to sell? The small alien pops up out of the cockpit and wiggles one hand. Apparently, this is the universal gesture for, not really. Not a lot. Pretty primitive stuff. Surprised this one lived. Looks like maybe a first attempt at FTL? It looks at Will, who nods. Second, actually. Yeah, nothing here we can use. But we can probably strip it down for materials to melt down. Will turns at that. Hey, that's my ship you're talking about. He starts to move toward the craft, and the two aliens surrounding Langsham snap their weapons up, stopping Will dead in his tracks. Actually, it's my ship. Such as it is, it's salvage. Langsham's voice is calm. Technically, of course, you have to be dead for it to be salvage. So take care what your next words or actions are. They could be the difference between us taking you with us or us leaving you here. Langsham is a little over two meters tall. His skin has a bluish tint and his eyes are larger than humans and are a bright, startling yellow. Otherwise, though, he's remarkably human-like. He has four fingers and a thumb on each of his two hands on his two arms and a head about the size of a human's. 
There's no lanky, skinny body and oversized head like in the abduction movies. He's got white hair, too. The other three in the room are all sort of similar. The small one is a bit more alien abduction movie looking, bigger head, little body, frail looking limbs. It seems like this one has three fingers, not five. And he's only a meter or so tall. Okay, Will decides, the other two aren't that similar. They're a little taller than him and muscled. One is red and the other a milky white. The red one has small horns running upwards from his nose, right over into his bald head while the white one has greenish hair done up in a top knot on its mostly shaved head. Yeah, not that similar at all. Will looks the alien captain in the eyes. Oh, um, okay, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, NASA. Don't think you're gonna get your spacecraft back. Hope it's insured. For that matter, am I insured? Will muses. Chapter 4 underway. Leaving Fury was easier than Will had expected, largely thanks to an indignant hacker named Ben Ari. You know, you're pretty damn handy to have around, Benny. Will snickers. Maybe you can stay if you're always this useful. Benny turns and scowls at him from one of the stations on the small bridge. He's only been on the ship an hour, but the station has already been disassembled and rebuilt to suit the diminutive Braylax needs. It's your fault I'm here, you idiot. I had a good thing going on down there, and you and your goon squad screwed it up. Benny swivels around in his chair. Why would I want to be with you anyway? While Benny was ranting, Zephyr and Maxim have arrived onto the bridge. We saw your place. This, such as it is, is an improvement. Zephyr spreads her hands expansively. Benny glowers at her. It was my own place. I had clients that paid well. Those caches don't come pre-stocked, you know. It cost a fortune to set up and secure each one. Plus, what about my clients? They depend on me. Zephyr looks him in the eyes. They depend on you for illegal hacking. I'm sure they'll find another hacker. Growling and jumping off his chair, Benny storms off the bridge. Whatever. Maxim turns to Will. What's his problem? This ship needs some work, but it's not even a competition. His workshop was a pile of crap. Will walks over to one of the auxiliary stations and inputs some commands into it. A peacekeeper intel file appears on the screen. Ben Ares. You'll get used to Benny. He's a Braylac. They're all like that acerbic little assholes. But they're amazing with technology, like crazy amazing. Like Tony Stark amazing. Rumor has it they've all got tech embedded into their brains at birth to help them operate computers faster. Something about near-filled communications or something. So, we'll live with them. The file vanishes to be replaced with the default view of the Starfield at FTL. We've got a few days' travel time ahead of us. You two might as well go get all your stuff sorted out and put away. Zephyr leans over to Maxim. Who's Tony Stark? Your guess is as good as mine. As they walk to the hatch leading out of the bridge, Zephyr turns around. We'll be in the cargo hold if you need us. Will waves one hand distractedly. Walking down the main corridor of the ship, Maxim lets out a low whistle. Who'd have guessed this is where we'd end up? Zephyr looks up at him, then gets on her tiptoes and plants a light kiss on his cheek. At least we're together. And yeah, I thought we'd die in a Partherian labor camp. But now here we are. Adopted crew on a warship owned by a crazy human, of all things. Strange times, for sure. They cross through the main crew lounge, stopping in front of the hatch that leads to the upper section of the cargo hold. What should we do about the GC and the peacekeepers? They're still plotting to take over some of the unaffiliated systems. Zephyr opens the hatch, letting Maxim through. I don't know. We'll have to try and convince Will to do something. What that something is, though, I don't know. What can two peacekeepers, a Braylac and a human of all things, hope to do against the GC? The big Pelorian nods. Do humans have any superpowers? As they take the stairs to the main cargo hold, he adds, It would definitely seem like we have no options. No one would believe us if we went public, especially after escaping Partherian custody and being disavowed by the peacekeepers. They reach the pile of stuff they had brought, 
bags and boxes of clothing and equipment, also weapons. Zephyr pulls a pulse rifle out of a box, examining it. You know, this is almost as good as the one I had in the service. Who'd have guessed? Maxim looks at her and her weapon. Then he pulls a large, multi-barreled weapon out of its box. I can't wait to use this, he grins. Putting down her rifle, Zephyr walks over to a corner of the hold and grabs a hover sled. Here, let's put all the weapons and tech on this and take it to the staging room. They quickly load the sled, then just as quickly leave for their quarters. Thirty minutes later, looking a little disheveled, the two Pelorians come back to the hold and guide their grav sled through the ship, back to the staging room turned armory that sits between the two airlocks on the forward section of the ship. Looking at one particular box, Zephyr nudges Maxim. He's really going to freak when he sees what's in there. Maxim nods. I can't wait. Upgrades. The engineering space of the ghost isn't somewhere Will visits often. Not only is this a testament to the engineering prowess of the Ankar and shipyards, but also of how little knowledge he has about most of the stuff in there. Whenever the computer has indicated a problem, he simply paid to have a trustworthy shipyard work on the problem. This isn't the most cost-effective solution. But Will hasn't yet met an engineer he liked enough to let live on his ship. As it is, the sudden addition of three new crew members is having unexpected side effects. For starters, his habit of walking around in his boxers had to come to a screeching halt the day Benny saw him and fell into an uncontrollable fit of laughter for nearly ten minutes. But Will's in the engineering space now, looking around while listening to Benny prattle on about something he'd done to the computer to improve the efficiency of something. The details lost in the noise coming from the computer access crawl space. The main processor core is also located in the engineering area, making it almost impossible to hear anything. You did what? Will kneels down and shouts, then falls back with a yelp as a small green face is suddenly an inch from his. I said, and Benny crawls out of the access and replaces the cover, that I was able to adjust some of the learning protocols as well as some of the... Are you listening? Will is standing there, his eyes not focused on anything. Certainly not focused on Benny and his explanation. What? Oh, sorry, no. No, I wasn't. Give me the short version, please. Will hands Benny a power tool to secure the access cover. The computer can react faster to what's happening now. It'll learn faster from experience and is a tad more sentient. Benny has been in the engineering space for hours. Will's not sure if that's good or bad. Oh, okay then. Was that what you wanted to talk to me about? Nice work, by the way. Will starts moving toward the hatchway. Well, no. I could have sent you a report on these upgrades, or just not told you, since I doubt you'd have caught on anyway. I wanted to inform you that if I'm going to be here on the ship, we should get a few things straight. Namely, my role, my pay, and, more importantly, my shopping list. The computer lab, if that's what you'd call it, which I wouldn't, is so weak. Are those computers from your planet or something? I've seen more power in kids' toys. Benny begins to tidy up some of the tools that Will has never seen but clearly belong here since Benny puts them away in a drawer. The engineering space isn't huge, or at least the part of it that's supposed to be occupied by people. There's a main engineering systems diagram against one wall, a multi-function table-come-work area in the middle of the room, and two identical configurable workstations over by the engine. The engine itself is a massive, well, good size, reactor mounted at the back of the chamber. Will is thankful that the entire system is largely automated. When he took control of the ship, he'd have been screwed if he had to know how the engine worked. Since then, he's picked up the fundamental theories, but that's about it. Having Benny around might be more of a blessing than not assuming Will doesn't end up spacing him in frustration. Like I said, after we broke orbit, you're welcome to hang out here. I think having someone with your skills might be a huge win for us. As far as anything else goes, there aren't much in the way of roles here. It's my ship, my rules, and you and the Pelorians are crew. If that's not okay, then after we're done, I'll drop you off anywhere you like. So long as I'm already going there. And as for pay, well, here's the offer the other two are getting. Take it or leave it. 
15% of whatever we make from any job we do. Will holds up a hand when Benny's mouth opens wider than Will would have thought possible for a Braylek. The ship account gets 35%, and I get 20%. That's how it works. Close your mall, your teeth are freaking me out. Again, you can take it or leave it. Benny closes his mouth, and Will can see him thinking it over. Then, slowly, he nods. Good. Last thing, your shopping list. Let me see it if you're going to be here and be useful. I understand you need gear, and we'll get what we can. No promises on everything, but we'll see. Fair? Will stands up and heads over to the hatch, slowing just enough to let Benny answer. Fine. Sounds fair. Then welcome to my crew, Will shouts as he exits engineering into the main crew space. Settling in. When Will walks out of engineering, Maxim is sitting in the crew area with a fully disassembled pulse rival on the coffee table. Having fun with your new toys? Will asks. Maxim doesn't look up from his desk. Yes, it feels good to have equipment to work on. Thank you, he adds. Don't mention it. Will falls into a seat opposite the big ex-peacekeeper. Where's your girlfriend? The big Pelorian finally looks up from his desk, making a low kind of growling sound. Zephyr is on the bridge. He looks back down at his rifle. Will looks up at the ceiling. Computer, please have Zephyr and Benny join us in the lounge. Sure thing, Captain, comes the reply. It's the same voice Will had heard since he first got the ghost. But now it has personality? Um, what was that now? Will is looking around. Maxim looks up and shrugs. That's new. Computer. Are you working properly? I am functioning at 100% efficiency. All ship systems are normal. Why do you ask? This is getting weird, thinks Will. At that moment, Benny comes in from the engineering space. Pretty cool, huh? Like I was telling you before, I upgraded the learning algorithms and sentience protocols. You told me about this? Will looks at Maxim, who's still looking at him, and who shrugs again before looking back down at the rifle. Benny sighs and drops his tiny frame into the chair next to Will. Yes, yes, I told you about this. Then you got this goofy, well, goofier than normal look on your face, and kind of zoned out. Then I think you changed the subject, sir. Benny gives a fist-pounding salute of some sort, or at least Will assumes that's what it's supposed to be. Okay, one, never do that again. Whatever that is, again. Jeez, dude, you look like a green Nazi. Two, do you mean the computer's smarter, more interactive? Will is leaning forward, interested. Like, is the computer alive now? Benny almost falls out of the chair from the convulsions he's suffering, laughing as hard as he is. Oh, gods, I can't breathe. Is it alive? (laughs) Yes, you dumb... What are you again? (laughs) Whatever. Doesn't matter. No, it isn't alive. It's just slightly more interactive now. Has a rudimentary intelligence. Oh, well, that's good, I guess. Kind of a letdown, but whatever, cool. Will is a bit red. He mumbles. I was going to call it Jarvis. What's all the laughing about? Zephyr asks, coming in from the corridor connecting the bridge to the main body of the ship. She pushes Maxim over and slides in beside him at the kitchen table. Then she pulls out her own pulse pistol and starts breaking it down. Benny, in between deep breaths, wheezes, Will, thought I made the ship's computer into an AI. She looks from Benny to Will. Really? Will just shrugs. Okay, look, whatever, the ship isn't a super cool, super smart AI. It's just a little more personable. That's fine, whatever, moving on. He walks over to a wall-mounted display and brings up an admittedly crude drawing of the team. He hits a button and it comes to life. He starts narrating. This is us. I've told Benny this, but wanted you two to hear it too. On the screen, the animated crew goes through some kind of heist, robbing oddly drawn aliens with tails and long teeth, then dancing around with bags in each hand. What the hell is that? What's in the bags? Maxim is leaning forward over the table watching the movie. Is that supposed to be me? Will pushes another button. Now the animated crew is walking up the cargo ramp, depositing their bags in the hold next to a little piggy bank, the counter going up in increments with each bag dropped. I'm so lost, 
Benny says, looking from the display to Will, then the ex-peacekeepers. Are we feeding the big pig monster the money we just stole? Zephyr looks at the Braylack hacker. Money? Is that what's in those bags? What's that symbol mean? That's money? What's the pink thing? Will shuts off the display, letting out an exasperated sigh. Fine. I'll explain it the old-fashioned way. The Past The Galactic Commonwealth has been around for a few hundred years. Someone likely knows exactly how long, but the galaxy is comprised of two groups, those employed by the Galactic Commonwealth and those who do their best to never think of the GC and do everything they can to avoid it. Technically, there's also a third group, those who resist the GC, remaining independent, but this group gets smaller every year. The GC is made up of dues-paying star systems spanning right across the sector. Dues are mainly used to fund trade programs, pay the peacekeepers to police the sector, and other things along those lines. Typical government concerns only on a galactic scale. The planet Tarsus is the home of the GC, rich and opulent, or proud and snooty, depending on who you ask. Tarsus has spent hundreds of years being the center of the sector, the shining light of justice, government, and, to some, society, where the Pelorians are robust and aggressive the perfect species for galactic cops. The Tarsi are the perfect bureaucrats. They're only a meter tall, olive in color, and stand on four legs with antennae protruding from their bald heads. They're preternaturally calm at all times and love to argue. Their size has usually, at least until the last few hundred years, made them victims of other larger species. As a result, <laughs> they rarely leave Tarsus preferring to exert their considerable power over the rest of the sector via their police force and army, the peacekeepers. Why leave your comfy, luxurious world, after all, when you have the strongest army in all of space at your disposal? For most, the GC is just an annoyance which takes some of their taxes. They'll never visit Tarsus and never, if they're lucky, have a run-in with the peacekeepers. They'll live and die on their worlds or on their ships, no more than a blip to the GC. The GC is just a part of life. Unless, that is, you're one of the free systems. Systems with enough money, power, and allies not to need what the GC has to offer. Fewer and fewer systems like this exist. The GC, while espousing peace and goodwill among all, hates these gaps in its influence. While there are worlds like Fury which the GC doesn't want to waste the resources needed to rule them, there are other more attractive worlds and systems that the Tarsi want nothing more than to control. Possibly the only benefit that everyone agrees the GC can offer is their protection of underdeveloped planets. Long ago, the GC realized that races who haven't yet left their planet's orbit, let alone their star system, are at significant risk of exploitation easily preyed on by pirates, slavers, and conmen. After a few races were wiped out in this way and their planets looted, the GC realized that it had to step in. Now, when new races are discovered, their entire star system is put under protected status. That status is enforced by the peacekeepers, who randomly patrol protected systems. Their protection is strongest around the orbit of any inhabited planets, but extends to the system as a whole. Vessels caught within protected systems are shown no mercy. If they fight, they are destroyed. If they surrender, their ships are impounded and their crews imprisoned. No mercy, no exceptions. This is the only way the GC is found to protect these burgeoning systems and their delicate populations. Other punishments the GC had tried were sometimes deemed worth the risk, as the potential payoffs could be huge. Earth was discovered by a scientific exploration team chasing a comet. They picked up radio transmissions and followed them to the source. This was in the mid-60s, when Earth was first putting things and men into orbit and on the moon. As soon as they discovered Earth, the team put in a call into Peacekeeper Command, registering the location of the system. From that moment on, the entire Sol system has been off-limits to everyone. This will continue until the GC lifts the ban, or occupants of the system venture far enough out to make contact. After that, peacekeeper patrols have only ever caught two ships trespassing near Earth. 
Both were pirates, hoping to loot some treasures from a protected world. Both were punished, severely. No other ships have been found in the system. The Reaper and her captain knew better than their unlucky counterparts, staying in the outer planet's orbits, where the peacekeepers were less likely to scan or observe ships coming and going. It helped that Langsham only used the system to hide or wait for meetings, and that is exactly how he found Will. Part 2 Chapter 5 a job is a job. Two days into FTL, Will has the computer assemble the crew in the lounge again. When he arrives, everyone is already waiting. Okay, right, Will says. We're all here. I have to say this is the first time since I got the ghost that it's been more than just me for more than a few days. It's kind of nice, so, you know, don't screw that up. He looks right at Benny, who affects a stricken look on his large-eyed face. What? What did I do? Benny screeches, then dodges a pillow launched by Zephyr. Settle down, you animals, Will raises his voice. And Benny, whatever you are, you're part plant, right? Because I'm green? You racist prick! Benny plops down into his chair, glaring at Will. Then Zephyr and Maxim and back to Will again. Kidding, calm down. You're so sensitive. Will smiles at the two Pelorians, then winks at Benny. Look, we need to talk about the job I accepted. Zephyr and Maxim look at each other. What job? They say simultaneously. Then they look at Benny, who just shrugs. I was with you two on Fury, remember? How would I know? It's the job I took while you two were shopping, Will says. Before getting chased by your former colleagues. The job we'll need to do to get the ship's account back to a point that doesn't make me lose sleep, and that lets us ramp up with what we need, now that it's not just me. Okay, so what's the job? Zephyr is leaning forward, hands clasped, interested. A snatch and grab from one of our employer's rivals. They're a small station in the Barsoom sector, mostly a depot for folks to store things away from the prying eyes of the authorities. What authorities? Maxim asks. All of them, Will answers dryly. Apparently most of the major crime bosses and syndicates rent space on the station. Only they know where it is, or how to get aboard. What are we stealing? Benny seems interested. Valuable? Tech? No idea. I try to ask as few questions as I can when Zarix is concerned. Here's what I know. The station is in the Barsoom sector, uh, sitting out in open space. From what I'm told, there's a central reception area, well guarded by a private security firm, that answers to none of the clients. Whatever it is that Zarex wants, it's being kept on that station, in a section one of his competitors owns. A hologram begins hovering over the coffee table and then rotates and zooms in. Will continues. Zarex gave me a transponder ID that, once we're in the hold, should help ID the crate we want. But first, we'll need to get to the right hold. Apparently, there'll be trace isotopes we can scan for, but only in close. And I mean, like, at each door close, proximity. We'll have to go door to door to find the right one before breaking into it. Will looks at Benny. That's where you come in. I thought I'd have to hire a hacker when I took the gig. But thanks to a lucky turn of events, you're here. He smiles at the surly Braylack. I can do that. You don't even know what's involved, Zephyr says, looking over at Benny. Doesn't matter. I'm that good. The little hacker leans back in the chair, crossing his arms behind his head. Will smiles. That leaves the three of us. We're the muscle. I can get us into the central reception area, but from there, Benny will have to hack in and lead the way. If possible, I'd rather this be more a burglary than a fight. If it turns into a fight, we're screwed. Zephyr and Maxim look at each other, then it will. It is Zephyr who speaks up. Well, I doubt you were worried, but we're in. I wasn't, since it wasn't optional. Okay, then. Step one. We case the joint. Will zooms in further on the hologram. 
This map is as accurate as any that exists, I'm told. Technically, none actually exist. This was pieced together from various visits. He points to a lower portion. This is the docking station. The ship can handle four ships at once, but according to Zarix, the protocol is only to allow one ship at a time to dock. Maxim points to something. Looks like only one lift connects the two sections. That's a dangerous choke point. Will nods. Agreed. Hopefully, if needed, Benny can hijack the lift controls. At this point, Benny nods. The view comes up to the reception and vault area. It's a large circle, two levels tall. In the center is what looks like a control console marked as security. The lower level has 11 vault doors. The second tier has 12, equally spaced around the perimeter. The two levels are connected by a staircase. The team spends the next three talks looking over the plans, talking through ideas. Then a beep comes from Will's wristcom. We're getting close. Let's go see our prey. He stands and heads towards the bridge, and the others follow. Casing the Joint The Barsoom system isn't a very well-known one. It doesn't contain any habitable planets, and there is only one gas giant, so it's not worth fielding a mining effort. In other words, it's exactly the place you want to hide a secret storehouse of criminal loot. So, it's precisely the place a secret storehouse of criminal loot exists. The station, for obvious reasons, isn't listed on any of the navigational charts, and its reactors are shielded so that a passing ship, should one ever venture into the Barsoom system, wouldn't even notice the station. As if that wasn't enough, it's painted black, because why not? Are you sure we're in the right place? Zephyr asks, from her position on the bridge, where she is serving as unofficial first officer. Her station is configured to manage ship systems as well as the sensors and communications. It's there. We're still stealthed, right? I don't want them seeing us lurking around the outer edge of the system. Will looks over at Benny, whose station has been heavily modified in the last two days. The small Braylac is hardly visible behind all the equipment. Yep, we're fully stealthed and running passive right now, Benny answers. I'm looking for signals, but their game is good. Not a thing out here, but background radiation. Will adjusts the ship's heading and gooses the sublight drive a little to get them heading along a tangent to the station, or at least the supposed location of the station. The ghost has two modes of propulsion. The sublight drive, which works in space, but not in atmosphere, can drive the ship nearly to the speed of light. Just off the center of the body of the ship, on either side of the sublight engines, the atmospheric engines are immensely powerful and can provide enough of a push to propel the ship. The design of the Ghost doesn't provide for atmospheric lift, so the forward section of each FTL engine boom has a repulsor field generator, which provides the lift to keep the ship in the air. As long as the stealth systems stay active, we can skip a cold coast, but keep an eye on it. Benny nods in response. To Zephyr, Will adds, Keep an eye on the passives. This gets a lot harder if they've seen us before we arrive. She nods too. It might not have been a cold coast, but it still takes four hours before they see anything to make them suspect they're in the right place. In theory, they should be a billion or so kilometers from the station, with it down well and themselves up well. Not that it matters this far out in the system. Somewhere around the orbit of the fifth and second to last planet in the system. At this distance from the system's sun, it's easy to hold a position with minimal effort. Got something, Zephyr announces, looking up from her station to check the main display, which she's sending data to. The screen shift from the default view. Just stars as far as Will can see. To what she is looking at on her own screens. It looks like infrared, and the whole screen is almost entirely black. But in the dead center there's a slight red-orange-black color, no bigger than Will's fist. We're still pretty far, so can't get much without going active. But this is from our infrared sensors. That's got to be the station. They shield the reactors so you can't pick up the radiation and energy, but it's hard to dissipate heat completely. Though, I admit they seem to have gotten a pretty good system going. 
Will squints at the screen. Well, yeah, that's pretty impressive heat management. Okay, that's got to be our target. Benny, anything yet as far as signals? We're close enough to see the reactor heat. Surely there's something. Benny looks up from his console and shakes his head. Nothing. Not a stray wrist comping or unsecured transceiver. That place is a black box. Okay, that's not good. Might have to adjust our plan. Maxim has been silent for hours. So silent that Will jumps when the Big X Peacekeeper now speaks. Why does the plan change? Maxim is sitting at the weapon station, which, in the ship's current state, is purely for show. All weapons are completely powered down, including targeting scanners. Might have to get you a bell to wear, Will says. If they're keeping that tight a lid on signals, I'm guessing they've got the whole place set up as a Faraday cage. The instant we're aboard, we won't be able to communicate with Benny here on the ship and vice versa. The whole plan revolves around him getting into their system and guiding us. Will leans forward in his chair, staring at the main view screen and the bruised color smudge on the center. I might have a solution, Maxim offers. The plan. Will looks at the big Florian. Go for it, big man. What you thinking? Maxim looks over at Zephyr. Remember the mission to the Drillovian embassy? We had to have our hacker guide us through. Zephyr nods, understanding crossing her features. Yes, I think that could work. Let me look over the plan Zarix provided Will. Will looks at one, then the other. Mind sharing? Zephyr gestures to Maxim to continue. The ex-peacekeeper shifts in his chair. Our squad was sent to infiltrate the Drillovian embassy on Rostham 4. We didn't know the layout of the structure since they imported an all Drillovian workforce to build it, and the only known plans were in the secure server on the inside. The peacekeepers wanted to bug the facility and get a complete blueprint, so we needed to infiltrate the building, access the server, and copy the files. Our squad hacker faced the same problem we do. The embassy was immensely secure. So the on-site security forces would detect any comms instantly. That meant she had to be on-site too. So? Will asks. So we engineered a minor disaster in the building, something to do with the plumbing. That way the embassy had to allow our hover van onto the property. From there, we were able to park close enough to a data access junction and splice a hardwired connection. Will roll waves his hand in what he assumes is a universal gesture for keep going. So since we're going to have to dock with the station anyway, unless there's a shuttle bay on this thing I haven't found, Will shakes his head. Perfect. And when we're docked, it shouldn't be that hard to find a data access junction somewhere near the docking section. Benny can access the station that way. On top of that, then he can likely hide our comms inside the system. So there are no extra signals to raise suspicion. Will looks over at Benny. Will that work? The little hacker grins evilly. An immensely disturbing sight. Yeah, that'd be just fine. I can do a lot more with a hardline connection, as long as there's a junction. Yes, here we go. Zephyr updates the primary display with the plans Zarix has provided. If this is accurate, the central docking section has four docking arms. Since we assume we'll be the only ship there, the entire section will be empty save us. We're lucky Zarix was thorough. These plans are quite detailed. The image zooms in. Here you can see a primary data access junction. I'm sure it's locked, but that shouldn't be an issue. From there, we can set Benny up just inside the docking arm. What about cameras? Surely the central docking section isn't that insecure. Will uses his station to zoom the image back out and pan it around, looking for the symbols that would indicate a camera or sensor cluster. You're not thinking like a criminal, Will, Zephyr says. This station is super secure, super anonymous. There are guards in the reception area, which, other than the docking section, is the only public space. The guard's silence can be, and likely is, bought. Digital evidence of customers coming and going would be bad for business. If just one customer hacks the station, they'll know who all the clients are, when they come and go, 
and what types of crates they're moving. I wonder how Zarex accomplished this. Good point. And you probably don't want to know. Okay. I think we've got a workable plan here, lady and gentlemen. Benny, you're a male, right? The already surly Braylac turns a deeper shade of green. The hell do you mean, am I a male? What the hell did you think I was? Will raises both hands, palms out. Okay, okay, you know, just trying to be sensitive and not make assumptions. He ducks just in time to keep from getting a pad to the face. The break-in. The voice comes clearly over the bridge loudspeakers. Unidentified craft. You have 30 fractions of a talk to transmit your identity and access documents. Friendly, mutters Maxim. Benny, you have the doctored ID ready to go? Will asks from the pilot seat in the center of the bridge. Benny looks over at Will and gives a thumbs up. At least, Will assumes that what it was supposed to be. It's harder to tell on a three-fingered hand. Will searches for the communications controls on his own station. Station, this is the Transport Serenity. Transmitting ID and access documents now. Will looks at his new and untested, at least as a unit, crew. Here we go. It takes the station about five minutes to go over the transmitted documents. All the while the ghost is getting closer and closer. They're still targeting us. Maxim warns from the weapon station. Should we target them back? No, we're transmitting doctored up ID docs as well as a doctored sensor image. Unless someone looks out the window, we're just a mid-sized transport. If we start painting them with all kinds of targeting scans, they might look closer. Besides, I have to assume any transport trusted enough to come out here would know how it works. And wouldn't worry about it, I hope. Reassuring, Maxim grumbles. The speakers crackle slightly. Serenity, everything checks out. You're clear to dock at docking collar three. They're no longer painting us, Maxim reports with visible relief. Will begins guiding the ship to its assigned docking collar. Okay, you two. Go get ready. He nods at Maxim and Zephyr. Benny, you too. As the ex-peacekeeper exits the bridge, Benny turns to Will. You know, this would be easier if we'd done my shopping list, just saying. Will doesn't take his eyes off his displays. I haven't decided if you get to stay on my ship. And I'm not wasting a single credit on your green ass until then. Benny scowls at the back of Will's head and leaves the bridge. Ten minutes later, Will walks the short distance from the bridge to the portside airlock, located on the forward section of the ship, just behind the bridge. The main receiving area between both airlocks has been modified to be a more military-grade staging area. A few racks of weapons and body armor line the front and back walls, with short walkways to each side leading to the airlocks. Walking in, Will finds two peacekeepers in full peacekeeper combat armor. What the? We're sneaking aboard the station, not storming Normandy. The larger armor-clad form asks, What's Normandy? Then the visor snaps up, revealing a slightly grinning Maxim. Will shakes his head. Where did you get all that? I know the budget I gave you wouldn't include weapons and two full sets of peacekeeper armor. The smaller armored form turns to Will, and the faceplate snaps up, revealing Zephyr. We got creative with the budget. Also, the weapons dealer hadn't found a buyer in three cycles, so was a bit desperate to get rid of these. They're not current gen, but they're good enough. Also, if you want to sneak... This is what you want. She taps a few controls on her gauntlet and fades from view as the faceplate drops back over her head, sealing her into her armor. Prismatic adaptive camouflage. At best, Will can just make out a faint wavering outline. Okay, one, kudos on the creative budgeting. Two, Zephyr, stay in yours. Max, sorry, but I need you to be visible muscle. Remember, our cover is we're here making a drop for Zarix. We're gonna have to have a cargo crate to lug around, and we need to look like low-life cargo runners. Maxim. My name is Maxim. The big Plorian grumbles as he begins disassembling his armor. Zephyr returns to visibility and moves to help him. Will puts his hand on the big man's shoulders. Next time, I promise you get to wear armor. Deal? 
Maxim nods. Will turns to the section of the room where he keeps his own gear and grabs his utility belt and an extra sidearm. He also takes a gauntlet designed to go over his wrist comm, not only protecting it, but adding to its abilities. Where's Benny? Will tilts his head up to the ceiling. Computer, where's Benny? I'm right here, Benny says, coming from the direction of the main corridor. I had to gear up. He's loaded down with, well, Will has no idea what, but every pocket and pouch on the jumpsuit the little guy likes to wear is packed with stuff. Also, he's buried under a large backpack. What is all that? You're going to be five meters from the ship at most. Not stranded on a deserted island. Will shakes his head, but decides it's not worth arguing about. Okay, everyone ready? Remember the plan? Nodding all around. Okay then, let's go rob somebody. The past. Will has no idea what's going on. His head is swimming, he's got about a million questions, and he doesn't know what's happening around him with so many aliens moving. He's following along behind Langsham and his what? Two guards? They still haven't spoken, but they haven't left the captain's side either. Will is between them as they walk together down a corridor of some type. Ahead, a hatch opens, sliding apart. They walk into what Will guesses is the bridge. There's a central seat and stations all around it. Some of them are occupied, some aren't. The two guards take positions at two of the stations. Guess they're more than just muscle, Will thinks. Langsham sits in the center in what looks like a cross between Captain Kirk's chair and the cockpit of Will's pod, sans the pod itself. The captain must also fly the ship. Pressing a button on his console, Langsham says, Gartrath, is the hold secured? A yes comes back over the bridge speakers, and Langsham pushes some buttons and takes the controls. Will can see the stars moving in the display at the front of the room. A second later, the stars vanish and a swirling effect replaces them. Langsham gets up from his station and heads for the hatch they recently entered through. Come with me, he says, pushing past Will and making a gesture to his two crewmen, crew beings, that he doesn't need them this time. They walk back down the same corridor, which must be the only way to the bridge, Will guesses. A turn, and then they're in a largish space, not the cargo hold. Will has no idea how big the ship is or its layout. He had thought they were going back to the cargo hold and his pod, but somehow they had ended up in the lounge area. Sitting in a large overstuffed chair, Langsham points to a smaller chair opposite him. Most would have left you in your pod to die, or brought you aboard and then spaced you and kept your pod. Uh, thanks? You're human, yeah? This system is where your home planet is. Yeah, Earth. Third planet from the sun, our star. Yeah, so I'm breaking a ton of rules, but figure that's better than letting you die. Fact is, this system, especially the inner orbits, are off limits. No ifs, ands, or buts. Get caught here, and the peacekeepers take your ship, toss you in one of their holes, and that's that. Langsham strokes his beard. It looks like hair, but who knows. Since we were here, and I'm not a complete block of ice, we grabbed you on our way out. That's the good news. You get to live. The bad news is, you'll probably never go home. Will opens his mouth to protest, asks questions, possibly scream incoherently. Langsham raises a six-fingered hand to stop him. It sucks, I know. I can't take you home. And no one else ever will either. The punishment is just too severe, especially going that far in system. Maybe one day you'll have a ship, but what then? You go home on your own? I don't know much about your people, but if they're anything like 98% of the other races in this sector, your government will have no end of questions. They'll likely dissect you. And then just as likely either use the ship you come in or reverse engineer it. In either of those cases, the moment your people start venturing out of your system, the GC ban is lifted. That means your people are as likely to find pirates and slavers as peaceful, well-meaning folks. Best not accelerate the process until your people are ready. 
Langsham stands up and walks over to some refrigerator-looking thing and grabs two bottles. Sitting back down, he leans forward and hands one to Will. Life sucks, and yours is about to get worse before it gets better. He takes a long pull on his drink. Will sniffs the top of the bottle and follows suit. Tastes like beer, he decides. Until I get tired of you or find someone to pawn you off on, you're part of my crew. The Reaper isn't a big ship, but we get by. Oh, and in case you haven't put it together, this, waving to encompass the entire ship, is the Reaper. She's an Uncar and Raptor, which I know means nothing to you, but believe me, that's impressive. We do what we can to stay flying, smuggling a little piracy, but never slaving. That drin is despicable. We haul cargo sometimes when it pays enough. Sometimes we do mercenary work. Like I said, whatever keeps us flying. Everyone puts their weight. Everyone shares the risks. Everyone gets a cut of the action. Taking another drink of the beer-like beverage, he asks, Any questions? Will sits there for a beat, holding his beer-like drink, staring at Langsham, and then he screams. When he stops, Langsham smiles. Feel better? Not really, but if I didn't let that out, I might have exploded. I don't even know what to say or what to ask. It sounds like I don't have much say in the matter, so, you know, I don't know what else to say. Langsham nods. You're handling this better than I expected, I won't lie. Maybe because you're one of your planet's explorers, this is all easier to grasp. I don't know, but I'm glad you're not a blubbering mess. This type of thing isn't exactly routine. But it's happened enough. There are stories. Sad. Mine will be boring, come to think of it. Will rubs at his face, thinking, Okay, my first question is, How are you speaking English, or am I speaking your language? Do you have a universal translator? That's a weird name, but quite accurate. You're speaking whatever you speak. I'm speaking my language. The computer is translating. That's why it's a little laggy. The rest of us have translator microbes. Langsham gestures vaguely towards his head. You'll get some soon, and it'll be easier. That's good. This has been a surreal and terrifying kung fu movie so far. Will sets his bottle down. Am I a slave? Weren't you listening? I don't do that. It's despicable. No, you're not a slave. You're crew. Low ranking for sure. Like a cabin boy. You have to earn your place, but you're crew. Will thinks about it a second. Well, that's good, I guess. Over the speaker's a voice. Captain, we're almost to group to ETA.5 tox. Langsham looks to the ceiling. I'll be there shortly. Turning his attention to Will, he says, We'll continue this later, but for now we have business to attend to. Come with me. You can stay on the bridge and watch, but don't touch anything. Chapter 6 The Break-In Benny Okay, Benny. You're gonna be on your own. You got this? Will is kneeling in front of the little hacker, just inside the airlock of the ghost. Yeah, I got this, Benny snaps. You guys do your thing. Remember to keep the channel open so that I can reach you. Also, you know I'm probably older than you. What's with the kneeling down like I'm a kid? The three walk out of the airlock. Will glances back over his shoulder. We'll be waiting for your signal. Then the lift door closes. Benny looks around the docking area. Time to get to work, he mutters to himself and runs over to where the blueprints indicate the primary data access junction is located. Except there's nothing there. Oh, Grolak! He looks around frantically. The docking area isn't especially large, just a circular room with a lift and four identical docking collar hatches. Three have a red light over them, while the one attached to the ghost has a green light. Okay, Benari, calm down. Think this through. You know there was a primary data access junction in this area. Even if that got rid of the access panel, those data conduits are still here. They have to be. So where are they? He looks around, but the wall where the panel should be is perfectly smooth. 
Whatever modifications they'd made included a complete replacement of the bulkhead, not just welding the panel shut. His eyes slowly roam around the room. The floor! Benny goes back to where the panel should have been and examines the floor. It's a mix of solid metal plates and grates. Grates! Sure enough, about a meter from the bulkhead, it's a metal grate. And beneath it? Data conduits. He drops to his knees and grabs at the grate, attempting to lift it. It's heavy. Well, it's not so much heavy as Benny isn't strong. Grunting and straining, he moves the grate inch by inch until it's moved enough for him to reach into the opening. He grabs his gear and starts getting set up. He's glad that when he fled his workshop on Fury, he'd taken his portable deck since the equipment on the Ghost is woefully inadequate for this task, and not at all portable. Reaching into the opening in the floor, he clips a few jack clamps to various conduits. Better safe than sorry. So he'll tap everything. The sound of the jack clamps burning through the conduit soon comes from the floor, followed by the faint smell of burnt plastic. Jack clamps are a hacker's dream. Each one, once connected automatically, begins burning through the conduit insulation and attaches a lead to the exposed data cable. The edges of the clamps then superheat and form an airtight seal so that the tap is completely secure. Okay, here we go. Benny connects the opposite ends of the jack clamps cables into the back of his portable deck, and lights come on around each port, indicating a stable connection. Excellent. Sitting cross-legged on the floor, the little hacker gets to work. The security systems in place around the station are numerous. Whoever designed this station did a great job of making sure the data core was well protected. The first hurdle will be getting past the firewalls around the main docking area. This was clearly something someone was worried about when they designed the system. Benny chuckles as he watches his firewall countermeasure routines dismantle and reassemble the firewall around the chamber leaving a nice wide opening for him to get one level up into the main reception area, while outwardly still looking completely intact. This second tier, however, is much more involved. Not only is there a firewall protecting data access on that floor, there's one on each vault door, and another protecting the central guard station. From what Benny can see, the vault doors will be easier to deal with if he can take over the guard station. This might be harder than I expected. Hold on, guys, he says to himself, since he hasn't cracked the internal comm system yet. He frowns, concentrating on the guard station. Clearly, whoever built and designed the station was familiar with the most likely vectors of system attack. You're good, that's clear, but I'm better. The Braylac chuckles as the first level of the guard station computer defenses crumbles under the onslaught of various viruses that Benny is unleashing. The trick is not to simply brute force the attack because then the system will realize that it's under attack and raise the alarm. While the viruses are cracking the defense system, Benny is busy attacking lower-level systems like communications to keep the guard kiosk systems from raising the alarm. So far, so good. Yes! The little hacker throws both arms in the air. You can't beat ben Oh, Odrin! His hands fly back to the console. Okay, okay, I see what you did. That's clever. A few tabs on the deck, and the guard station now belongs to Benny. His smile is huge and slightly evil-looking. Okay, got the guard kiosk, so where would you... Ah, there you are, internal comms. Okay, just need to find a channel that's unused. There we go. Some tapping and working menus on the deck. Okay, now, to be extra safe, ensure there's no buffer storage then. Right. Here we go. Channel encrypted. He taps some more, then taps the comms button on his deck. Is this thing on? The break-in. Will. The lift doors open into the main reception area. Will and Maxim step out, the former pushing a heavy-looking crate on a grav sled. Two well-armed and armored security guards are waiting for them. This way, the taller of the two says, pointing towards the center of the reception area where two more guards are sitting at the central kiosk. If the reception area were a clock, the lift from the docking area would be the six o'clock position, and every hour would be a secure vault door. Stacked too high, 23 vaults for Zephyr to check. Will and Maxim walk towards the center of the room, the first pair of guards falling in line behind them. 
not noticing a slight shimmer that slips out of the lift once everyone's back is turned. Hey there, guys, Will exclaims when they get to the central guard station. How's it going? Quite some station you have here. Do you live here or is there some kind of shuttle service or something? The guards look at each other and then back at Will. One puts his hand out. Documents. Will hands over a data chip with the forged and hopefully believable documents Zarex has provided. Luckily, as with all good lies, there was some truth. Zarex has a vault on this station and has the right to send anyone he likes to make a deposit and withdraw. The first guard looks up from the terminal in front of him. Your documents check out. You know what to do. Will looks around. Uh, <laughs> actually, no. This is my first time doing this run. He looks at Maxim behind the crate. You know what to do? Maxim shakes his head. Mute. Can you imagine how boring this trip out here was? I mean, I don't mind talking to myself, but this place ain't close to anything. It was a long flight, and of course, since it's a secret and all, no other crew. Boring is too gentle a word, Will says, shaking his head. You mind showing us the process? The guard grumbles and gets up from his seat. Come on. Will goes to follow, and Maxim with the crate turns his will. Two steps and the grav sled makes a weird and not at all good sounding noise and drops six inches to the ground with a loud thud. What the hell? I thought you fixed it. Will looks at Maxim, who shrugs and shakes his head. Will punches him in the arm, then jumps back at the glare he receives. The guard is spun on his heels and is eyeing the two suspiciously. The other guard at the kiosk is also standing. I don't believe this, the nearest guard says to the other. How does this drin always happen to us, Jareth and Boxster, crow lacking red, and we get these two idiots? He turns to Will. No offense. None taken, Will smiles and kneels to work on the grav sled. That said, this would go faster if you helped, or at least have tools. I could go get them from the ship, but I'd have to find them. The least angry guard grabs a small pack from the guard kiosk and walks around to help Will and Maxim. From Will's earpiece, this thing on? Will barely manages not to jump out of his skin. He'd forgotten Benny was going to do that. Just then, there's a clang. Everyone stops moving. The guards all react like professionals, weapons up, visually scanning the room. The two from the elevator head for the stairwell that leads to the second level. The break-in. Zephyr. As soon as Will and Maxim have stepped out of the lift, Zephyr has darted out after them, sliding to the side of the room. Now she's standing in front of the first of the vaults, realizing the size of the task ahead of her. Luckily, she knows she can't be seen. Peacekeeper combat armor, even older models like the one Zephyr is wearing, are state-of-the-art, compared to what almost anyone else can get their hands on. Being designed and built in-house, the specs never leave the peacekeeper control. In the field, damaged units internally self-destruct, destroying all internal components, rendering the suit a weighty piece of trash. How this suit and the one Maxim has survived that? Zephyr doesn't know. The internal systems are completely self-contained, and the suit and its occupant can survive just about any environment for several hours. Peacekeeper armor, regardless of class or mission parameter, is designed to hide the wearer's identity. Once a peacekeeper is in their armor, you can't tell gender or even height as most armor is the same size, internally cushioning shorter operators. The prismatic adaptive camouflage allows a peacekeeper to walk right past security systems effectively. The lift arrives at the reception deck, and the doors open. There are two guards right by the lift, one on each side of the door. This way, one of them says to Will and Maxim. They follow the guards towards the center of the room. Just as the lift doors close, Zephyr slips out. Since the identity of the vault owners isn't known to anyone on the station, there's no record of who owns which vault. Zephyr needs to identify the target vault with a small scanner that should, from what Zarx told Will, identify some trace isotopes he slipped onto his competitor the last time they were in the same place. Apparently, shortly before, said competitor had headed for this station. That's a lot more ifs and shoulds than Zephyr is comfortable with. She slips out the lift to one side and heads for the first door. This is going to take some time, she realizes. Fortunately, she was able to confirm the isotope's presence in the lift. 
so that was good. So far, Zarix's intel is correct. Unfortunately, however, the isotope is too weak to leave a trail from the lift to the vault she's looking for. Likely, she'll only be able to find a small trace of it on the vault control pad. Hey there, guys, Will exclaims from across the room. Now the hard part. He and Maxim had to do as much as they can to slow things down, while Zephyr looks for the right vault, and Benny takes control of the station's systems. She moves to another vault door. Nothing on the scanner. Dren. The scanner can't pick up the isotope unless it's within a limited range, which means she has to stand in front of each door while the scanner works. She's almost done with the first floor when she hears a loud thud and sees the grav sled and crate crash to the ground. She watches Will and Maxim flail about and lure all four guards in closer. So far, so good. Time to head upstairs. She's about halfway up the steps when, without warning, she hears, This thing on? Despite years of peacekeeper training, she's startled, and her foot catches the stair, making a clanging sound as she catches her grip. She freezes. The break-in. Will. Will and Maxim exchange glances when the guard helping them turns away. Uh, y'all got space rats or something? Will asks. What the Grolak is a space rat? The helpful guard asks. You know, small, furry tail, beady eyes, lives in space, space rat. Will is holding his hands about six inches apart. Sneak aboard ships, eat wires, shit everywhere. Be quiet, the angry guard snaps. He and the helpful one have spread out around the lower level. Will and Maxim trade glances again. The guards are moving fast. The first two are already at the stairwell now, heading up. The other two are doing a circuit around the outer level of the reception area and first level of the vault doors. They stop near each door, probably interfacing with the door mechanism so they can see if any of the doors are reporting an error or alert. Using the sub-vocalization capabilities of the comms gear, he whispers, It's on, Benny. But I think you startled Zephyr. God's knows you scared me. Guards are doing a circuit around the place. Hold tight. Oops. Sorry about that. I guess I should have had the comms do a tone to let you know that it was online. Next time, Benny replies. So, I'm almost through most of the firewalls. I've got control of the guard kiosk and all its systems. I'm trying to figure out how to open the vault doors for when Zephyr finds the right one. How long can you stall? Uh, what? Not long. They're already getting pretty pissy. As soon as they're done making sure there's nothing going, which I hope happens soon, they'll be pushing to get this grav sled fixed and get us moving. Just then, Zephyr chimes in. Sorry about the noise. Benny isn't the voice that should suddenly pop into your thoughts. I'm on the second level. I was able to get the rest of the way up the steps before the guards came up here. It looks like they're almost done. I'm starting my sweep now. On the second level walkway, Will can see the two guards nearing the stairwell from the opposite sides. Okay, go as quick as you can. I don't think we're going to have long. The vault we need being upstairs is going to be a problem. How quietly can you move when you're moving fast? A faint beep comes from over the line. Not that one. Still looking. I guess we'll find out soon on the fast and quiet thing. The guards that stayed on the same level are back. Hey, you get that thing working yet? Will bangs around for a few minutes, grunting occasionally. He holds a hand up, one finger extended in the universal one more minute gesture. After another few bangs, he closes the hatch on the grav sled and looks up. No idea if it's the angry guard or helpful who's waiting for an answer. Yeah, I think so. What was it, space rats? No answer, and with the face masks being jet black, no indication the guard even registered the question beyond a slight tilting of his head. Will hands Maxim the tools and presses a button on the control panel. The sled beeps a few times, then slowly lifts. Since the graph sled was never actually broken, just cleverly modified to fail on command, fixing it was easy. Voila, Will says. Two easy suckers, Will thinks. What? That must be the helpful guard. Maxim reassembles the toolkit and hands it back to the helpful guard. Angry guard points to Will. Make your deposit and get out. So rude. Will makes a show of pulling out a pad and thumbing through it, looking for the door he's promised to go to. 
He looks up, then right and left, and then he heads towards the door that belongs to Zarix. Maxim following, pushing the sled ahead of him. Benny, Zephyr, he hisses into the comm unit. Time's just about up. Status? Nothing. Anyone? Then over his comms comes Zephyr. Yes, found it. The break-in. Zephyr. Zephyr hears Will trying to defuse the situation, something about space rats, whatever they are. As the guards approach the staircase, he knows there's no way they'll pass her on the stairs without noticing. One of them will bump or brush against her, or pick up the telltale shimmer from the cloaking system. It's good, but not that good up close, especially at only a few inches away. She has to move. Where, though? The guards are at the bottom of the stairs now. Zephyr is only five steps above them. Carefully, she times her steps with theirs, to mask the sound. She assumes that they'll split up when they hit the top of the stairs, which leaves only one place to go. As soon as she reaches the top of the stairs, she leaps over the edge of the walkway, relying on her years of training. She grabs the railing with one hand to control her trajectory and slow her fall. She pivots and catches herself with her other hand. Thankfully, the armor enhances her strength. As she hovers 90 degrees out from the railway, quickly she instructs the armor to go rigid, letting her relax her arms. The two guards hit the top of the stairs, confer briefly, then split up, and start slowly moving from vault door to vault door. Zephyr waits until both guards are three doors away, before she hauls herself back up and over the railing as quiet as possible. She heads for the nearest vault door, speaking quietly into the comms unit. Sorry for the noise. She turns to the door nearest the top of the stairs. Nothing. Then she moves to the next. The guards are both almost opposite her. They're not on the alert for anything other than generally looking for things out of place, which mostly means just glancing at the control panel for each vault door, confirming its display information, and then moving on. Over the comms, Will says, Okay, go as quick as you can. I don't think we're going to have long. The vault we need being upstairs is going to be a problem. How quickly can you move when you're moving fast? Another door, negative on the scanner. Zephyr hisses in frustration. Glancing down at the reception area, it looks like time's up. Will and Maxim are moving toward what she assumes is their door. Dren, she mutters. She can only move so fast without making any noise. Her armor can warp light, but doesn't muffle sound much. At least the guards that had been up on this level are back on the stairs now, heading back down together. She moves to another door, nothing. The next door, nothing. Will on comms. Benny, Zephyr, time's just about up, status? Next door, nothing. She keeps moving, fearing the door she's looking at will be the last one she hits, knowing there's nothing she can do about it. Anything? Will's voice asks. She moves to the next door and the sensor makes a different noise. Yes, found it. The break-in. Benny. Benny hears Will ask the guards, uh, y'all got space rats or something? And snickers to himself. Humans say such goofy things, Benny thinks. He wishes this place had cameras on the upper levels. He doesn't like not being able to see what's going on. How long can you stall? He asks, looking through the various directories in the guard kiosk. Whoever designed this place didn't trust their clientele, and didn't trust their hired goons either. The systems are heavily shielded, both externally as well as internally. Benny's respect for the architect of this station's security and the computer systems is growing by the moment, as is his determination to beat those same systems. While Will and Zephyr talk, Benny tunes them out and focuses. He's got to be ready when she finds the right vault. But these systems are so spread out and locked down, it's not as easy as he'd assumed. Muting his wrist comm, he mutters to himself, This is promising. There's no direct per vault override, but, hmm, yeah, this is promising. Benny digs into the systems he's exploring. Setting aside programs for later use, burying routines throughout the data core, and assigning hotkeys and macros. Crucial minutes pass, and he's still buried in the various systems, admiring the craftsmanship, taking note of clever bits of code, and well-crafted subroutines, dismantling things as politely as he can. Then he notices the comm light flashing. Oops! Quickly, he clicks it on. Anyone? 
It's Will sounding panicked. Sorry, I'm here. I think I have found something that will work. Benny taps a few more commands into his deck, nods to himself. Yes, this will work. Say the word. Just then, Zephyr comes over the comms. Yes, found it. Chapter 7 The Break-In Benny Will's voice comes over the comms. Okay, then go! Benny hits a button on his deck, mapped to a series of commands he has programmed in. He knows exactly what will happen. First, his routines will take over the environmental controls, making the system think there is an environmental emergency. Then, a system of viruses takes over the guard systems, killing all the sensors while plunging them into an unending feedback loop. Even though there aren't sensors in the vaults to monitor what's going on, there are standard safety sensors which can, luckily, be tricked into thinking there's someone trapped in each vault and that the oxygen is leaving those vaults. This triggers the doors to every vault snapping them open. Despite the anti-intrusion and privacy setup, the creators of this station either forgot to eliminate these safety protocols or hedged their bets deciding that clients dying in one of their vaults wouldn't be good press. Killing the main power is even easier. Those systems are protected, but not well, so killing the lights is easy. Putting the life support into a forced reboot interrupts that for at least a few minutes, more if he can keep on interrupting the system. That's only part of the problem, though. The easiest part. The four guards are all in self-powered armor, which will have night vision and advanced sensors. The light being out won't do much to them. They'll still see Will and Maxim if they try anything. Not good. The solution took as much doing, more maybe, as the hacking of the environmental controls. Benny had found buried deep in the guard kiosk protocols a data link to all active guards. This link was intended to allow the guards to all share data with the kiosk, including sensor feeds and so forth. Allowing the station's computer to monitor input from each guard as they patrol, compiling the data into an accurate picture of the station overall. It is all the crack in the armor Benny needs. He rapidly executes another set of routines that make quick work of the weak firewall protecting the data pathway to the guard's uniforms. And then, he's in. He immediately accesses all four guards' armor, specifically their helmet systems. He'd simply lock their whole suit down, paralyzing them if that wasn't too obvious. So instead, he's going to crash their helmets. They won't die. Their life support systems will still be active. But the rest of their armor will be effectively dead temporarily. Without warning, up in the reception area, the guards' helmet systems go dark. No comms, no feeds, and, to make sure they don't take them off, the guard kiosk tells the armor that a deadly airborne pathogen has been detected. So the suits seal up tightly, switching to internal life support. The guards are now blind, deaf, and locked inside their armor. Benny can imagine all four guards immediately reaching for their helmets, trying to disengage the locking mechanisms in the collars. Go! Benny yells into the comms unit. With part one done, he focuses on the harder part, erasing all evidence of this ever happening. Harder by far than phase one. Phase two is something he rarely has to worry about. He's always been able to hide his identity when hacking a system, but never bothered to erase the evidence of his trespass. Who cares if the victims know they've been hacked? Maybe next time they'll be more prepared. This time, however, it has to be as if none of this has happened, with only the guard's word to go on if the computers don't back it up. The guards won't want to lose their jobs and likely either won't ever report this, or if they do, They'll withdraw their report when they find out there's no actual evidence of the incident. Benny, you almost ready? Will asks, amid a lot of grunting from someone on comms. Benny hasn't been paying attention. Almost. Give me a tick. He's typing furiously. It's a good thing this whole covering your tracks thing isn't something he usually worries about. Or he'd have found a different vocation a long time ago. Okay, I'm ready when you are. Everything will come back online together, so be ready, he warns. Do it, Will orders. Benny hits a command on his deck, and every system he's captured is released. 
Quickly, subroutines he's embedded begin to erase logs, overwrite data, and do whatever else is needed to remove any evidence of his presence in the system, before deleting themselves, too. He has to hurry, since Will and the crew will be returning shortly, possibly with company. Finding him sitting there in the docking area would blow the whole operation. He's busy erasing files and pulling back his routines when he sees the guards start to access systems. They're looking for an explanation. Suckers, he snickers while finishing up. As a precaution, he made sure to clean up the armor and the guard kiosk first, knowing that'd be where the guards would look first. The guards will no doubt ask the computers in their armor for a status report and be confused when the armor reports nothing anomalous. But what's happened up there? Did they manage to get the goods? Okay, that's it, he says over the comms, beginning to power down his deck. He starts unplugging his data taps. Unfortunately, if anyone looks too hard, they'll see the ends of the jack clamps that fuse to the conduits. They'd have to be in tear-the-station-apart mode, though, and without a single shred of evidence to back up the guard's story, there's no reason to think that'd happen. Benny slides the grate closed and hears the faint tone the lift makes. The doors are about to open. He grabs his deck and scurries as fast as he can to the airlock, turning the corner of the boarding corridor just as the lift doors open. The break-in. Zephyr. Suddenly, Will's voice comes in on comms. Okay, then, go! The entire reception area is plunged into darkness. Zephyr's armored switches to a combination of enhanced night vision with LiDAR overlay. As the low rumble of the station's life support fades, to ensure she isn't detected, her armor has been on internal life support mode from the start. No sense letting the station's computer detect extra CO2. The door right in front of her snaps open. Zephyr doesn't wait. She races in as Benny Voice yells over the comms, Go! The vault is larger than she expected, packed with crates of various sizes and a few statues and other knickknacks. The crime boss or crooked politician is doing well for themselves. This is all the stuff they don't want anyone knowing about. Then they must have much, much more than is publicly viewable. She sighs and gets to work, moving from crate to crate, scanning for the isotope. She's thankful that stealth isn't an issue right now. She's able to move quickly and somewhat loudly from crate to crate. I'm in, and scanning, she reports. There's more than I expected, going as fast as I can. You can move as slow as you like. The guards are deaf and blind right now, Benny says. She shakes her head, choosing not to reply to such an obvious comment. Which vault? Will asks over the comms. We'll get in position. Fifth from the top of the stairs to the right, she answers. Thankfully, whoever owns this vault is organized. No crates blocking other crates, very few stacked more than too high, nothing likely to topple if touched. Zephyr moves in a methodical search pattern, passing her scanner over each crate looking for a trace of that isotope. If time weren't an issue, she'd love to look around a bit more. This vault is a true treasure trove. There's a solid platinum statue of some noble figure from the past, at least three meters tall. In the corner is what looks like a sarcophagus holding who knows what or whom. In another corner on a set of shelving that reaches to the ceiling are stacks and stacks of ingots, all arranged by type of metal and lashed together in sets. Beep. Found it, she reports to the team. It's a crate about half as big as the one Will and Maxim brought in, which is good. She moves to open it. Dren, the crate's locked. Gonna have to take the whole thing. Can you carry it? Will ask. She grabs both sides and lifts. It's heavy, but her armor can handle the strain, at least for a bit. Yes, coming to you, she huffs. She's careful not to drag the crate. Moving it isn't easy, and she wouldn't be able to without the strength augmentation her armor provides. Leaving drag marks would be a clear piece of evidence for the owner whenever they eventually realize they've been robbed. Right below her are Will and Maxim and their crate. She slowly makes her way to the vault door and the railing beyond. Drop it, Will calls over the comms. Max will catch it. The two talk, then Maxim comes back on. Okay, Zephyr, I'm ready. She lets the crate slide over the edge. The break-in, Will. As Will and Maxim get to the door, the helpful guard is about 20 steps behind them, watching. Okay, 
then go. No sooner has Will sub-vocalized the words, do the lights go out, every single one of them, the rumble of life support systems dies off, and every single vault door snaps open. Then Benny's voice on the comms, go. Will and Maxim both grab night vision goggles from pockets in their outfits. Maxim sets about opening the crate they've been moving around the whole time. It's empty inside. Over the comms, Zephyr reports, I'm in and scanning. There's more than I expected. Going as fast as I can. You can go as fast as you like. The guards are blind and deaf right now, Benny says. Will looks up. Which vault? Will get in position. Fifth from the top of the stairs to the right. Will and Maxim get moving. Will can see the guards spinning around. One of them has their rifle up and is waving it around. Hope he doesn't get trigger happy, Will thinks. Two others are still grabbing at their helmets. The helpful guard is standing exactly where he was before, slowly turning his head. Will looks right at him. His entire body is rigid. Will figures he doesn't know what to do, so is staying where he was in case others are moving around. Sound idea. The other three are not that disciplined, and the two from upstairs have collided and are now floundering about on the deck. Dodging one flailing guard, they get the crate set up under the door Zephyr has reported from. We're in position. A few minutes later, they hear her. Found it. Dren. The crate is locked. Will looks at Maxim. Gonna have to take the whole thing. Can you carry it? Yes. Coming to you, she says. Drop it. Will calls back over comms. Max will catch it. I will, the large ex peacekeeper says. You have to at least slow it down, Will points at the crate and the sled. Otherwise, it'll hit too hard and likely blow out the grav sled. Maxim groans and takes his place. Okay, Zephyr, I'm ready. He can see the crate above, seemingly floating over the railing. It falls right at him. He grunts and sags below the weight of the crate as he catches it. Turning, he slides it. Not quietly, but that doesn't matter now. Into the larger crate. I'm coming down. Zephyr says, before there's a thud on the grating. Will sees two of the guards spin in his direction, probably feeling Zephyr's landing through their boots. Knowing she's somewhere around him, he asks, Will you fit in there? I think it'll be easier if we don't have to worry about you. The grav sled bobs a little, then settles. It's tight, but I'm good. Close it up. Will watches Maxim shut the lid to the crate and seal it like it was never open. Benny, you almost ready? Okay, I'm ready when you are. Everything will come back online together, so be ready, the hacker warns. He's either excited or nervous, his voice a bit higher pitched than normal. Will looks at Maxim, who nods and removes his goggles, and then jogs about ten paces from the grav sled. Do it. Immediately, the vault door slams shut. The lights come back on, the life support system is up and running, and all four guards are flailing, pulling their helmets off, shouting, even Helpful Guard, who had stood stock still until now. Will turns towards Helpful Guard, putting on his best frantic expression. What the hell was that? What happened? Are we under some kind of attack? He yells. Angry Guard interrupts him. What do you mean? You did this! The guard's rifle is pointed right at Will's face. Helpful Guard also has his rifle up. The hell are you talking about? Will shouts back. We didn't do Drin. We were about to enter my boss's vault and all hell breaks loose. How is this our fault? He looks at Maxim, who just shrugs and looks all around. You know what? You can grow like yourself. We're out of here. Our boss can send another team. I don't care, but something ain't right here. And I'm not leaving this crate here to get stolen or vanished or whatever the hell just happened now. No, thank you. Not worth my life. Will motions to Maxim, who turns the grav sled back to the lift leading to the docking area. Come on, he shouts mid-stride. Wait a second, it's Helpful Guard. I don't know if you should leave until we figure out what happened. Angry Guard seizes on this. Exactly, you sit tight. No one leaves until we know what happened. He and Helpful walk over to the guard kiosk, where they're joined by their other two colleagues. They huddle over the computer terminals for a bit, arguing but too low for Will to make out what they're saying. Probably afraid of a repeat incident, none of them have put their helmets back on. Helpful Guard, who turns out to be a young Pelorian, Will guesses they all don't become peacekeepers, comes over. You're free to go. We don't know what happened, 
he looks around, and we're not telling anybody about it, since there's nothing to back us up on the computer. You do what you have to do with your boss, but there's nothing to back it up. What do you mean you don't know? Will is laying it on thick. The lights went out, I think the life support system shut down, and there was a bunch of loud noises. He's waving his arms, which usually helps distract people. We don't know. There are no logs of anything at all happening, so as far as we're concerned, nothing happened. The guard's face is emotionless. Will Cece's a pro, maybe ex-peacekeeper. I'll escort you back to your ship. Will turns and motions for Maxim to follow. He knows the guard will feel better if they're escorted out, and knows, too, that if he's as freaked out as he's pretending to be, he'd welcome the escort. He nods to the guard, and the trio walk to the lift. It takes less than 30 seconds to get to the docking station as they descend. Will hopes Benny isn't anywhere to be seen. When the doors open, Will and Maxim step out. Helpful guard follows, looking all around, scanning the room. Definitely a pro, Will thinks. Well, have a good journey back to wherever you came from. One last scan of the room and the guard steps back into the lift, but the doors don't close. He's waiting for them to enter the airlock corridor. Will and Maxim walk to the airlock corridor. Well, this was a mission for the books, he says aloud. No one's gonna believe this one. He slaps Maxim on the shoulder as they enter the corridor and turn the corner to the ghost airlock. Behind them, he hears the faint whisper of lift doors closing. He finally exhales. Chapter 8. Departures As soon as they close the airlock, Will and Maxim hurry to the armory slash prep area. Will tilts his head up to address the ship. Computer, we're back. Begin pre-flight diagnostics. Sure thing, Captain. The ship's voice chirps back. Will looks at Maxim. Still not used to that. He pats the big man on the shoulder, smiling. We did it. Suddenly, the crate in the corner starts to thud from inside. Oh, Drin, Zephyr. Maxim rushes over and unseals the lid. Zephyr, back to being visible, jumps out. Did you forget about me? She growls, looking at them. No. Both answer at the same time, blushing slightly. To avoid her, they start changing out of their outfits. Will removing one sidearm and some of the armor components from his long coat. I'll be on the bridge. We should get out of here ASAP. Maxim had changed from one bland uniform to a slightly less dull jumpsuit, which has become his shipboard uniform. ASAP? Shaking his head, Will walks out of the staging room and towards the bridge. Zephyr begins to strip down out of her peacekeeper armor, taking each piece off and assembling it on a rack for storage. Shaking her head, she mutters, Humans. On the bridge, Benny is at his station. We're all set. Will takes a seat at his pilot station. Great. Computer, open a comm channel, voice only, to the station. There's a low beep, indicating the channel is now open. Station, the Serenity is ready for departure. There's no response from the station, but through the hole, the loud clank of a releasing docking collar can be heard. The view on the main display lurches slightly as the ship drifts away from the docking collar. Benny snickers. Guess they're glad to see us on our way. Will eases the ship away from the station and brings her about. Once they are safely distant from the station, he fires the main sublight engines. Keeping his speed to a calm-looking pace is tough. But shooting out like a bat out of hell would be suspicious, and part of his plan hinges on Will and the crew of the Ghost, and the Ghost itself. Being just a ship and crew, nothing much to recall. Maxim and Zephyr walk through the hatch and take their stations. Zephyr turns to Will. Where to now? Will works the controls for a few beats, then replies. We're heading to Malkor. Fury would be too hot, even if the U3 hadn't caused a stir there. It'd be the first place anyone who catches on to this little heist would look. Zarex has an operation on Malkor and said we could make the delivery there, get paid, and be on our way. On the upside, we don't even have to deal with Zarex, which, believe me, is a plus. Benny nods his head vigorously. Yeah, Fury'd be hot, and Zarix is a scum lord. The gray market on Malkor will have all kinds of tech. Can't wait. Will turns back to his station as the ship starts to jump to FTL. Three days FTL, folks. 
Time to relax. I'm getting a grum. He stands and heads for the bridge hatch. Who's with me? A little while later, sitting around the table in the galley area, the crew are happily exchanging stories about their parts in the heist. For the first time since taking possession of the ghost, Will feels like the ship is more complete. He feels more complete. The fear of being alone in space for the rest of his life is finally starting to fade. Will smiles. The funk he'd been feeling and fighting off has diminished slightly. Maxim is relating how hard it was to stay silent the entire time when Benny interrupts. You hardly ever talk. Suddenly you want to get chatty? Everyone laughs, including Maxim. Will smiles. Zephyr takes a long swig of her grum. You both had it easy. I had to jump off that railing, catch myself, and hang there. All without making a single sound. She mimics holding herself on the railing while Maxim nods and grins at her. You know the suit makes me nearly invisible, not soundproof. We're lucky I wasn't doing your part. You know I'm no good at the silent stuff, special armor or not. Maxim replies. Will laughs. Yeah, no offense, pal, but you are not the limber gymnast type. Benny guffaws, a loud, high-pitched braying laugh. Everyone stops. He stops. What? That was funny. Now I'm picturing Maxim in some type of gymnastics outfit, prancing around. A punch in his tiny arm ends that mental image. Maxim grins. Zephyr takes in the scene and looks at the group. Then it will. She asks the question they've all been wanting to ask. So, what's in the crate? Coming to you live from Studio 7 at GNO, I'm Monel Farage. Reports are beginning to trickle in of a conflict in the unaffiliated system of Aerith. A rebel group has, apparently out of nowhere, risen up and is demanding, well, many things, with sovereignty for one of the moons in the system being the primary goal. It's unclear if the rebel group is new or merely an escalation of an existing issue in the Harith system. The newscaster, a heavyset female Malkarite, is reporting from behind a desk at GNO, the galactic news outlet. As viewers may know, Harith is located near the outer frontier of the Galactic Commonwealth and, while not an official member, does engage in trade with many of its neighbors, who are GC members. Until recently, there have been no reports, official or otherwise, of trouble in this remote system. But something has changed. It seems these rebels are now well-armed and well-equipped. She looks off screen, then back. I'll keep you posted as things develop out on the frontier. I'm Monel Farage, and good day. What's in the crate? The crew is standing around the crate, now placed in the middle of the cargo hold. Will looks at each of them. You know we shouldn't be opening this, right? Benny looks up from where he's kneeling next to the crate's control panel. Did Zarex explicitly say not to open it? Will sighs. No, he didn't. He only didn't say, go ahead and rummage through the thing I'm paying you to steal either. So, you know, maybe don't. Maxim chips in. Then it's settled. We open it. I think it's only fair to see what we risked our lives for. Also, I'm bigger than you. Will shrugs. Fine. Benny, can you open it ideally so that we can close it back up and there's no evidence we touched it at all? Benny scrunches up his face in what is presumably a look of indignation among Braylock. I just hacked an entire space station, a super secure secret space station, including the armored suits of the guards. You know what, though? This shipping crate might be too good. I might not be able to crack it, he shrugs. Will kicks him. Don't be a dick. Benny rubs his leg. So undervalued. He plugs his wrist comm into the data port on the crate. Two seconds later, with a hiss, the crate opens. The lid slowly lifts up and away from the top. Benny backs up, trying to look inside. What's in it? What's in it? Will, Zephyr, and Maxim look up from the crate to Benny. Together, all three say, A robot. Inside the crate, it's a matte black robot, curled into a fetal position. That is the only way it would fit inside the crate. Its legs are long and thin. It must stand just over two meters. 
The entire thing is black except its joints, which are a dull gray color of whatever metal they're made out of. Benny waves his arms and nearly screams, Cool! He takes a running leap and lands on the edge of the crate to look down into it. Can we keep it? He looks up at Will. No! No, we can't keep it. Close the lid. We saw what was in the box. Will stalks out of the cargo hold. What's wrong with him? Maxim asks. Zephyr shrugs. Who knows? She looks down at the form inside the crate. What do you make of this? Maxim frowns. Looks like a service bot of some type. Definitely upgraded. Look here. That's not standard. He points at a module welded to the bot's shoulder. The only other thing that isn't matte black. Wonder why it's in a crate. And why it's so valuable, Zephyr adds. And what that thing does. She too looks at the shoulder attachment. Benny looks at the two Pelorians. Let's find out. He reaches in and activates the robot. All three take a step back. The bot inside the crate begins to make noises, faint whirs and clicks. Slowly, it stands up inside the crate. Its featureless face rotates to each of them in turn, yellow optical sensors spinning and focusing. Once standing, it's just over two meters tall, with long, thin arms and legs and a sleek but boxy body. A mix of angles and curves. The head is roughly oval-shaped, but the only features are the eyes, nothing else. Most bots the team has seen look distinctly more biological presumably to help make their owners and operators more comfortable. This one was clearly not designed that way. There are two shorter arms tucked up against its body, perhaps for more fine motor control than the larger arms and hands are capable of. Hello. It again turns to face each of them, one at a time. I am Engineering Service Bot, GBE-102002. Its voice is neutral and largely genderless, slightly deeper than Zephyr's voice. Where am I? Who are you? I am not detecting any peacekeeper comms. I am no longer on a peacekeeper vessel. This is not a question. More statement of fact. Gabe. What part of no wasn't clear? Will is furious and pacing the common area while the crew sits in silence. GBE-102002 is standing in the corner of the galley, head-tracking Will as he paces the small space. I didn't not answer. I didn't give you a vague answer. I very clearly said no. Then I left the hold. Benny looks at Will. Technically, you said we couldn't keep it. Not that we couldn't turn it on. Will grabs a pillow off the chair next to him and hurls it at Benny, who yelps and just barely avoids a pillow to the face. Why would you think it was okay to turn it on if we weren't keeping it? What if it was some kind of killbot or something? The robot raises his hand. Excuse me, but I am not a killbot, for what it is worth. Also, if it helps, you may use male pronouns when speaking about me. I have found selecting one gender or another helps biological beings more easily interact with me. The robot's voice is oddly accentless and could easily be a low-pitched feminine voice or slightly high baritone. If you weren't looking at a robot, it would be nearly impossible to tell the gender or race that belongs to the voice. Not talking to you, Will yells, not even turning around. Now, we have to turn it off and get it back in the crate. Zarix is waiting for our delivery, or at least one of his goons on Malcor is. We need the money. That gear Zephyr and Maxim bought wasn't cheap. Benny needs gear too. We can't stiff Zarix on this, even if we didn't need the credits. Stiffing Zarix isn't a good idea. Zephyr sets down her cup of coffee. Do we know if Zarix knows what he's waiting for? She turns to the robot. GBE-10022, do you know why you were in the crate? Do you know what modifications have been made to you? First, to be clear, my designation is GBE-102002. Since awakening, I have been running every diagnostic I possess. All that I can say is that I am fully operational. I was designed to work aboard larger vessels in an engineering capacity. 
The modifications you asked about, however, are a mystery to me. It reaches back and touches the piece of equipment welded to its back and shoulder. This device is a mystery. It is integrated into my power systems, yet all of its functions are firewalled from my primary systems. I can also identify an encrypted block of data in my central data bank that I do not possess the key for. Maxim looks thoughtful. Zarex must want that data, or whatever your add-on does, or both. I do not know this Zarex. My previous place of work was on the peacekeeper carrier Pax Magellanic. In the primary engineering space, I reported to Lieutenant Ablex. Zephyr and Maxim both look aghast. You're a peacekeeper bot? They say in unison. Zephyr looks at Will. Do you think this could be related to why we were framed? Will collapses down into the nearest chair. Fuck, I don't know. Maybe. Certainly seemed like a weird coincidence otherwise. Damn it. I knew this wasn't going to be easy. Nothing with Zarex is ever easy. What's he gotten me tangled up in? Hell, what's he gotten himself tangled up in? Why is he trafficking in stolen bots? Benny stands up. Look, I know you don't think we should have turned him on, but obviously that ship has gone FTL. So why don't we figure out what's going on? We're still a few days out from Alcor. I can dig around in BG8675309's databanks data banks and maybe encrypt the data block or break the firewalls on his additional hardware. Worst case, I can't. Best case, we know more when we get there and we can make better decisions. Benny spreads his hands wide. Come on, you know you're curious. He smiles, which is slightly off-putting, given all those pointy teeth. The bot raises its hand. Excuse me, it is GBE-102002. Okay, okay, fine. GBE, I can't keep saying all that. Gabe, Gabe is your name. Would you mind going with Benny to engineering, Gabe? Thanks, Will. Benny heads for the hatch and Gabe turns to follow. Don't thank me yet. We're in deep shit here, you guys. I can't emphasize this enough. Will sighs and stands up, heading to the galley and food storage area. I need a damn grum. The past. For Will, the last week has been both the most exciting of his life and complete hell. The Reaper is still sitting at the spaceport at Gupta, its crew coming and going while some type of cargo is being loaded onto the ship. Will has had some freedom to move around the ship, but Langsham has made it clear he wasn't to leave the Reaper, so the closest he's gotten to this alien planet they're on is looking at the tarmac from the upper level of the cargo area, which is not much of a view. The Reaper doesn't have any windows, which seems like a major design flaw to Will. Space is limited on the ship, so Will's been assigned a small closet with a bed in it. Thankfully, he's not bunking with anyone else, which is a minor plus based on what he's overheard from the rest of the crew. Jax and Rolo, the two goons he met on his first day, are apparently an item, but bicker more than any married couple Will has ever met. Luckily, his bunk, such as it is, isn't near their shared quarters. Apparently, when they make up, it keeps their neighbors up. Langsham hasn't given him a role yet, so Will's mostly a cabin boy, which, while cool and exciting in kids' books, actually sucks, at least when the pirates are space pirates. The crew lounge makes the worst hostel in the third world look luxurious by comparison, and it's Will's job to keep it clean, which apparently is a source of great amusement for the crew, who seem hell-bent on doing their best to destroy the place on a daily basis. He's scrubbing something off the table when Langsham enters. Will, come with me. Without another word, the captain turns and heads back out of the lounge. Will drops his sponge and follows the tall alien. What's up? He asks, catching up with Langsham halfway to the bridge. The captain slows down and looks at Will. We're done here on Gupta. The last of the cargo is here and being loaded now. Rolo and Jax are seeing to getting it stored. Will nods. Okay, cool. Why am I being told this, he thinks. It's time for you to decide what you're going to do. Langsham looks Will in the eyes. 
You can stay here on Gupta. Find work. There are plenty of opportunities. Will looks down at his hands. There's grime and whatever that was on the table on them. I don't want to leave the ship. I don't know you any better than I did a week ago, and I know more about Jackson Rolo than I ever wanted to. But now that I'm stuck out here in space and can never go home, I want to see it all. Langsham smiles. I thought you might say that. Good to hear. This planet sucks, but I wanted it to be your choice. Be clear. This isn't a cruise ship. If you're crew, you work. We do what we need to to keep flying. We don't always do nice things. Will isn't entirely sure what that means, but knows this ship, its crew, and its captain are all a part of some kind of space piracy. I understand. Langsham smiles. I doubt it, but you will eventually, he continues toward the bridge. The crew lounge isn't going to clean itself. Will is sitting in the lounge he's just cleaned when Rolo, the taller of the two aliens, enters. Hey, tiny creature, this place looks nice. Will lifts his grum in a toast. Thanks, Rolo. Where's Jax? The big alien, Will still doesn't know what his race is called, plops down into the seat next to Will. Finishing up in the cargo hold. Uh, the last load is bigger than Langsham planned. It's taking some extra work to get it to all fit. Jack's okay. He's great with making things fit. Grab me one of those. Will grunts, swallowing the reply on the tip of his tongue. He gets up and grabs a grum from the kitchenette, tossing it to, or at, Rolo. He snatches it out of the air with one clawed hand. Will falls back into his seat. So, where are we going next? Where's the cargo going? What is the cargo, for that matter? Rolo looks at him. None of your business, none of your business, and none of your business. Just then, Jax walks in. Rolo stands up. Everything good to go? The less large of the pair grabs the bottle of grum and takes a gulp. Yeah, we're good. I let Langsham know. The two walk over to the kitchen table. Will is still sitting in his chair when the small green alien who hacked into its pod comes in. Apparently, his species is called Braylac. Hey, pink skin, what are you doing? What's it look like, Olgo? Sitting here, enjoying a grum after cleaning this lounge after you fill the animals destroyed it. Again. Will raises his bottle. Say, you know where we're headed? Tweedledee and Twiddledum won't tell me. We're going to Zellier. I don't think you want to know what's in the cargo, uh, but trust me when I say Zellier isn't a friendly place. I think Linksham took this job so we'd have a few extra credits in the ship's account. Do we need the money? Who doesn't need money? I guess, but if it's that dangerous. You worry like this all the time, Pinky. The small hacker is leering at Will. You know, I'm literally twice as tall and probably three times as strong as you, right? He reaches over and punches Olgo. Part 3. Chapter 9. Secrets. In engineering space, the banks of equipment blink steadily. Come on, sit over here. Benny points to a spot on one of the small workbenches. Very well, the bot says, sitting down on the slightly too small bench. Its small secondary arms twitch slightly, fidgeting. Benny starts getting things ready. So, you know where you used to work, but don't recall why you were in the crate or what led to your being in the crate or how you got off your ship? I am afraid that is correct. I do not. The last thing I remember... The last thing I remember is... The last thing... The bot tilts its head. I do not know the last thing I remember... There is plenty of large segments of corrupted memory blocks. The corruption is near the encrypted blocks. That is interesting. Benny reaches out to access the front panel on Gabe's torso. You're telling me! Gabe tilts his head. Telling you what? Benny shakes his head. Well, you obviously have a secret. Those are always exciting. But it sure looks like you're connected to whatever Maxim and Zephyr found out about the Peacekeepers. And their plans to mess everything up in the sector so they can make more money and take over. 
Grow lacking crabnecks. I hate peacekeepers. He jumps up and down. So exciting. Why do you hate the peacekeepers? They serve a noble purpose, dedicating most of their population to helping keep order in the galaxy. Gabe looks down at Benny, who is now attaching data cables to the open access panel on his chest. The terminal on the bench next to Gabe begins displaying diagnostic data. That's what they want you to think. The reality is they're bullies who've tricked the sector into thinking they're this wonderful organization that keeps everyone safe. Except they escort those that don't pay up directly, and they stomp all over everyone's privacy with no consideration whatsoever. They keep technology for themselves, so they always have an advantage. Plus, they do the bidding of the Tarsi first, above all else. Benny walks over to the terminal, still talking. They've destroyed entire colonies and not paid for it. They fake crimes so that they can kidnap people to feed their war machine. There are even rumors that the war with the Confederacy of Trib was started by the peacekeepers to demonstrate their value before that last tax increase the Tarsi rolled out. Now, from what Zephyr and Maxim say, they're doing it again, or at least trying. Grabnax. I had no idea. The engineers I worked with seemed so nice. Gabe turns to look at Benny, his optic sensors spinning to focus on the small hacker. Are you and the crew going to stop them? Benny looks up. Beats me, I just met these Drenogs. Well, the two peacekeeper ones at least. I've known Will since he got the ghost. He doesn't seem to want to get involved and I can't blame him. You don't last long out here fighting fights that aren't yours. It's the fastest way to suck vacuum or blaster barrel, whichever is worse. Both sound like bad things. Benny looks at his terminal. Okay, let's see if I can't help you get your memories back and maybe see what that doodad on your shoulder is. He watches the data scrolling by for a moment, frowning. What the? Gabe turns and said, What did you find? Someone dug around in your databanks and encrypted a day or so's worth of data. Immensely poorly, I might add. They botched it up real good, like they just took a chunk of memory and encrypted it in place, not bothering to copy it to another location or anything. No wonder you were having trouble. Can you affect the needed repairs? Benny looks over at Gabe. I won't take offense to that, since we just met. Thank you, I think. Gabe turns and stares at nothing. Benny continues to work for a few minutes, whistling a tune that's presumably popular on Braylek. There we go. He looks over at Gabe. I need to put you in sleep mode so that I can access the data. I think that's what they did wrong in the first place, messing with your memories while you were online. When I wake you up, everything should be integrated properly. Very well, Gabe says, entering power save mode. His optic sensor grows dark and his head droops forward. This is some grow lack drin right here, Benny says to himself. He reached for the comms panel on the wall. Hey, everyone, get down here. He gets back to work, furiously tapping commands into the console with one hand, while touching various parts of Gabe's insides with a pro. A few minutes later, Will, Zephyr, and Maxim enter the engineering space. What's up? Zephyr asks. You figure out its memory issues? Sure did, Benny nods. I just decrypted them and am reintegrating them into his main databank. Once he boots up, he'll have full access to whatever it was they wanted to block out. Benny looks up from his console. Ready? The Reveal With a few words and clicks, Gabe's optical sensors begin to light up. They spin and focus, and then the tall robot looks from face to face, before settling on Will. I remember now, it says, all of it. Will turns and opens the hatch behind him. Let's go back to the galley. I get the feeling this will warrant some coffee and maybe popcorn. He leaves the room and Zephyr follows. Maxim looks at Benny. What's popcorn? The hacker looks up at his much taller crewmate. Beats me. Come on, Gabe. When they are all seated around the galley table, a cup of coffee in Will's hand, he says, Okay, Gabe, let's hear it. The tall robot looks around. Very well. As I told you already, I am an engineering robot. I was assigned to the peacekeeper carrier Pax Magellanic in the main engineering compartment. 
I was assigned the task of deionizing several of the secondary purge systems. Located in a smaller sublevel of engineering, it was there that I got into trouble. I was working on the third of my twelve purge valves when I heard voices. Usually, I would not have cared about that. Conversations took place all day in the engineering spaces. However, these voices weren't any that I had a voice print match for, meaning that they were not part of the engineering crew. As such, they were accessing locations and possibly systems they were not cleared for access. One of my secondary protocols is to protect the ship and its crew to the best of my ability. If there are saboteurs aboard, it is my duty to stop them. I stopped what I was doing, and I went to investigate. Will holds up a hand. Time out. He gets up and refills his cup. Anyone want some popcorn? He presses a few buttons on the food processor, and a bag of popcorn plunks out onto the tray. Sorry, Gabe, he says, sitting down again. Go on. He takes a handful of popcorn and passes the bag to Maxim. As I was... Oh my gods, this is delicious. Zephyr, try some. Maxim grabs another handful of popcorn, then passes the bag to his companion. He looks at Will. Your planet is full of wonders. Will nods. Truth. Zephyr takes a handful and hands the bag to Benny, who also reaches in, but not before licking all his fingers. He moves to hand the bag back to Will, who waves it away. Keep it, dude. So gross. Benny looks around. What? Gabe makes a coughing-type noise, or at least what it might sound like if a robot could cough. As I was saying, I followed the voices through the engineering space. While not as large as the main engineering compartment, secondary engineering spaces on board peacekeeper carriers are still quite large. I heard the conversation before reaching the speakers. They were talking of a plan to undermine the government of four different star systems, sowing dissonance through rebellions and encouraging neighbor systems to get involved. Once one or two of the systems erupted into chaos, the peacekeepers could come in, stabilize the region, and establish their presence in systems they've been unable to invade legally as yet. It seems like a rather well-thought-out plan. It occurred to me that perhaps it was best not to confront the perpetrators directly, but rather to report the issue to someone above me. Unfortunately, as that thought was processed, I accidentally kicked a pipe that some careless crew member had left laying in the walkway. I reached down to move it safely out of the way, and when I stood up, one of the perpetrators shot me. I assume it was a stunner, since the next time I came online, my diagnostics reported no physical damage yet I noted a lapse in my internal clock of four talks. Zephyr and Maxim look at Will. Will, this is related. This is proof of what we discovered. We can expose the plot. Will raises his hand to the quiet table. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's all just take a breath here. I am not done with my story. Should I continue or... The others all fall silent. Will looks at Gabe. Yeah, keep going. Very good. As I said, when I came back online, I was undamaged, except that I could not move. My motor control systems had been disabled. One of the men I had observed plotting was in the room, as was a peacekeeper ensign. They were discussing disposing of me. The first man was of higher rank, a commander. The last words the man said to the ensign, Just get rid of the bot. It better not exist by morning and then he left. I never saw the man again. Neither person seemed to realize I was back online. Oh, gods, this is grotesque. What did they do? Zephyr is leaning forward, a rather horrified look on her face. Thankfully for me, the ensign had other plans. From what I overheard, he owed someone large sums of money and was able to broker a deal selling me and the data I contained to that party. Zarex's competitor, I assume, Will offers. Possibly. The ensign never used a name. All I overheard was negotiation. The ensign was to trade me and the data I recorded about the coup and some modifications, which explains this, he says, touching the modification on his shoulder, in exchange for the wiping clean of his debt. Shortly after that, 
the ensign encrypted my databanks, not realizing I was online. That would explain the degradation. Gabe looks around the room. The next thing I recall is being activated inside a crate in your cargo hold. The Deal After two days of FTL, the ghost is entering the Falor system, home of the planet Malkor. Everyone is on the bridge, including Gabe. Are you sure about this, Will? We can turn around, find work, I don't know, somewhere. Zephyr is sitting at her station, looking concerned. Yeah, there's no getting around it. If we screw Zarex, finding work will be next to impossible. At least work that doesn't turn our stomachs. I don't mind bounty hunting, but I'm not getting into cartel work. Will is at his pilot station, guiding the ship down the gravity well towards Malkor. They are still a good hour out from the planet. Maxim is at the weapons management console. Do you think you will accept the deal you plan to offer him? Will shrugs. I don't know. He's not a complete psychopath or anything, so he can be reasoned with. I've had to negotiate my way out of trouble with him before. But yeah, this is a big one. We don't know what he agreed to load Gabe up with. And Gabe can't access those systems without the passcodes the Ensign is supposed to provide on payment. Payment he isn't going to get now. He shrugs again. Anyway, here's the plan once we get down there. Will looks at each member of his crew. Zephyr, you and Benny are tackling his shopping list. He looks at Benny. Yeah, I don't trust you. Not one bit, even a little. She'll control the money. You tell her what you need and sell her on it. And she'll pay. Zephyr, if you think he's bullshitting, don't pay. End of story, Benny. This job, even if it pays, won't be enough for everything as it is. He looks at Maxim. Which brings me to you, Max. Take Gabe and go grocery shopping. I've sent a list to your pad of things we need, things I'd like to have, and things that would be cool if you can get them cheaply. Gabe, who's standing near the back of the bridge by the hatch, chimes in. Are you certain it's a good idea for me to leave the ship? Yeah, I think it'll be okay. This will either work or not. Whether you're on the ship or out shopping, it probably won't matter much. You know, things were a lot easier when it was just the ghost and me, and I wasn't broke. Zephyr smiles. I think I speak for everyone here when I say we appreciate it. You've given literally all of us a new lease on life. She looks down at her console, which is beeping. Incoming comms from Malcor Space Control. Will turns to the primary display. On screen, the display switches from the stars to a gruff-looking Malkorite female. Incoming vessel, please identify yourself and state your purpose in the system. She sounds bored. Will smiles. Hi there, Malkor Space Control. This is the Millennium Falcon. We're a small cargo service, here to drop off a crate for a customer, and then look for some work taking us out the system. The bored Malkarite space control operator looks down at her console, then back up at the screen. Very well, Millennium Falcon. You're clear to approach and land at Gelnor Spaceport. Pad 42. Will still smiling. Gelnor Spaceport, Pad 42. Roger that. Malkor Space Control, see you soon. The space control operator tilts her head, then the screen goes blank. Will turns back to Zephyr. Send that info to the comms account we were given. On it. The ghost weaves its way through the traffic around Malkor, finding a spot in the approach line between two large mass cargo haulers. Thirty minutes later, they're burning through the upper atmosphere. Switching over to atmospheric engines, Will says as the main sublight engines disengage. There's a moment when everyone's stomach, except Gabe's, lurches slightly, before the boom of the atmospheric engines kicking in and the press of the forward motion returns. The Past Zelir is a binary star system composed mostly of gas giants, but sitting right in the gravitational sweet spot in Zelir Prime. It is a rocky world covered mainly by ocean. The civilization that originally dwelt on Zelir Prime is long since gone, leaving nothing behind but ruins and ghost stories. No one knows what happened to them. They were clearly a technologically advanced race, but they vanished, their world crumbling to pieces. 
Then the Holgians found it, the perfect world to create a base of operations for a crime syndicate. Hard to reach, mostly unknown and haunted, if you believe in that sort of thing. The Reaper is approaching a space station, or at least Will assumes that's what it is. He's never seen one, besides the International Space Station, and compared to that, this thing is a freaking Star Trek starbase. Langsham is in his chair. Will is leaning against the bulkhead by the hatch, and Rolo, Jax, and Olgo are all on their stations. So, who are the Holgians? Will asks. Jack turns from his station. Just the most dangerous crime syndicate in the sector. I'd list some of the things they're rumored to be guilty of, but I don't want to give you nightmares. No need to be rude. Will sticks his tongue out. Langsham glances back over his shoulders. Imagine the worst criminals your world has to offer, and multiply that by a hundred. They're involved in everything from slaves and drugs to weapons. The Reaper slides into a large landing bay next to another ship, only about half as big, but clearly a ship meant for fighting. Will lets out a low whistle. That looks mean. It's another Uncarn vessel. Earlier model than the Reaper, but no less mean. Even with the peacekeepers keeping the Uncarns on a short lease, the Holgians have quite a few of their best. Langsham stands, as on the forward display, a party is visible walking towards the ship. The lead Holgian is a hulking being. Will can't determine its sex from the screen, but it's huge and mean-looking. Sort of like a seven-foot-tall Triceratops sand tail. It's not wearing any armor or weapons that Will can see. But he supposes that makes sense if this station, and for that matter the entire planet below, are part of the criminal empire this being runs. Don Corleone didn't wear armor either. Slightly behind and to the right of the massive crime lord is another being, one Will knows only from the newscasts he's seen on the ship, a peacekeeper. Uh, hey, Langsham, isn't that a peacekeeper? Will asks. Will, you stay on the ship. The captain raises his hand to stop Will's protest. The Holgians would exploit your world in a heartbeat, and if they find out I have a human on my crew, they'll demand I turn you over. That peacekeeper down there won't help and will likely do what he can to hide the complete enslavement of your people from his superiors and the GC. What? Will asks. Enslavement? Why? How? The captain looks at him levelly. Do you really want to find out? Will slumps down in the nearest chair. Fine. There is one thing you can do. Our agreement states that they pay on delivery. The transfer should take place the moment we start moving cargo. Keep an eye on the ship's account. If you don't see the payment, hail me. Langsham pulls up the account on a secondary display. Will nods. Ten minutes later, Will watches as the number on the ship's account increases. He nods to himself. No need to call Langsham. From the camera in the cargo hold, he can see the captain heading over to the large party while the crew starts moving crates. Everyone is involved, even the two engineering crew members, who Will hardly knows. As the crew offloads the cargo, Langsham and the head Holgian watch. The peacekeeper is keeping his distance from them, but not helping with the cargo. Will takes a seat in Langsham's chair, looking at them through the various visual feeds from outside the ship. Rolo and Jax are helping to unload, with a few Holgian pitching in. Olgo is sitting on a crate watching and, from the looks of it, making jokes. Rolo and Jax are trying to stifle laughs, and it seems like one of the Holgians is too. Everything seems pretty friendly. Langsham and the lead Holgian, meanwhile, are having what looks like a heated discussion. Will zooms in on the feed. Langsham looks mad. That mysterious peacekeeper has moved to stand beside the Holgian crime boss. Will hasn't known him long enough to read his expressions, but he looks worried too. Will pans the view to Olgo, who's not making jokes now. Rolo and Jax have stopped smiling. All three look anxious, as do the other two crew members at the top of the cargo ramp. Will leans forward in the chair. What the hell is going on? Things are looking more and more tense between Langsham and the lead Holgian. The other two Holgians are moving away from the crew of the Reaper. The peacekeeper has also stepped away a few paces and is working his wrist calm. Will looks up at the ceiling. Computer, can you identify that peacekeeper? 
A small red square appears over the peacekeeper's head, then flashes and stays green when the alien looks up from his wrist com. Peacekeeper Subcenturion Janus, the sexless voice of the ship's computer replies. Commanding officer of the 5th Strategic Division, 1st Fleet. Will reaches for a button on the panel in front of him to open a comms link to Langsham and the crew, but before he can press it, all hell breaks loose on the screen. The Holgians are running all over. The crew is falling to the ground, writhing in pain. Jax has his blaster out, getting off three shots at the Holgians before falling to the deck. Will hits the button. Langsham! Rolo! Jax! All go! What's happening? All he hears from the other end is coughing and gagging. He can see them on the screen. They're dying. The Holgians seem fine, though, slowly moving out from behind their cover. Commander Janus is still standing where he was before, smiling also unaffected. Some type of biological agent, then. But how could that be? All six members of the Reaper's crew are dying. But they're all different races. This doesn't make sense. Langsham, can you hear me? Oh God, what do I do? Will can see Langsham writhing on the deck, his hair falling out, his skin turning white. The lead Holgian is standing right next to him laughing before saying something Will can't make out. Olgo isn't moving at all. Reaper. There's a cough. Authorization code. Langsham 43 Bravo 44 587. Another fit of coughing. Wetter now. Transfer all command. Codes to crewman Will, Will Calder. Will sees Langsham coughing up blood. Emergency protocol. Run away. Good. Coughing and gagging. Good luck, Will. I'm sorry. The line doesn't cut out, but Will doesn't hear anything more. Until the head Holgian orders his goons into the ship to search it. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. On the screen, Langsham collapses. The others are already dead, or at least not moving. Probably dead. Foam is running out of Rolo's mouth. The Holgians are walking toward the ship. Oh, fuck. They have their weapons drawn. Suddenly the ship is rumbling, the cargo ramp is lifting, and the weapon systems are coming online. What the hell? Will says, startled. The lights on the bridge have shifted to a red color, and the station Jack's occupied, apparently tactical, has come to life and is running through a list of targets. Computer, what's happening? On the screen, the Holgians sent to search the Reaper are tumbling down the ramp, scrambling away from the ship. Will has never actually interacted with the computer but has no choice but to now. On screen, the ship is lifted off the deck. Self-defense protocols enacted, the voice of the Reaper says. Evasion of capture protocol enacted, Captain. Captain? The ship is lifting up and spinning to face the opening of the docking bay. Blasters have deployed from the underside of the ship and are firing at the Holgians. The shots seem more intent on keeping the Holgians occupied than harming them. The next thing Will sees is that the ship has cleared the docking bay. He switches the view aft and sees the Holgians all standing at the edge of the docking bay. The other Ankar and ship looks like it's powering up. With no warning, the Reaper leaps into FTL. Will is standing in the middle of the bridge, looking around as the stars spin and blur. Well, shit, he says. Chapter 10 Gelnor Spaceport. Malkor, and the entire Felor system for that matter, are at best mid tier as far as population and prestige are concerned. Felor has only two habitable planets. Malkor is the largest. The other, Gilkor, is one of the moons orbiting a gas giant. Gilkor is more industrial than its larger cousin mines, refineries, and so on. Malkor, while boasting a substantial industrial zone, is mostly commercial and residential in nature. Cities that span dozens of kilometers cover the larger continents. The single ocean is covered in small floating towns. While not a major tourist attraction, the planet sees a lot of business and commercial traffic, as well as being a popular stopover for ships and convoys on long-haul cross-sector trips. In other words, Malcor does all right. That level of doing all right sometimes leads to ego issues with the elected officials and upper class, who feel their world and system are far more important than they truly are. 
This can result in overzealous law enforcement of criminal activity, which is why Zarex is not on planet, but maintains an operation there. While there's no shortage of hoity-toity citizens who like to think crime isn't something their cities and planet have to deal with, there's plenty of others who engage in just about every known vice there is. So Zarex's operations on Malkor are quite profitable. Just a bit risky. Gelnor Spaceport is situated on reclaimed swampland outside the city of Gelnor, a mid-sized city from Alcor. Several million people contained in a few square kilometers of glass and duracrete. Hundreds of high-rise dwellings create a moderately impressive skyline. If it were the first alien city Will had ever seen, the skyline would leave him breathless, putting New York, London, Los Angeles, and Denver all to shame. Having been on Tarsus, it's only slightly impressive. Having been on Malcor before, it's not even worth a second glance. Pad 42 is along the outer ring of landing pads, essentially in the low rent district. Once the ghost touches down and the atmospheric engines spin down, the cargo doors open and the boarding ramp drops down. Will, Zephyr, Maxim, Benny, and Gabe walk down the ramp, looking round carefully. The spaceport is busy, to say the least. Hundreds of ships on the ground, dozens in the air, coming or going. There are thousands of beings from all over the sector going about their business. Okay, you all know your jobs. Go get them done. Then meet back here. Calms me if you have any trouble. Will lifts his wrist calm. Computer, lock up the ship. Self-defense protocol, bravo. Acknowledged, Captain. Ship is secure. The spaceport is just outside the city, connected by a wide bridge that houses the first of many shopping districts. Those nearest the spaceport tend to offer the worst selection at the highest prices, since many who land only have a short time on planet and can't get much further. The experienced spacers walk right through the shopping district, never slowing down to let the buskers get their hands, claws, or tentacles on them. The easiest way to get through the shopping district is to rent a ground car, or, if you're feeling flush, rent a sky car. Will is feeling neither flush nor inclined to part with even a single credit he doesn't have to. He heads off in the direction of the nearest pedestrian exit, at least a kilometer away from the ghost. We're walking, Benny complains, falling in line with the rest of the crew. You know my legs are literally half as long as yours. Hey, what the... He screeches as Gabe reaches down and picks him up, depositing him not too gently on his shoulders. Without missing a step, the robot lifts Benny's hands off its optic sensors. Problem solved. Benny slaps the top of Gabe's head. This is embarrassing. Would you rather walk? Carry on, but don't jostle me. Benny sniffs and one hand slips back over the robot's optical sensor. Benny and Zephyr. Arriving at the pedestrian archway of the spaceport, the crew of the ghost comes to a stop to one side so as not to interrupt the flow of foot traffic. Will looks around at them all. Okay, meet you all back at the ghost. If you get there first, the computer should let you in as long as you have your wrist calm. Gabe, until you get a proper comms unit built into you, you'll have to stick with Maxim to get back onto the ship. If everything goes as planned, I'll only be a few talks. Zephyr, remember, you're in charge of the funds. Don't spend it if you don't have to. Does that mean we can steal things? Benny chimes in. Both Will and Zephyr answer together. No. Will pauses then. Well, no, you know what? No, no stealing's too risky. The rest of the group splits up, heading into the shopping district, leaving only Zephyr and Benny. Looking down at Benny, she extends a hand before him. Lead the way. Benny stalks off down the main walkway of the shopping district, head up, marching with purpose. Zephyr shakes her head, smiling. It feels good to have friends, even annoying ones. The walk through the first shopping district takes Zephyr and Benny some time. As they leave the bridge shopping district, they hit a fork in the main road. Off to one side is a mass of stalls selling clothes, food, and other goods. The other fork leads to the technology sector, as is evident from the neon and holographic buskers. Benny makes a kind of cackle-laughing noise and increases his pace. Zephyr follows. 
The small hacker ducks into a shop that clearly sells something electronic, but Zephyr can't tell what that might be. She follows him inside and sees Benny deep into a negotiation with the store owner. He had maybe a 15-tick lead on her. How was he already negotiating? This isn't even this year's model multiplexer, he's saying. Why would I pay the list price? Because it's brand new, the shop owner replies. He's some type of lanky, thin thing Zephyr sees with four arms and not a single hair on his body. Oh, and two tails. It's brand new and old, Benny counters. Take 20% off and it's sold. The shopkeeper crosses both sets of arms, uncrosses them, then does this two more times. Fine, you little monster. 20% off, but you also buy your data cables from me. Benny smiles. Deal. He looks over to Zephyr, clearly signaling pay the bean. She sends over the payment from her risk comp. The shopkeeper hands Benny a bag and looks at Zephyr. Thank you. As they leave the shop, Zephyr looks down at Benny. So, what did we just buy? Benny laughs. A state-of-the-art, albeit last year's model, multiplexer. It's the... She raises a hand. I won't understand, will I? He looks at her and smiles. No? He turns and heads deeper into the technology shopping area. A few stops later, Zephyr has her hands full of bags, a box under each arm, and is looking around frantically. She whistles. Hey, Cargobot, come here. A Cargobot rolls over, queries Zephyr's risk comm, then answers. Hello, the charge for cargo services is one credit per talk. Would you like to pay by the talk or for the entire day? Zephyr looks to Benny. How much more do we need? How much more credit do we have left? He grins and rubs his hands together. Looking at the cargo bot, Zephyr sighs. We'll pay by the hour. Follow us. She looks at Benny. One more stop. Make it count. Maxim and Gabe After Will, Zephyr, and Benny walk off, Maxim and Gabe look at each other, then head into the nearest shopping district. They take in the sights around them, unlike those closer to the city. This district covers a little of everything, catering just about any need a traveler with limited time might have. Technology, food, clothing, and more, all mixed together. Maxim enjoys markets like this one compared to the more orderly style closer to the city. This is mostly because he enjoys window shopping, so these kind of districts give him a little of everything. Even though his face doesn't show anything, with its two optic sensors. Maxim can't help but feel like the bot is also enjoying the scenery. Have you ever been to a shopping district before? He asks. Or a spaceport for that matter? Gabe turns to look at him. I have not. Up until this moment. I have never been outside the peacekeeper carrier Pax Magellanic. More accurately, the engineering spaces aboard that ship. I came online the first time there, and never left. Maxim shakes his head. We have much to show you. They continue walking for a while, Gabe taking in and cataloging everything he sees, every species, every type of food and piece of equipment. He's been online for over 15 cycles, and has never set foot outside the engineering spaces of a peacekeeper carrier and he never once gave a single CPU cycle to thinking about leaving. Now, however, watching so many different species all conversing and engaging in commerce, he has a hard time understanding why. There's such wonder in the universe. Finally, they reach the end of the first shopping district and make their way towards the food stalls. Maxim accesses his risk comm to check their shopping list. Will has made notes next to some of the items, presumably indicating acceptable alternatives. Since Gabe doesn't have the list and has no idea what most of the things on the list are, other than food, he's basically along for the ride. Maxim assumes that Will simply didn't trust the robot alone on the ghost. If Maxim were in charge, he'd feel the same way. The newest member of their little crew seems pleasant enough for a bot but they know only what it's told them about its past life. 
The fact that it's been modified is also peculiar and a little worrying. Will didn't seem to give it much thought, but Maxim knows what kind of peacekeeper tech can fit in the space available on Gabe's shoulders. The shopping is slow going. Maxim doesn't know what a lot of the things on the list are, let alone their Will-approved alternatives. He spends a great deal of time asking shopkeepers for help. Thankfully, in the shopping districts, like this one, everyone is friendly, or at least friendly enough. If a vendor isn't going to get your money, they'll help another get it. At one vendor, Gabe looks over Maxim's shoulders at the list. What is peanut butter? Maxim shrugs. Human thing. Will. If everything goes as planned, I'll only be a few talks, Will says. Zephyr, remember you're in charge of the funds. Don't spend it if you don't have to. Without waiting for an answer, he heads off through the shopping district. Glancing at his wrist comm, he makes a connection. We're on the ground. Where are you? The screen doesn't show anyone on the other end, but the connection is live. Chora Avenue and Oxar Boulevard, says a voice. Traxxas Imports. Ask for Lorath. Then the connection drops. Will pulls up the city network and downloads a map, inputting the intersection he's looking for. Makes sense it's not too far, he thinks. The cover business is an importer, and any dealings Zarix is likely to have would be with people from the spaceport. He'd get there faster if he took a ground car, but honestly, Will isn't in a big hurry. Even if Zarix isn't here, whomever he trusts enough to run his business on Malkor is likely just as bad as Zarix, and therefore not someone Will is in a hurry to meet. So he lets himself enjoy the walk there. The view isn't bad, he has to admit. The corner he's looking for isn't in the fancy part of town, but it's past all the shopping districts, right on the edge of the warehouse district. As such, it's still a vast improvement over the bar Zarix uses as an office on Fury. It's also apparently the only business on this street, at least the only one that's open. There's not a soul anywhere around. Great, no witnesses, Will mumbles. He walks up to the shop marked Traxxas Imports. It's nothing spectacular, a two-story building with a large service door and a smaller personnel door beside it. With one final glance around, he walks in. The inside of the building is nicer than he expected. The reception desk is wood and a jet black, shot through with a gold and silver mark. The entire desk seems to have been carved from a single piece, from a tree which must have been easily ten feet in diameter. The rest of the room is just as impressive. A sofa made of some small animal hide, like leather, though Will assumes it's not. There's polished metal everywhere, and light seems to come from everywhere, and nowhere at the same time, though he can't see a single light fixture. The receptionist is, well, beautiful. Will has never seen her species before. She's humanoid, but with feline accents, whiskers, and swishing tail and all. Hello, may I help you? She ends the question with a purring sound. Will walks up to the desk and leans on it, smiles, and gives her a wink. Here to see Lorath. She's expecting you. Is something wrong with your face? Her smile reveals a set of long, sharp incisors. Not waiting for his answer, she continues. Through those doors. Her tail lifts up and points to the door off to the side. Uh, great, uh, thanks. Will turns away from the desk, toward the door. Here goes nothing. I'm sorry. What did you say? Nothing. As he approaches the door, it snaps open with a hiss. Enter, says a voice from within. If the receptionist's voice was pure sexuality, this voice is pure aggression. As soon as Will steps inside the office, the door snaps shut. Will Calder, welcome to Malcor. Do you have Zarix's merchandise? The front office might have been plush, but the back office is downright opulent. The same gold-silver-veined wood is evident here, but in a shape of a much larger, much more ornate desk. The room is starkly furnished. Just the desk, the being behind it, 
and two chairs on the other side of the desk. Oh, and there's a giant head on the wall. Will doesn't know what type of creature it is, but if its teeth are any indication, it's easily four meters tall and likely vicious. The being behind the desk is definitely not the same race as the one at the reception desk. She's big, but not bulky, covered in scales that seem to shift from pink to dark purple and back as she moves. Apart from the scales, she's not overly reptilian, almost avian, in fact. She rests her arms on the desk and Will can see that her powerful arms are, in fact, wings. At some point, her people could fly. The galaxy is full of wonders, Will thinks to himself. This one might try to kill him shortly, but still. He takes a seat opposite Lorath, admiring the view. Will reaches out and puts a data chip on the table and slides it across. Sure do. Here. She reaches out with one clawed hand, picking up the chip. This is it. I was under the impression there'd be more to it. Like a bot of some type. Her eyes never leave Will's. He's about to start into a story when a subtle red light built into the desk begins blinking. He closes his mouth, looking from the light to Lorath and back. Uh, what's that? Her eyes never leaving his, she stands up. Stay right here. She walks around the desk, and he sees she's wearing a smart business suit, sleeveless blouse, business-like trousers. She walks to the wall and touches a control. The screen comes to life. On it, Will catches a glimpse of the front office. The feline receptionist is talking to someone. Oh, shit. She's talking to a peacekeeper. Lorath lets out a hissing sound. She spins and looks at Will. You were followed. Will is up and out of his chair. Are you kidding? Hell no, I wasn't followed. You do something lately that would attract the authorities? The look she gives Will answers that question. There's a knock at the door. On the screen, the peacekeepers are standing at the door to Lorath's office. Shit. Will grabs his blaster and reaches to activate his face shield. The door explodes inward, nearly knocking him over. His face shield comes up just in time as debris flies everywhere. Two peacekeepers rush through the remains of the door, blaster rifles at the ready. One flies backwards as a pulse rifle blast hits him or her squarely in the chest. The other peacekeeper dives to the side, returning fire. Will is off to the side, crouching, looking around. Lorath has somehow gotten behind her desk, pulse rifle in hand, and energy shield sparkling around her. She's taking aim at the other peacekeeper, as two more storm the doorway, firing in her direction. She ducks behind her desk, taking two hits to her shield. Neither peacekeeper has seen Will, so he fires on both of them, distracting them, as Lorath and her rifle take them out. We gotta get out of here. Will shouts to her as he runs at a crouch towards her desk. He stops dead in his tracks as she shifts the pulse rifle to him. We? Will is about to say something when a grenade rolls into the room. He turns away and dives for the corner just as the grenade explodes. More blaster rifles fill the room. Lorath reaches under her desk. You're on your own. But this isn't over, she growls. She suddenly drops under the desk and Will hears a hatch snap shut. Damn it, he hisses, as he makes another dive for the desk. Then he pops back up, firing blindly at the destroyed doorway. Okay, now what, he asks himself. Dropping down again behind the desk, blaster bolts are eating away at the ebony wood. The animal head on the wall falls to the floor beside him, scorched from all the weapons fire. Before he can formulate a plan, Will hears a commotion. The blaster fire from the outer room slows, then stops. The yelling, however, increases. He slowly raises his head, just in time to see the immensely attractive feline receptionist going full ninja warrior on the peacekeepers. She must have been hiding behind her desk, playing the scared receptionist role until they all turned their backs on her. Will looks around, trying to think. Okay, how do I get out of here? He crawls under the desk. There was a button or something underneath it that she had used. He runs his hands all along the underside of the wood. There it is. He touches the control and the panel under the desk slides down. The commotion in the outer room is dying down. Cat Ninja Girl has likely been subdued. Will drops down through the open panel into a dark tunnel, and the hatch overhead closes behind him.
So now what? He asks himself, retracting his face shield and looking around. Then he sees it. Oh, shit. There's a timer on the wall, counting down. It's almost to zero. Will reactivates his face shield along with the night vision mode and takes off running down the tunnel. A few meters from what looks like the exit, the entire tunnel erupts in dust, and the whole thing shakes violently. The explosion, Will realizes, must have leveled the entire building he was just coming from. Chapter 11 It could have been worse. Maxim and Gabe are the first to return to the ghost. Gabe is loaded down with bags and boxes. As Maxim accesses the ship's systems via his RISCOM, he says, If nothing else, you saved us the rental fee for a cargo bot. He smiles as the cargo doors open and the boarding ramp lowers with a hiss. Thank you, Gabe answers from behind a pile of boxes. Let's get all this put away before the others get back. Should we secure the ship? Gabe asks as they crest the top of the boarding ramp. No, the others should be along shortly. Computer, alert us if anyone approaches the boarding ramp. Will do. The chipper computer replies from the nearest speaker. They're almost done stocking the shelves in the pantry when the computer pipes up. Zephyr and Benary are approaching the boarding ramp. Maxim closes the pantry with a clunk. Thanks. As the other two enter the shared space, Benny waves to Gabe. Hey, big guy, can you help me unload the cargo bot? Maxim walks over to Zephyr, pulling her close. How was babysitting the small green annoyance? He leans in and kisses her. She smiles back. Surprisingly, not as bad as I expected. Let me tell you about it. They head off to the lounge section chatting. Benny looks up at Gabe. Did you guys hear the explosion? Gabe turns his head towards Benny, while his arms continue stacking jars of something Will called an okay alternative to Nutella. He shakes his head, Benny shrugs. Just then, there's the sound of cargo doors closing. Computer, start the pre-flight procedure, Will's voice says. Maxim and Zephyr look up from their conversations. Will is covered in dust. How'd it go? Zephyr asks. Will opens the cooler and grabs a grum. Well, Zarix's interests here on Malkor are more or less over. The peacekeepers raided the place. Everyone stops what they're doing. Almost in unison, they all say, What? Will raises his hand. Yeah, I know. No idea what the hell happened. I know I wasn't followed, and there's no reason I would be. Lorath must have already been under investigation, and my showing up must have made them jump, thinking I was part of whatever they were up to. Either way, she's flapping in the wind, and her building is a lot of rubble, with the parts of a few peacekeepers thrown in. I gave her the data. I think she had it on her when she fled, but I'm not sure. He looks at Gabe. For better or worse, you're with us now. The bot looks at each of them, then turns to Will. That is good. Will stares back and blinks a few times. All righty then. I kind of expected more... Anywho, let's get the hell out of here. Zephyr raises her hand. Uh, what exactly are we going to do now? Oh, well, yeah. I guess we should decide that, huh? Maxim clears his throat. We should take our evidence to the Galactic Commonwealth. Whether Zarix has the data or not, from what you say about him, he wouldn't do the right thing with it. Will nods. My guess is he's hoping to sell it back to the bad guys. Benny shakes his head. We should hack into one of the main broadcast stations and transmit the evidence everywhere. Zephyr looks at Will hard. We can't do that. Will looks over at Gabe. Anything from you? Taking all opinions here. Gabe tilts his head. I am just happy to be here. As if on cue, the ship chimes in. Captain, the pre-flight checks are complete. We're ready to take off. Complications This just in. We're receiving word that the conflict in Harith's system has escalated. What was once viewed as a small conflict between two rival factions within the system has since spilled over into neighboring star systems, 
precipitated by the destruction of a Zangar cargo convoy. The Zangar, until now, have not been involved in the conflict within the Hareth system. The Galactic Commonwealth has not commented on the matter yet, beyond saying that they're closely monitoring the situation. However, observers have noted that several peacekeeper carriers have begun moving in the direction of the Hareth system. Even though the GC and peacekeepers have no jurisdiction there, the Zangars are dues-paying members of the Commonwealth. It's unclear at this moment whether they have officially requested aid or not. We'll have more on this situation as it develops. I'm Monel Farage with GNO. After the broadcast, the display returns to the view of the stars. Will breaks the silence. Well, fuck. Zephyr stands up at her station. We have to do something. Will sighs. I know, I know, damn it. Running both hands through his hair, he groans. We have to go to Harith. Gabe, who has taken up a spot standing by the hatch, asks, Is that wise? Based on the newscast we just saw, the Harith system is likely to be quite dangerous. Would it make more sense to go to Zangar? Maxim chimes in. Or maybe even Tarsus directly? No, Zephyr replies. I think Will is right. It has to be Harith. Showing them the proof we have will immediately discredit the peacekeepers, and the rebels will probably lose all public support. They likely have support right now, because no one knows the peacekeepers are supplying them. Drin, the rebels may not even know who's supplying them. Will looks down at his console. Setting course for the Harris system is the only play that makes sense, and honestly... The only play that I can see where we have a chance of not dying. Gabe, get down to engineering. It's been a few years since the ghost has had a proper engineer aboard. Do whatever you need to to get things ship shape down there. Now that you're connected to the ship's network, just send over a list of must-have parts. Yes, Captain. Gabe turns to the hatch. Will nods at the departing bot, then turns to Maxim. You might still get your shot with those weapons. Run all the diagnostics, get everything ready, and make a list of everything you need. Must-haves only. Benny sits up at his station. Can I go shopping again? No, Will snaps, holding up a finger. But you can get ready. We're gonna need new ship IDs and transponder codes. At least two. One to get us into the area, another to get us out. To be safe, maybe one or two more. Plus... If you can work on those firewalls on Gabe's backpack, that'd be great. You know how hard it is coming up with clean names and codes that pass even a little bit of investigation? Let alone peacekeeper levels? Benny asked. That's no small ask. It'll take me days at the very least. I know. Time to put all that gear I bought you to work. And you better get started. Will turns to Zephyr. This isn't going to be easy. She smiles but it will be worth it. ETA? Will looks down at his console. A week. Probably a little longer if we have to make a stop to pick up essentials. Computer, keep tabs on GNO and other news sources for mentions of the Harith system or the Zangar system. Of course, Captain. The computer replies brightly. Within two days, the ghost is entering orbit over Truel Prime. The crew stands on the bridge, watching the planet spin below them as they begin their descent to the surface. Gabe and Maxim both have shopping lists that make Will's head spin, even after being pared down to what he considers the essentials. The report from engineering was worse than the one from tactical, which Will had expected. He's had more occasion to use the ship's weapons and knows what works and what doesn't. Though in his years of owning the Ghost, he's never used all the available weapons. The missile bay is nearly empty, the port side disruptor emitter is in need of replacement, and the targeting computer is two firmware releases behind. That explains some of my targeting issues in the past, Will thinks, remembering a time when some pirates were chasing him and the computer couldn't seem to hit a damn thing. I just hope we don't have to try to shoot anything. The past. The Reaper has been flying an FTL for somewhere near 12 hours. Will has been sitting silently on the bridge the entire time. 
the images of his, well, technically captors, but also friends, sort of. Dying horrible deaths at the ship's space station has been repeating over and over in his mind. Langsham bloody foam spilling from his mouth at the feet of the lead Hulgian. Rolo and Jax collapse near the grav sled with crates loaded on it. Olgo lying on the crate he'd been sitting on, blood pooling around his head. Langsham's last words over the comms unit. Good luck, Will. I'm sorry. You're sorry. You're sorry, he mumbles. His voice is scratchy from lack of use. The bridge is dark. It's night on board the ship, and even though Will has been mostly catatonic the last 12 hours, the Reaper has been carrying out its final orders. Run away. To where, Will has no idea. The ship jumped to FTL, and he hasn't moved or spoken since. Computer, he croaks. What's, what's our destination? Current destination is spatial coordinates. The computer rattles off a string of numbers that have no meaning to Will. Computer, stop. Take us out of FTL. The primary display shifts back from stretched out star lines to thousands of little points of light. Computer, are there any ships near us or planets? There's a slight pause as the computer consults the sensor data. Negative. The emotionless response comes from the overhead speakers. There are no ships within sensor range. There are no planets or star systems within sensor range. Will stands up, his legs sore from not moving in hours. Suddenly, he realizes he has to pee. A few minutes later, he's back on the flight deck, looking over each station, remembering the being who last sat there. He had barely known them, had only been part of the crew for a few weeks but he had come to terms with the fact that he was never going home, and that for better or worse, the Reaper was his home. But now, now what? Can he operate the ship on his own? Does he want to? What would he do with it? Maybe sell it and get something else? Something more suited to his nature? He doesn't even know what the ship is worth. He spends a week drifting in deep space cleaning. The ship was always dirtier than he could stand, but with six aliens doing their best to dirty it, and one trying to clean it, he had never stood a chance. The cleaning helps keep his mind off of his situation. Every new station or section he moves on to, he asks the computer for an overview of its function and level of automation, building a mental list of what running the ship solo might look like. After the ship is as spotless as he can get it, he returns to the bridge and looks around. I can't avoid this any longer, can I? Please restate question, the computer replies. Not talking to you. Wait. Actually, I am. Put a star map up on the main display, the Reaper in the center, and highlight planets with spaceports we can afford to land at. The main screen switches to a zoomed-out view spanning several light years, with the ship in the center. A half dozen planets are highlighted, their names on a tag next to each. Will walks around the forward stations, right up to the main display. Humming to himself, he leans toward the screen. Hmm, fury. He walks back to the central control station, where Langsham had piloted the ship from. Computer, set a course for fury, and take us to FTL. The display reverts to its normal view, and the stars stretch into lines. Computer. ETA Fury. A beep, then. Four standard days. Nodding mostly to himself, since the computer, as far as he knows, can't see him, he says. Computer. Does the ship have any type of training mode so I can get up to speed on piloting it? Affirmative. This vessel is equipped with a training simulation mode. This mode can be activated while travel is underway. Will plops into the captain's seat my seat now, I guess, and tells the computer. Okay, activate training simulation. Wait, do you have other voices? There are a number of voice prompts available. Would you like them listed? After spending nearly 15 minutes listening to the ship say the same thing over and over in different languages and sexes, 
or lack thereof. Will picks one. Turning to face the main display, he says clearly, Okay, now let's go ahead and start the simulation. Then to himself, he adds, You've got four days, Calder. Let's do this. Simulation commencing. The new bland but clearly male voice responds. Part 4 Chapter 12 Just the Essentials Troll Prime lies halfway between Malkor and the Hareth system, as good a place as any to stop and do some shopping. The black market there is thriving, which is a good thing since that's where Maxim shopping list will take them. Gabe's shopping list is easier and more straightforward and considerably shorter. As they cruise through the clouds over Troll Prime, atmospheric engines roaring, Will addresses the team. Okay, guys, here's the deal. We're scraping the bottom of the ship's accounts again. Lorath didn't get around to paying. Not that she necessarily would have anyway. I doubt anyone is going to be handing out credits in the Hareth system. So bargain hard, bargain like your life depends on it. Because it might if we can't get some credits in the account after this. Gabe, you take Benny. According to Zephyr, he's a born negotiator. Will nods to the Braylac, who's beaming. Zephyr, Maxim, and I will hit the night market and get the weapons and parts to repair the ship's tactical systems. Questions? No one says a thing. Good. Then let's do this. Faster we're done, faster we're on our way to Hareth. Everyone nods. You know I sprung you two, thinking it was just a jab at the peacekeepers. Now I'm thinking karma's a bitch. Gabe leans forward from his spot by the door. Who is Karma? The spaceport they touch down in is one of the larger ports on the planet. Will has already identified the night market where they can get their weapon systems components. The ghost may be more or less legitimately owned, but that doesn't change the fact that munitions of the type she uses are hard for non-military personnel to get their hands on. The night market is their best bet, home to just about everything a being could want. From drugs, weapons, technology, sex, and slaves, to things beyond normal comprehension. Will rarely visits night markets. For one thing, going alone is a dangerous proposition. For another, they're so full of things Will doesn't understand and doesn't want to be a part of, he'd rather not get involved with any of it. Add to that that there are slaves. Easier to just not see that stuff. Walking down the boarding ramp, Will takes a last look at everyone. Okay, remember, get only what we absolutely need. Then get back here. Benny and Gabe, the tech sector is out the main gates. To the right. Gabe, keep an active comm link with the rest of us, and if you hear me say run, stop what you're doing and get back to the ghost as fast as you can. The tall bot and the tiny hacker nod, and then head off on their errand. Will turns to Zephyr and Maxim. Okay, you two. Let's get this done. Every spaceport and shopping district in the galaxy has a night market. Some are no more than two shabby stalls, some are square blocks or kilometers wide. Despite their size, they're often still not obvious to those not looking. Hidden behind dull and vague storefronts or underground and abandoned caverns, Knowing how to spot and enter a night market is a skill unto itself. Right now, Will walks towards what looks like a stall selling fabric. Grabbing a bolt of dark blue fabric, he asks the shopkeeper, Does this come in a darker shade? The shopkeep, an aging Partherian woman, looks at Will, then at the two XP peacekeepers, then reaches under the catch register. A section of wall behind her opens. Bolts of fabric draped over the seam make it impossible to see the door until it's open. Will hands her the bolt of fabric and walks in. Zephyr and Maxim follow. On the display screen mounted in the corner of the shop, the screen cuts to a GNO broadcast. If you're just joining us, things out on the frontier are getting heated. The warring Hareth factions have again let their conflict spill outside their system as the rebels harassing the legitimate government of Hareth Prime have once again attacked the Zingar. 
This time, a deep space station on the outer edge of the Zangar system has been bombed. This is another violation of the sovereign borders of the Zangar and risks GC intervention. Already, the GC has deployed four peacekeeper carriers to the system, with more promise should the need arise. GNO will keep you up to date on this developing situation. This is Monel Farash with GNO. The Night Market Every night market is different. Some are close to respectable looking, others are dark dungeons you'd rather never visit. This one is somewhere in the middle, likely due to it being the largest on the planet and nearest to the most populous city and spaceport. Just when Will is talking himself into being semi-okay with the place, he sees a stall advertising young women of a dozen different species. Of course, none are actually in the booth, that'd be too risky. These slaver booths simply promote the goods, take payment, and set up a rendezvous arrangement. Fuming, Will increases his pace until he's past the stall, Zephyr and Maxim trailing behind him. This market is entirely underground. The entrance at the fabric seller's booth had led down a short ramp to what must have been an abandoned mass transit system, or at least part of one. The bulk of the market was set up in what must have once been a large shopping atrium for passengers. Some of the lesser stalls are set up nearer the transit tracks and tunnels. You know, I've never been to a night market I wasn't raiding, Zephyr says as they pass a stall selling personal weaponry that's outlawed everywhere the peacekeepers have a say. It's remarkable how they can be so established. Will looks back at her. Yeah, you might be surprised how many of these markets have someone in peacekeeper command, or for that matter, the GC directly, on speed dial on their wrist comms. This way. He heads down an artificial alleyway created by the back walls of several more permanent stalls. They turn another corner and around a stall that nearly double the size of every other one they've seen and find themselves in what is signposted as Armament Alley. Will looks up at the sign. Cute. Gabe and Benny have a far easier task than the others. The tech sector is, for one thing, completely legal. For another, Gabe's shopping list isn't that long. They see a storefront advertising exotic parts and... Seeing as an Ankaran raptor is definitely on the exotic side, they decide their odds are better here. Welcome, my friends, says the shopkeeper, who is also clearly a Braylek. Oh, Dren, mutters Benny. Gabe looks down at his companion, then back to the shopkeeper. What can I help you with today? Since Benny isn't speaking up, Gabe decides to. We're seeking three Type G power regulators and two Type 109B thermocouples. Also, if you have them, we are in need of 15 plasma regulators, type 2. The shopkeeper beams. Well, well, that's quite the shopping list. You come to the right place. Not many shops have parts for Ankaran ships. A raptor, I think, yes? He looks between the robot and the Braylax standing with it, smiling. You are? Gabe begins before Benny cuts Gabe off, raising a hand to silence the robot. Yeah, our ship is on Karn. You have the parts we need. So that you know, price is paramount. We don't need shiny and new. Let's see the refurbished stock. Good sir, the shopkeep protests. We only sell top of the... Benny raises his hand. Okay, we're leaving. I'm sure there's another shop that has what we need. As he turns to leave, dragging a confused Gabe with him, the small shopkeep scurries after them, running around to block their exit. Okay, okay, you clearly know what you're doing. Come on, I'll show you my stock. Let's talk price. The three head to the back of the shop. An immensely confusing for Gabe, hour later, he and Benny are leaving the shop carrying four overstuffed boxes. Benny is beaming and crowing about how great a negotiator he is and how lucky they are that he was able to get the shopkeep to throw in a brand new protein sequencer with their purchase. You know how much better this one will work versus the one on the ghost? I'll finally be able to eat something that doesn't taste like a fart, Benny exclaims. Gabe looks down at Benny, optic sensors whirring. I am sure the others will be very pleased. The Past 
His days pass quickly. Will spends all of it on the bridge, all of it, that is, that isn't taken up with grabbing something to eat in the kitchen or taking care of other needs in the small head, which he's found it located behind the bridge next to the airlock antechamber. By the time the Reaper enters orbit over Fury, Will has a basic grasp of how to pilot an Uncaran Raptor, which is what he's discovered the Reaper is, though landing on a planet might still be a bit out of his skill set still. Computer, are you able to assist me in landing the ship? Affirmative, comes the emotionless response. Will wonders if the computer realizes how close it is to crashing into a planet and exploding. Good. Please guide me through the process. Take over if I give the command. Is that understood? Affirmative. Incoming comms from Fury Space Control. Put them through, audio only. Will would prefer no one know he's the only one on the ship. This is Fury Space Control, barks a voice. Please state your business. Though nervous, Will manages to negotiate a landing pad at the low-rent spaceport. He could afford better. The ship's account is fairly healthy. But he doesn't know how long it'll be until he can make more money, or how much it'll take to doctor up some records. The landing goes smoothly, or at least as smoothly as Will could hope for, given that he's never landed a spaceship on an alien planet before. Despite the few bumps and hiccups along the way, and near collision with a bulk freighter, that had resulted in a lot of screaming, both from the freighter and the space control. The spaceport isn't all that impressive, even to Will, who's never been on an alien world before. It's overcrowded, smoggy, and congested, just like Los Angeles. Granted, the occupants are all alien races. Tall and short, blue, green, purple, and red. Tentacled, multi-limbed, slug-like, and even gelatinous. But otherwise, not really that different. God, am I really getting used to this? Will wonders. Computer, secure the ship, he says as he walks down the boarding ramp. No one allowed on or near until I return. If anyone tries, issue one warning, then fire. Acknowledged. The inner doors to the cargo area close behind him. Will wanders the spaceport for a few hours before catching on to how it's set up. There is the obvious surface layout, clothiers, food stalls, technology shops, all in little groupings. But then he starts to see the underlying organization. Thankfully, being a human among beings who either don't know what a human is or do and find it interesting helps them open up when he asks questions. Another hour of wandering about and he's knocking on a door to a storefront that looks like it hasn't been occupied in years. The door opens and a small face pokes out. What do you want? Your help, Will says. He's not sure this is a good idea. But from what he's been able to piece together, the being behind this door is his best bet for actually surviving the next few weeks. The door opens and Will enters, before it slams shut behind him. As his eyes adjust, he sees that his potential savior is a roughly four-foot-tall green alien with a big head. The being walks ahead of him through an anteroom which has a shimmering privacy field over the doorway. Beyond is a workshop that puts NASA to shame. There are monitors everywhere and computer consoles of various sizes and shapes. The small being turns. So, what do you want? It points to a stool on the opposite side of the workbench. Will sits down and begins to outline his problem. Easy, the alien says. You got money? This won't be cheap. Also, we'll have to do the last of the work on your ship. Will spends another three hours sitting in what the small being, ben Ari, he said his name is, called his customer lounge. There's not much to do in this lounge other than sit and watch some alien news channel, which seems to be the only thing, other than porn, that Benary streams in his little hacker's den. Finally, the alien says, I'm done here. He tosses a bracelet-like thing to Will, who catches it easily. That's a risk com. I'm sure you saw them on your old crew. When we get to your ship, I'll tie the RISCOM to your ship's computer system after I've changed its name and registration data. The walk back to the spaceport is certainly shorter than Will's original journey, 
Less than an hour after leaving Benarish's shop, they're in the Reaper's computer access area, located in the engineering space. Ben Ari is crawling around inside the computer core, while Will sits at a workbench exploring the features of his new wrist com. Hey, human, Ben Ari calls as he crawls back out of the access space, tablet in hand. What do you want to call the new ship? Will looks around the engineering space, thinking of Jax and Rolo, of Olgo and Langsham, the two other crew members he never got to know all of whom died in the Holgian space station. Ghosts who Will will never forget. Beings who could have killed him when they found him, or left him to die in his pod, but who instead showed him a kindness not common in the galaxy. Ghosts. She's the Ghost. That's her name. Ghost. Ben Ari nods. The Ghost. Good name. He taps on his tablet a few times. Done. Chapter 13. Repairs. As Will and his team approach the ghost, they see that Gabe and Benny have returned and are already hard at work. Gabe is standing on a forklift, reaching deep inside the port engine pod. Benny is also on the lift, a data terminal in hand providing the engineering bot with diagnostic information. Seeing the others approach, Benny sets the terminal down. How'd it go? Before Will can answer, Maxim does. It went well. I can't wait for someone to challenge us. Behind the three rumbles a large cargo bot with a trailer attached. Benny whistles. Maxim directs the bot under the ship to where the missile bay is located, behind the boarding ramp. Zephyr heads up the ramp and into the ship. Will walks away to the maintenance lift, looking up at Benny and Gabe's legs. How'd it go with you two? I assume you got the parts you need, since Gabe is waist deep in an engine pod. One of Gabe's smaller, secondary hands makes a thumbs up gesture. Benny nods vigorously. We sure did. Got everything on Gabe's list, and I got the shopkeep to throw in a new protein sequencer, free of charge. Will smiles, patting Benny's leg. Good work. The sequencer is older than the ship, I think. How long before we can take off? Benny looks at his terminal. We've already replaced the parts in the starboard engine, and Gabe is almost done here. Everything else can be done on the way. I'd say another talk at the most. Unless Maxim needs more than that to load up the weapons. A talk should be fine. Maxim, we leave in a talk. Make sure everything is loaded. There's a grunt and something mumbled from the back end of the ship, which Will assumes is a yes. He pats Benny on the leg again and heads up into the ship. Zephyr is waiting on the bridge when he walks in. Will, she says, I wanted to say thank you. I know this isn't your fight. I still don't know why you rescued Maxim and me from the Partherians. But you're risking your life and your ship. I can't thank you enough. I know even if we're successful, it won't change much for Maxim and I. We won't be able to go back to being peacekeepers. And honestly, I don't think I'd want to, knowing what I know now. She doesn't break eye contact with him, and she adds, This could change the fabric of the sector. Will falls into his chair with a sigh. No thanks needed. And not because I'd be doing this regardless, or that I'm just that noble. Honestly. If I hadn't met you and Max, this wouldn't be happening, and I'd probably be okay with that. But here we are, and it has to be done. Plus, with the exception of almost dying, it's been pretty fun so far. He looks at Zephyr thinking, I never told you. Back then when I rescued you and Maxim, I never said why I rescued you, did I? He looks down at his hands. I've owned the ghost for about three cycles now. Well. I guess owned isn't the right word exactly. I'm the only survivor of the previous crew. He raises a hand as he can see her forming a question. That's a story for another time. The thing that's important is this. About a cycle ago, the loneliness finally got to me. I had been alone on the ghost all this time, doing whatever jobs I could get to keep the engines running and the ship's account flush. Only so many jobs a single person... Even one as awesome as me can do, though. He sighs and looks up at the ceiling. 
I started looking for, I, I don't know, misfits. People like me, alone, broken, nowhere to go. I didn't know what I was looking for. I just knew somewhere deep down that I couldn't keep going alone, not anymore. Too many close calls, too many celebrations alone in the lounge. So when Zarix mentioned the two peacekeepers, abandoned by their own organization, and about to live out their days in the Partherian work camps, I figured I'd take a look. Will spreads his hands wide. And here we are. Zephyr is speechless. She's wondered about this ever since she first met Will all those weeks ago. She remembers him not answering that first day. She remembers him never bringing it up again. She's known it had to come up eventually, but figured it was his story to tell. But in all the versions of this conversation she'd run through in her head, none matched what he'd just told her. She sits there a moment more before saying anything. I see. Well, for what it's worth, and I know I speak for Maxim as well, we're happy here. We've only known you and Benny, for that matter, a short time, Gabe even shorter. And we're at least friends, she pauses. But it feels more than that. Peacekeepers aren't known for our social entanglements, but this is the closest I've felt to family in a long time. Will nods. Yeah, Benny certainly wasn't in the plan. Gabe certainly wasn't either. But I can't say I'm not glad they're here. They both sit quietly for a few minutes, each deep in thought over what the other said, each enjoying the silence and company. Then the moment is ruined by Benny entering the bridge. Come on, Krebnax, we're all set. So let's get the hell out of here. Like new. The ghost is four hours from Harith Prime. Everyone but Gabe is on the bridge. Benny is at his station. Originally an auxiliary station, but now a hacker's hideaway, covered in a cobweb of data cables and additional displays epoxied to the hull. Zephyr is at her own station, assuming the role of second-in-command, and Maxim is at the tactical station. The large ex-peacekeeper is beaming, which is disconcerting to say the least. Most of the stations on the bridge of the Ghost look similar to one another, or they had before Benny came aboard. Tactical is the exception, with its additional displays and manual weapons control surfaces. The works, as Maxim calls it. Now this is what I've been wanting, he exclaims, caressing his terminals. So many weapons. The engine-mounted disruptors are both at 100%. The forward section disruptor turret, also 100%. The targeting computer firmware is up to date. I could target Benny drifting out there from nearly a half million kilometers away and hit him with a single shot. Hey, comes the screech from Benny Station. Why would you want to do that? Will nods, smiling. It's nice to see Maxim happy about something, but also nice to know the ghost is in fighting shape. Something she slipped further and further away from since Will took over. Missiles? he asked. Maxim taps a few sections of his panel. Both missile magazines are full. I was able to score a few multi-model ones. Full yield, medium, or overload shields. Plus, he pauses and his grin turns a bit evil. I got six XPX 1900s. Zephyr lets out a low whistle. I don't remember getting those. Me either, Will chimes in. Also, what are they? Maxim looks at Zephyr, then back at Will. Ship busters. The fuck? Will exclaims, leaning out of his chair. How did you manage to score those without Zephyr or I seeing? Or bankrupting us? Or alerting the peacekeepers or even just the local police? The large Pelorian grins. After we made our purchases and you and Zephyr were on your way out, I asked the shopkeep for a favor. I thought I'd noticed him in the back of the shop in a corner, selling that type of ordinance is, if it's possible, extra legal. He'd had them a few years and never found anyone to take them, at least for a price he was willing to take the risk for. Okay, but since we hardly had any credits left, there's no way you could have paid that price, whatever it was, Will says. Right, but I dropped some hints that we'd likely be quite popular and or wealthy, if this mission goes well. Since he'd been sitting on them so long, 
and given that even being caught with them, selling them or not, would land him a life sentence on a peacekeeper labor moon, he just gave them to me. Benny, who's been listening intently, chimes in. Maybe I have some competition for this crew's chief negotiator. Will looks at the hacker. Who says that role is filled by you, Pipsqueak? Benny affects a stricken look and seems about to protest when he scrunches his face up. What's a Pipsqueak? In unison, Zephyr and Maxim both say, A human thing. Just then, Gabe's voice comes over the speakers. Captain, please come to engineering. Will hits a button on his chair. On my way, Zephyr, keep us moving in the right direction. And don't let Benny touch my console. The Ghost is not a large ship. The forward section is only made up of two decks. The bridge, the staging area come armory and airlocks, with the maintenance area below. The main corridor, or neck, as Will refers to it, is nearly as long as the primary section of the ship. One deck plus maintenance space above and below. It gets a bit taller as you move into the main body of the ship, where the crew space and lounge is, with engineering directly beyond. Will walks through it all, remembering the first time he was in the lounge. The hatch to engineering is closed when he approaches. He touches the control pad beside it, and a light turns green and the door opens. Gabe, what's up? Oh my god. The entire engineering space is spotless. The main engine is thrumming peacefully, the random hiccup that had plagued the drive apparently gone. The stains on the bulkhead that Will was always afraid to ask about are also gone. The maintenance area and workbench? Spotless. The heat that normally permeated the space? Also gone. Hello, Captain. I wanted to give you a status update on the engineering space. As you can see, I've fixed the imbalance in the main FTL drive. I've also cleaned and replaced all the burnt-out thermocouples, which has addressed the increased heat in the compartment. Several other subsystems have been repaired or, in extreme cases, replaced. Will is spinning around, taking it all in. You're a miracle worker. I wonder if there's another smaller you in that shoulder thingy. Gabe looks at the mysterious attachment. I highly doubt there is a smaller copy of myself in this device. Will shakes his head. <laughs> Whatever it is, good work, Gabe. It's awesome that you're with us. Before he can say anything more, Zephyr interrupts over the ship's intercom. Will, you better get up here. There's something you need to see. Will turns and leaves without another word. As the hatch to engineering closes, Gabe bows his head slightly. Thank you, Captain. The Past After Benary finishes his work on the ship, Will spends another week on Fury. The small hacker has assured him that the identity change would propagate the old log files of the Fury space control so that the Reaper isn't logged as landing while the Ghost is logged as leaving. Will spends much of his time on the ship, running through its training mode, which he discovers isn't limited to the flight controls. While engineering isn't his strong suit, he has been able to get the ship to at least train him on how to identify the more serious problems even if he doesn't possess the skill to fix them. He uses a little more of his dwindling cash to hire an engineer to come aboard and give the engine space a once-over, addressing any major issues. Luckily, the previous engineering team had done a pretty good job of keeping the engine ship shape. Once he's sure the ship is in as good a condition as possible, he ventures back into the shopping district and beyond. Benary has given him a rudimentary map marked with places to avoid and places where he might find work sorted by the kind of work he might be okay with, from mercenary work to smuggling to basic freight hauling. Will isn't sure which he is comfortable with, but is pretty sure that the former is out. If nothing else, he's not sure how good he'd be at that type of work without a crew. Hiring a crew is also out. Will doesn't know the first thing about leading others, nor does he know who he could trust or what races work best with others. Plus, based on what's left in the ship's account, he's pretty sure the crew he could afford would kill him and sell the ghost at the first opportunity. He wanders into a bar that ben flagged as having potential for work of the non-mercenary type. Sitting at the bar, he orders a drink, Grum, which has become his new favorite beverage, if for no other reason than its ubiquitousness. 
and has reliable side effects. He knows he can get a buzz and even shit-faced, but it works so like beer that he can manage it. Almost everything else on the menu is liquors from around the sector that he has no idea about. One sip could lay him out, which wouldn't be good. Unfortunately, ben map and notes aren't tremendously helpful, or at the very least informative. The notation on this bar is simply the word Zarix. Whatever whomever that is, Will thinks. He flags down the barkeep and leans forward. Does Zarix mean anything to you? I'm looking for it, or him, or her, or whatever. The barkeep looks at him blankly, then glances over Will's shoulder to the back of the bar, where several booths sit. All have a privacy screen activated, protecting their occupants from being seen or overheard. The barkeep points to the middle booth. Will nods and takes a big gulp of grum, stilling his nerves, then gets up and makes his way to the back booths. As he approaches, two giant aliens move in from the tables nearby. Will has no idea what race they are. He's never seen either before. But that's not saying much, really. What do you want? One asks. Will looks up. This particular alien is nearly eight feet tall and is apparently made entirely of muscle. I'm looking for Zarix. The two just stare at him. I was uh, told that, well, maybe he'd had work for me. Will is starting to rethink this whole idea when the silent one lifts its wrist calm and whispers into it. There's a reply and the alien whispers somehow before he looks at his colleague and nods. They part and the talkative one points to the booth. Stepping through the privacy field and into the booth, Will sees that Zarex is indeed a who, though of a race Will can't identify either. Something vaguely reptilian? So you need work, huh? The alien says without preamble. Tell me about your ship. Will does his best to describe the ghost, without revealing it's a warship. He's hoping this doesn't come up. Instead, he emphasizes his desire to haul cargo and maybe, if needed, to smuggle it. Ten minutes later, he leaves the booth with his first paying gig as the owner of a spaceship. Not bad for a human, he thinks to himself, walking out into the street beyond. Chapter 14 Hitting the fan. Coming to you from the Peacekeeper Carrier Pax Magellanic, I'm Monel Farage with GNO. The Peacekeepers have welcomed us, and you, aboard one of their most impressive carriers on the front lines of this conflict on the frontier. Just the other day, the Harith Rebels bombed a trade depot which, at the time of the attack, had two Quillant Trade Federation freighters docked within it. Both were destroyed and their crews killed. The Harith Navy was able to track down one of the rebel vessels and destroy it. But the other two were able to escape. Understandably, the Quillant are demanding restitution and revenge, and their fleet is reported to be en route to the Harith system. Stay tuned for updates as events unfold. Back to you, Zarsix and Megan. Would you look at that? That's a lot of firepower. Benny says as the primary display resolves into four Peacekeeper carriers holding position in space, surrounded by a dozen or so smaller Peacekeeper vessels. Twenty or thirty Zangar ships, considerably smaller than the Peacekeeper vessels, flit around the four large warships. Opposite them, still within the boundaries of the Harith system, is a small fleet of Harith Defense Force ships. Only one is the size of a Peacekeeper ship, with the rest much smaller. Should we go around? Maxim asks. Zephyr looks up from her station. Even at FTL, it'd take too long. With the Quillant on their way, the Harith will have no choice but to acquiesce and allow the peacekeepers into the system to help squash the rebellion. If they don't, they face being forcibly invaded and drawn into a war they can't hope to win. If they give in, the GC has a strong foothold and a reason to push for them to join. And if they resist, the GC will have a strong foothold and the firepower to force them to join. Sucks to be the rebels right now. No matter what happens, they're likely about to be wiped out by the very people who've been supplying them. Benny looks up from his station. Moot point. No sooner has the last word left his mouth than a few dozen warships drop out of FDL, 
directly between the Peacekeeper forces and the Allies to the Earth Navy, and immediately opened fire in every direction at every ship. Peacekeeper and Harith Navy alike. Ships start exploding on both sides, taken completely by surprise. The rebels, damn it! Will exclaims, grabbing the controls, bringing the ghost around in a wide arc, off its original course. Computer, combat alert! A torpedo whizzes by the ship, exploding just aft, rocking the ship heavily. Chaos erupts on both sides as ships accelerate toward the battle, weapons blazing. Two of the Peacekeeper carriers begin launching fighters, while the smaller Zangar ships spread out, forming wolf packs and chasing the rebel ships. Will knows that the Zangar do not have a massive navy, since the GC technically protects them with Peacekeepers, but all GC members are allowed to keep a small home fleet. The Zangar, apparently wanting blood after the trade station explosion, seem to have sent their entire home fleet here. You got it. Combat alert the chipper computer replies. All tactical systems online. Shields at full power. Zephyr is furiously working her console, tagging as many ships as she can. Looks like the rebels don't realize who's been supplying them, or just don't care. They're attacking everyone. Peacekeeper, Zangar, and Harith. Will is swinging the ship below a flaming peacekeeper ship, a corvette from the looks of the remains. Karma is a bitch he yells. The ship takes a hit and sparks erupt from overhead. Max, weapons free, focus on the rebels. But peacekeepers and Harith are free game too. Until we can get clear and find someone to give our information to. Someone shoots at us, shoot right back at them. Outside the ghost, a flaming peacekeeper carrier explodes as it takes two dozen missiles to its port side. Six Harith rebel ships break formation around the burning carrier, Another wave of ships follows close behind, unleashing more missiles into the flaming side of the massive ship. Escape pods are ejecting from all over the carrier, even while its guns are still firing, some of the crew clearly deciding to go down with the ship, or being told to. Three of the rebel ships explode at that moment. Another takes a hit and careens past the dying carrier, right into a Harith Navy cruiser. Fighters are flitting around, taking whatever shots they can, letting their missiles fly in all directions. The ghost tilts on its wings and flies between two of the larger Harith Navy ships, shields flaring, disruptors blasting out at the smaller craft in its path. A rebel frigate is directly ahead, and before he can think to give the order, Will hears the telltale rattle that precedes missiles launching from the lower section of the ship. Suddenly, four missiles break out from under the ghost, flying straight for the rebel ship. It tries to outmaneuver the fast-moving projectiles, but fails, taking all four on its side. Seconds later, the entire ship cracks in half, as secondary explosions riddle the vessel. The ghost flies right through the gap in the two flaming halves. Will lets out a whoop. Great shooting! Zephyr calls out targets as Maxim continues to work the tactical console. This is fun, the big Pelorian is shouting, destroying smaller rebel craft with well-placed disruptor bolts. The turret mounted on the upper section of the bridge module is letting loose blasts in all directions. From the screen in the corner, the GNO feed is still narrating events to the whole galaxy. If you're just joining us, things here outside the Hearth system have taken a turn for the, well, worse is putting it mildly. Tempers are already reaching boiling point when a small vessel appears out of FTL, attempting to enter the Harith system. It's unclear if these two events are connected, but shortly after this vessel appeared, so did the Harith rebels. The rebels were only on the scene, a fraction of a talk, before opening fire on the peacekeepers. The Harith navy and the Zangar, the entire area has erupted into chaos, with ships firing at each other, seemingly at random. The newscaster pauses, listening to her co-anchors back in the studio. Yes, Sarsix, it's been terrifying, but so far the Pax Magellanic has remained safely out of the fight. I'll keep you posted as things develop. For now, back to you and Megan. Gabe Having decided that standing on the bridge offers very little value, Gabe has spent much of his time in the engineering, figuring that this will be a better use of not just his time, but capabilities. 
The days spent in FTL en route to the Hareth system have afforded Gabe time to get to know the crew, as well as the systems of the ghost. He has to admit, the stories about the Encar and shipwrights are true. The ghost is an impressive vessel for its size. He had been busying himself cleaning a spare thermocouple when the ship lurches to one side, the computer announcing, Combat alert. Secure all sections. All personnel report to battle stations. Silently, Gabe sends a wireless connection request to the main computer. Computer. Report, please. Over the wireless connection, the ship replies, the captain has activated the ship's combat systems. Several ships have begun firing, causing all ships in the vicinity to return fire. We are in crossfire. Calmly, Gabe puts the thermocouple and his cleaning supplies away, activating the magnetic components of his feet to keep standing as the ship shakes and rattles from the impacts, lurching in and attempting to avoid enemy fire. A flashing alert draws his attention. One of the starboard plasma conduits has begun leaking interfering with other systems nearby. Gabe picks up a portable toolkit, his smaller manipulators holding it against his torso, and enters the starboard service corridor. Similar corridors run from each side of the engineering space the entire length of the ship's wing, ending in a crawl space in the actual engine pod. The starboard corridor is already toxic to most oxygen-breathing species by the time Gabe enters it. Plasma from the ruptured conduit is flowing into the area, turning into a toxic gas as it interacts with the ship's breathable atmosphere. Gabe hurries up the corridor to where the breach is indicated, the ship still shaking all around him. Withdrawing a patch kit from his toolkit, he moves aside wiring and other equipment from around the rupture. Many wires have already corroded into the gas. As he places the patch over the breach, it magnetically seals itself against the conduit. With the touch of a button on the control pad built into the patch itself, the outer edges of the patch begin to melt, fusing to the conduit. When the indicator on the patch control panel turns green, Gabe returns his attention to the other components nearby, stripping away the corroded insulation and, in some cases, cutting wires and patching new pieces in. Gabe is returning to engineering when another alert lights on up on the master ship's system display. He immediately hurries out through the main crew space. The airlock leading into the cargo area has snapped closed. There's an enormous breach in the hull. Air is whistling out of it. Cycling through the airlock, Gabe grabs a large piece of metal from its resting place against the bulkhead and lurches toward the breach. The ship's maneuvers aren't helping, despite being able to magnetize his feet. The graph plating is having a hard time compensating, and the patch in his hand shifts awkwardly. But he soon has the patch secured, the ship's computer confirming no more leaks. Gabe has made it back to the main crew space when the ship rattles worse than it ever has before, and the sound of wrenching metal fills his sensors. He runs to the engineering area and glances at the master display, rushing into the port service corridor. Captain, he says into his comms unit, our port engine pod has taken several hits. FTL will be impossible if it takes any more abuse. Something catches his attention. Perhaps his report to the captain was optimistic. FTL may already be a non-option. Worse before it gets better. Each time the ghost attempts to make a break deeper into the Hareth system, a rebel, peacekeeper, or Hareth Navy ship interrupts them. Captain. Our port engine pod has taken several hits, Gabe reports from the engineering space. FTL will be impossible if it takes any more abuse. Doing what I can, Gabe. You do the same. Swinging the ghost in a tight arc, Will barely avoids a Zangar cruiser that's flying out of control, flames and debris falling from it as it goes. Hold on! He spins the ship on its axis to avoid what looks like a piece of an FTL engine. The battle has been raging for close to an hour. One peacekeeper carrier is nothing but a wreck. Another is limping to the outer edge of the engagement. The Zangar, out for blood, aren't letting the rebels have even a second's rest. The Quillant, who have also arrived, have mainly been engaging the Harith, only occasionally firing on the rebels if one gets close. Meanwhile, the Ghost, as an actual third party, is doing its best not to get destroyed by all sides, who seem to think the ghost is whomever they're angry at. We've got to get clear. We're taking too many hits, Zephyr shouts from her station. 
The port disruptor is on the verge of overheating, and we're running out of missiles. Maxim looks over from his station. We still have the XPX 1900s. Will nods. We might end up needing them if things keep up like this. The ship shakes and rocks, and the primary display wavers and crackles with static before returning to normal. A panel to Will's left explodes, showering him in sparks. Two rebel light attack craft are swooping around on an attack run. Maxim takes one out using the starboard disruptor, but the other rains weapons fire across the back of the ship and the neck connecting the forward section. Captain, there's a hull breach in the cargo area. Gabe's voice filters through the alarms blaring on the bridge. Will stills a glance at the master system display off to the side of his console. The cargo hold is flashing red, while the crew lounge is slowly pulsing orange, on the verge of losing pressure too. The hatch between the two spaces must have been compromised. Do what you can do, Gabe. Max, get those XPs ready. The big Pelorian grins evilly. XPXs. And acknowledged. Benny, who's been quiet for some time now, pipes up. Will, I have an idea. Will glances over. I'm all ears. The ship corkscrews around a Harith Navy cruiser, which is slugging it out with a Quillant carrier. I've been scanning all the comms chatter since this whole mess started, and I think I've isolated the primary frequencies each faction is using. If we can boost the power of our transmitter, I might be able to broadcast our data to all of them at the same time. Gabe, did you hear that? I did, Captain. I will do what I can down here to provide the power that Benny requires. I need only a few more syntax to address the hull breach. Will looks at Benny. Get to work. This will likely piss off Zarix and Lorath, you know, Zephyr points out. Whatever it is they have planned for this info is about to be undone. Can't be helped. If we survive this, we can work on making it up to them or avoiding them. The ghost spins around another Qualant ship, firing the last two regular missiles at a rebel ship that has just fired on a Peacekeeper cruiser. Max, that largest rebel ship put two XPXs in it. With the other two, target the Peacekeeper carrier there. He points at the fourth Peacekeeper carrier on the main display, which has somehow avoided any substantial damage. That one. They clearly know something. They're staying just out of the main engagement zone. Maxim nods, working his console. Deep inside the weapons magazine in the body of the ship, four of the six XPX-1900 missiles are moving into the forward launchers, two in each chamber, two in the ready loader of each chamber. There are still dozens of ships in the fight, slugging it out, firing whatever they have left at each other. The Zangar, by far the smallest force in this melee, are down to only a few ships mostly hovering near the lone Peacekeeper carrier that's entirely undamaged. Another Peacekeeper carrier is limping away, while yet another burns, and a final one is nothing more than several large chunks of debris. Two of the shipbuster missiles streak away from the ghost toward the now-doomed rebel ship. Moments later, two massive explosions rip the vessel apart. The remaining rebels, having probably caused as much confusion as they feel they can, have slowly withdrawn fighting to extricate themselves in order to make a getaway. The ghost is trailing smoke and drive plasma from its port FDL engine pod, and its port disruptor is offline. Benny hoots. Got it! I'm ready! Gabe, you ready? Yes, Captain. Will looks over to Benny, just long enough to nod. Do it! Once again, I'm Monel Farage with GNO, aboard the peacekeeper carrier Pax Magellanic, where following the arrival of the Quillant, who have immediately engaged the Harith Navy and the rebels alike, a small Uncaran raptor called the Ghost has really changed the tenor of this battle. The anchor pauses. Hectic is putting it mildly, Megan. It's likely that thousands have already died, and more are dying as we speak. It's madness and I don't know if the GC is on board with this or what the results will be here, but I'll keep reporting to the end. Transmitting now, Benny announces, hitting a button on his console. His words are largely drowned out by the sound of something exploding against the ship. The truth comes out. Zephyr is staring intently at her console. That peacekeeper carrier is targeting us, she shouts. They're accelerating. 
Will nods. Figured. They must be the ship that has our evildoers aboard. He spins the ghost about and pushes the power controls to the max. The acceleration compensators struggle to do their job as the ghost flies through the remains of the battle, dodging debris and weapons fire. The peacekeeper carrier has turned and is burning after the much smaller ship. The Zangar and Quillant, having received the transmission, have moved off. The Harith are moving to intercept the ghost, while the rebels are scattering in whatever direction contains the least ships. Peacekeeper carrier is closing the gap, Zephyr reports. We're almost in the engagement envelope, Will looks to Max. Aft weapon status? Max looks up from his console, his face not exuberant as it had been earlier. Aft missile bay is offline, and our aft disruptor ray is non-functional. Shields are at 64%. I'm afraid our backside isn't well protected. They're closing, Will, Zephyr announces, looking from her console to Will. Will glances around at his crew. Anything from, well, anyone? A response to our transmission? The Harith are on an intercept course, but still a few fractions of a talk out. The peacekeepers will get to us first, Zephyr reports. No one has replied to our transmission, though the peacekeepers are trying to jam all comms now. The ship rocks and Will grabs the controls, banking the ship hard to port. More sparks and smoke erupt from a panel near Benny's station, eliciting a screech from the small Braylek. Oh shit, Will yelps, slamming his controls to the side, spinning the stars on the display and barely avoiding one of the Harith Navy cruisers. Sorry, didn't see them there. He smooths out their flight as the Harith ship opens fire on the Peacekeeper carrier. Oh, it's on, Benny shouts. They're engaging the Peacekeeper carrier. Zephyr is studying her console. They don't stand a chance. That ship avoided the fighting. It's fresh. It'll destroy them. Benny leaves the station to stand next to Will. Better them than us. In response, Will punches him in the arm, which sends the smaller alien flying across the bridge. Ouch, that hurt. Will looks at Maxim. Let's even the odds. When Maxim raises an eyebrow questioningly, he only nods. You didn't fire the last of those ship busters, right? The big X peacekeeper doesn't break eye contact with Will, but reaches down and taps a key on his console. Quietly, he says, 1XPX 1900 away. The sound of a single missile firing reverberates through the hole. On the screen, it streaks outward, before banking sharply and turning past the ship. Will adjusts the primary display, switching to an aft-facing camera. The big peacekeeper ship is engaging with a half-dozen Harith ships. Two are drifting, one still firing as it also drifts away from the engagement. No one seems to notice the XPX-1900 until it's too late. The missile strikes the big ship amidships cracking it in half, and causing hundreds of secondary explosions to ripple through its surface. The Harith naval vessels break wide, avoiding the explosions. As they watch, lifeboats begin streaking out of the dying peacekeeper ship in all directions. Everyone on the bridge lets out a shout of triumph, quickly interrupted by Gabe. Captain, the port wing stabilizer has taken extensive damage. Controls will be sluggish. I suggest you keep our speed at no more than three-quarters max. We are going to need a space dock to effect repairs. Keep an eye on it, Gabe. We'll adjust their speed, sliding the main sublight thruster controls down a few notches, dropping their speed. He alters their course for the main Harith home world. Grimly, he asks, Gabe, will we make it to Harith Prime? If we can avoid further damage to our control systems, perhaps. The bot replies, It is possible I can go out on the hull and effect a temporary repair to the port stabilizer assembly. It will not be a permanent fix, I'm afraid. Incoming comms from the Harith Navy, the lead ship, Zephyr announces, on screen. The primary display, still wobbling and static-laden at times, switches from the stars to a smoky command center filled with a harried and bloodied Harith. Thank you, she says. I don't know who you are, or what you are even, 
but the people of Harith owe you a debt of gratitude. I am Commander Sheraton of the Harith Navy. She bows deeply. You're welcome. I'm Will Calder, and this is my crew. Before Will can finish, the ghost shakes and lurches to the side, Zephyr shouting a warning. On the screen, filling with static, the Harith ship is lurching as well. Three new Peacekeeper carriers have dropped out of FTL, nearly on top of the remaining Harith Navy and the Ghost, unleashing every weapon they have on their prey. Smoke is filling the bridge. Maxim, Zareth, and Benny are all shouting. On the screen, Commander Shritan is shouting orders at her bridge crew. She turns back to the camera and will. Get to Harith Prime, she shouts. Then the screen fills with static and returns to the bank of the Starfield. Zyrsix and Megan, things have gone from really bad to terrible here outside the Harith system. The Pax Magellanic is no more, having taken a direct hit of some type, which snapped the mighty ship in half. Moments after the ship exploded, the Ankaran Raptor, the Ghost, transmitted a data packet which, well, if true, is immensely damning to the Peacekeepers and the GC. Smoke is everywhere in the background as the newscaster raises her voice. I'm currently aboard an escape pod with my camera bot and a few of Pax Magellanic's crew. We barely escaped alive, as shortly after the ghost transmitted its data, the ship exploded. The pod shakes and Monell lets out a brief scream. One of the peacekeepers says something the camera doesn't pick up. Oh good, the newscaster says, turning back to the camera. I've been informed that a Quillant cruiser has recovered our pod. I say again, the data transmitted by the ghost is incredibly damning to the peacekeepers and likely to many others within the GC. I'm Monel Farash with GNO, live from an escape pod. Back to you in the studio. Part 5 Chapter 15 Run Get to Harith Prime, is the last thing Will hears before a loud screeching comes from Benny's station. That entire section of the bridge is smoking. Sparks and flame are everywhere. Benny! Will is already out of his seat and grabbing the unconscious hacker, dragging him clear of the destroyed station. The ship lurches again and the sound of metal tearing fills the bridge. Zephyr rushes over and pushes Will away. Fly! She yells at him over the noise. Will lurches up and staggers back to his station. Gabe, report. He's fighting the controls now, trying to avoid fire from the new warships. The overhead speakers crackle and hiss before Gabe's voice comes through. Significant damage to the central corridor. I am afraid it looks like the bridge is cut off from the rest of the vessel. In addition, the port engine pod has suffered extensive damage. It is only about 10% functional. FTL is impossible. The weapons array is damaged, as is the repulsor system for landing and atmospheric flight. Also, that stabilizer is no longer an issue. Will perks up. It's fixed? It is gone. Drin! Will is fighting to keep the ship moving in the general direction of Harith Prime, but the damage has made maneuvering difficult. Even at top speed, outrunning a peacekeeper carrier is unlikely. At only three quarters of their capacity, it's impossible. Normally, it would still be a fair fight as the much smaller warship is far more agile and can easily outmaneuver the larger ship. But that advantage is almost entirely gone now. Is there anything you can do, Gabe? Over the speakers, the few that remain active, the bot replies. I am afraid not, Captain. I will continue to look for options. Will looks over to Zephyr and the prone Benny. How's he doing? She looks up. He's not dead, so there's that. He'll need a doctor or an autodoc soon. Looks like his arm and leg are broken, and there's a gash on his head. His breathing is strong, so that's good. Will turns back to his controls. The peacekeepers are currently being distracted by the remaining Harith Navy, but the remains of that force are not much of a match for them. Maxim, check the main corridor. See if you can get through or seal off the damage. Maybe we can get Benny to the med bay. Not much more you can do at tactical now, anyway. The big man gets up. On it. Will can hear him calling Gabe on his wrist comm as he hurries out the bridge. Incoming hail, the computer announces. From whom? Commander Janice. Senior Peacekeeper Commander. 
Belarus sector. His description. Will and Zephyr exchanged looks. Put him on. The screen still riddled with static, changes from a view of the stars to what Will can only describe as an eel in a peacekeeper uniform. Janice, good to see you again, Will says. He taps a few controls on his console. On the screen, the peacekeeper sneers, taking in the wreck that is the bridge of the ghost. You've looked better, Will Calder. Why not shut your engines down and surrender? Maybe you don't even have to die. I'm sure we can find a rock to hide you under, after you admit publicly the doctoring, that transmission, of course. Zephyr steps into the camera's range. Never, Janice. You and every corrupt peacekeeper were burned for this. Janice's smile gets wider. Well, well, I'd wondered what happened to you and Maxim. I'd heard that the Partherians lost you, but would never have guessed you'd end up with this human. Taking on a crew finally, Will. Better for me. All my loose ends in one convenient wrapper. As I said, surrender now. You're going to die anyway. But it doesn't have to be painful or drawn out. I understand asphyxiating from a hole breach is rather unpleasant. Megan, Xersix, things are getting very exciting and dangerous around here. We're aboard the Quillant cruiser now, but I don't know if we're any safer. Four more peacekeeper carriers have arrived, and we've just received what can only be described as a final nail in the peacekeeper's coffin. The commander of these four new vessels seemed to know the captain of the ghost who we now know as being named Will Calder. The conversation between the two was quite telling, and whether intentional or not, was broadcast entirely over an open channel. She looks off screen and blanches a bit, but nods. I've just been informed that the commander of the Quillant forces has been in conference with the Harith and their rebels, as well as the Zangar. I'm not told what's next, but I suspect that, whatever it is, it'll be big. Will opens his mouth to tell Janice exactly what he can do with his ultimatum when Zephyr points to the tactical display near Maxim Station. Look! Before Will can do anything, he sees the bridge around Janice erupt into chaos and shake slightly. Will hits a control on his console, ending the call with Janice and switching to a tactical view. On screen, he sees nearly three dozen ships converging on the Peacekeeper Task Force, the Quillant, the Harith Rebels, and the Zangar must have had a little powwow while the peacekeepers were chasing the ghost. Enemy of my enemy. The newly formed anti-peacekeeper fleet is buzzing around the four carriers, doing a fair bit of damage, but overall losing more than they're winning. Will, those ships aren't going to last long. Those carriers aren't pulling their punches, Zephyr reports back at her station. Maxim re-enters the bridge. What's going on? Oh, you know, the usual, lots of ships, all fighting each other. Janice is a dick, and he knows you and Zephyr are here. The usual, where's Benny? Will turns his chair to face Maxim, seeing only now that he's in his peacekeeper power armor. Gabe and I were able to repair the damage to the main corridor, enough to repressurize it temporarily and get Benny to the med bay. The auto dock is working on him. What's our status? We're being chased by four peacekeeper carriers who are being attacked by an alliance of all the parties who were, until recently, trying to kill each other. Janice is aboard the lead ship. Maxim growls and stomps over to the tactical station. Will turns in his chair, watching him. Most of our weapons systems are offline, Maxim says. But we still have three XPX 1900s. The ship shakes as a hit strikes the aft shields, or what is left of them. The forward missile magazine is damaged, Maxim reports. Our last XPX-1900 is in the port launcher, though. Will, those carriers aren't slowing, Zephyr interrupts. The fleet is doing their best, but they're already down to half their starting strength. Will brings the ship around hard, metal groaning from the strain as the inertial compensators struggle. Maxim, fire on the nearest carrier. Without a word... Maxim hits the command on his console. Throughout the ship, the sound of the launcher expelling its lethal load reverberates. On the fizzing, damaged main screen, a lone missile streaks out of the ghost, aiming straight at one of the oncoming carriers.
One missile among hundreds being fired by all sides isn't easy to spot, and is even harder to shoot down. The XPX-1900 hits the Peacekeeper carrier head-on, burrowing right through the hole before it explodes, triggering hundreds of secondary explosions all down the length of the massive spaceship. The remaining three carriers try to move away from the stricken vessel, still fighting off the remnants of the quickly formed fleet. With a last look, Will brings the ghost back around on its course to Harith Prime, just as Gabe walks into the bridge. There is not much I can do in engineering at this point. I am sorry, Captain. The big engineering bot looks at Benny's station. Where is Benny? Without looking, Maxim answers. Still in medbay. Without another word, Gabe turns and exits the bridge. Incoming, Maxim shouts. The main display switches to a view aft, showing a wave of incoming missiles. We can't absorb that many hits, the big man warns. We don't have the maneuverability to dodge them, Will reports, slamming his hands against his console. Look, Zephyr shouts, drawing their attention back to the static-filled display. Several ships are speeding towards the ghost, or rather, the space directly behind the ghost. They intercept the wave of missiles, each ship being engulfed in flames. For a moment, the crew of the ghost just watch, dumbstruck. All oh, those people. Zephyr says faintly. They're buying us time. Will grabs his console and flight controls. Maxim, get another XPX ready. The ship banks hard again, groaning with the effort. Hang in there, Will whispers. We need to shake these carriers enough to get a lead. Maxim, when I say the word, fire the missile between the two nearest ships, then detonate. Maxim nods. The ghost has swung a full 180 degrees and is flying toward the Peacekeeper force, which their now allies are still attempting to destroy. The one remaining disruptor on the starboard engine pod lances out at the oncoming ships. Fire! The ghost banks just as the deadly missile launches, shaking with each hit the diminishing shields take. Consoles all over the ship are bursting into flames, showering everyone in sparks. Hang on, Will shouts as the ship shakes violently, still taking hits from all sides. The already damaged port engine pod shears off, taking a large portion of the wing with it. The sound of tearing metal fills the ship. Then the main screen goes dark, followed almost immediately by the rest of the bridge. Allies to the Rescue the last XPX-1900 missile they had has been fired, damaging the two nearest peacekeepers but not destroying them. A second later, the lights come back on. The primary display comes back online, still mostly static. The ghost is limping along, diving deeper into the Harith system, still heading for Harith Prime. Will, they'll be back in weapons range in a few more fractions of a talk, Zephyr reports. All tactical systems are offline. Maxim adds from his station, Will sighs. And we're down to about 50% thrust on the sublight engines. I've got the throttle at the stops, but we're just not moving. I'm sorry, guys. The hatch to the bridge opens and Gabe re-enters. Benny is stable, he reports. Will turns to look at the bot. Not sure if that's better or worse for him. He turns back to face the main display. Guessing there's nothing else you can do in engineering. The big engineering bot shakes his head. I am afraid not, Captain. The damage is quite extensive. I've patched the main reactor as much as I can without risking it going critical. However, it is likely it will still do exactly that, and soon. It's fine, Gabe. We wouldn't have made it this far without you. Thanks. Will says wearily. You might as well go keep an eye on Benny. Since the rest of us can't easily get back there right now, I'm guessing. That is correct. The temporary repairs Maxim and I affected earlier have failed, and once again the connecting walkway is exposed to vacuum. Zephyr looks down at her station, then back at Will and adjusts the main viewer. Will, look at the remnants of the anti-peacekeeper fleet. They're breaking away from the carriers. Can't blame them. This looks like a lost cause. There are only ten ships left out of the nearly forty that had first rallied to attack the peacekeepers, 
All of them seem to have sustained at least some damage. A few will likely be destined for the scrapyard, assuming they survive even that long. The three remaining Peacekeeper carriers are still giving chase. Two of them are damaged, but not enough to give up their pursuit. The third, having taken a rear guard position, is entirely untouched. The ghost, on the other hand, is not in great shape. One engine is completely gone. Apart from the sublight drive functioning at only half power, there are also several breaches in the hull, some patched, some not. No, Zephyr says, pointing at the screen. They're coming this way. No sooner had she spoken than the ships in the display pass over and under the aft camera, and several loud clunks can be heard from the top and bottom of the ship. The whole ship shakes slightly. This is not the jarring impacts of weapons fire, but something else. They're locking onto us with grapplers. Will looks at his console and sees their speed increasing, climbing back up to full sublight. He frowns. I can't believe it. They're towing us to Harith Prime. What are they doing? Maxim looks at his tactical display. Following. The third ship, the least damaged, is moving into the lead and accelerating rapidly. We're not in the clear yet. We're still at least a talk from Harith Prime, and that ship will overtake us in half that time. We're being hailed, Zephyr announces. Please tell me it's not the peacekeepers, Will says, looking over at her. There's nothing to focus on now that even the flight of the ghost is out of their hands. It's a Harith ship. It's Commander Shri Tan. Zephyr is smiling, probably just as glad as Will to know that the one friendly face they've encountered so far is still alive. On screen. A second later, through the static of the primary display, Will sees the commander. She looks exactly like Will feels. Her bridge is smoky and chaotic, and there's what looks like a med team tending to a fallen crew member in the background. Commander Shri Tan, he says. It's good to see you still with us. You too, Captain Calder. Your ship is a testament to Ankaran shipbuilding and your expert piloting. The peacekeepers are not giving up, I presume because you have the original source of that data packet on your ship. That and two eyewitness peacekeepers who can testify to seeing documents related to this whole thing. Do you have a plan? Is your government getting involved? Will leans forward in his chair. We saw that there's a GNO reporter out here somewhere. She's seen the data, I assume. The Earth government is getting involved, yes. I've been informed that our diplomats in Tarsus are causing quite a stir at the GC assembly building. Also, I've been instructed to ensure the safe arrival of your ship on Harith Prime. She stops, looking over her shoulder. The audio must be muted on her end because she starts talking, but Will can't hear anything. She turns back to the screen. The peacekeepers seem intent on doing what they can to eliminate all evidence of this little drenstorm they've caused. To answer your question, yes, the GNO reporter is aboard one of the Quillant cruisers. We hope that her continued updates will force the peacekeepers to withdraw. Will smiles. Hope you're not holding your breath, ma'am. The commander seems confused. Why would I do that? Never mind. It's just an expression on my planet, so what's the plan? We're out of the fight. Our weapons are all offline. Our main reactor is only outputting at 50%. We're dead weight. Is your space frame intact enough for a short trip at FTL? The commander asks. Will looks over to Gabe, who nods. Yes, commander. The ghost should survive a short trip at FTL. She nods. Then hold on to something. The screen goes dark, and the ship lurches hard enough for the inertial compensators to flutter. Typically tied into the ship's systems and coordinated by the main computer, they haven't received the advanced warning they need to ramp up their efforts along with the ship's acceleration. Luckily for the crew of the Ghost, compensators work in fractions of fractions of ticks, and so, while unpleasant, the jump to FTL doesn't result in anyone on board becoming salsa on the back wall of the bridge. Well, Zirsix and Megan, I have to say that what started as a story of the GC and Peacekeepers stepping in to protect GC members from unaffiliated systems and rebels within those systems has now turned into a story of corruption and greed among the upper ranks of the GC and Peacekeeper. 
Not only have we thoroughly reviewed the data packet released by Captain Will Calder, but I've now heard through the grapevine of this hodgepodge fleet that aboard the Ghost are two ex-peacekeeper officers who can testify to seeing several documents outlining this scheme to forcefully take over unaffiliated systems and join the GC under duress. Reports are that the original source of the incriminating recording is also located on board this ship. Monel Farage pauses to collect herself. I'm still aboard the Quillant cruiser that rescued the life pod I was in. The Quillant have formed a loose alliance with the Harith Navy, the Zangar, and surprisingly, the Harith rebels who previously bombed two Quillant freighters. I'm told that high-level discussions among the ship's commanders have cleared up a lot of the misunderstandings between the two Harith factions. I've also spoken to the captain of the ship, and he informs me that the rest of this small fleet has agreed to protect the Ghost. Getting it to Harith Prime, where presumably the ex-peacekeepers from the Ghost, as well as what we are presuming is the bot that originally recorded the secret conversation, can be debriefed and interviewed. The newscaster stops and nods as if listening to something, then continues. Yes, at this time, at least out here, there's been no official word from the GC or this peacekeeper task force. A Commander Janus, who's indicated he is in charge of the four new vessels that appeared, has only accepted one hail since his conversation with Captain Calder was rebroadcast. Another pause, and then... Yes, things are quieter right now. A few moments ago, the ghost likely in a last-ditch effort to buy itself time, launched a very powerful missile at the pursuing peacekeeper ships. But rather than target one ship directly, they detonated the missile between two ships, doing what I'm told is only moderate damage to both. That said, however, the damaged ships have slowed slightly, and the command ship has taken the lead in its chase. The Allied fleet has disengaged from harassing the peacekeepers, directing their efforts to surround the heavily damaged ghost, which I for one am happy about. As always, I'll keep you posted as things develop here. This is Monel Farash with GNO, live from the developing situation on the frontier. Chapter 16 Home Stretch while it would have taken an hour or more to Harith Prime at sublight speed, it is only a 20 talk trip at FTL. While this is underway, the entire crew, with nothing else to do, makes their way to the med bay to check on Benny. It is the first time since the battle started that Will has been able to survey the damage to the ghost. His spirits begin to fall the moment he leaves the bridge, which was a wreck, but next to the rest of the ship, looks brand new. The main corridor connecting the forward section to the bulk of the ship is ravaged, a hastily installed patch covering a meter-wide rip in the side. The faint wheeze of escaping oxygen can still be heard around the edges. Conduits and piping are shredded, some patched and repaired, most not. The main crew space, lounge, and kitchenette, while intact, is a mess. A nearby section must have decompressed because anything not bolted down has been blown around the space. The emergency bulkhead leading to the living quarters is closed, meaning that one or more of the crew berths has been exposed to space. Turning down the short corridor leading to the med bay, Will sees more ruptured pipe and torn wiring. The med bay, surprisingly, is in pretty good shape. The small space has only two beds, with the auto dock wedged between them. Equipment overhead can seal off one or both beds into surgical suites, if necessary. Benny is laying on one of the beds, the auto dock in standby mode beside him. He doesn't look too bad, Will comments. Almost peaceful, Maxim says. Zephyr checks the wall display set above the head of the bed, assessing Benny's vitals. Looks like he'll live. The autodoc set the broken bones and relieved the swelling in his brain. I guess that head wound was worse than I thought, she adds, almost a whisper. Thank you, Maxim, for getting him down here. Maxim looks from Benny to Zephyr. Of course, he's crew. He places his big hand on the small Braylex leg. Will and Zephyr both nod. Will walks around the bed and faces the two ex-peacekeepers and the engineering bot. Max is right. Benny is, we all are, crew, family. I haven't had that in a long time. 
I didn't leave my world and home system by choice. I was kidnapped and thrust into this life. At the questioning looks on the Plorian's faces and the head tilt of the bot, he raises a hand to hold off questions. A story for another time, maybe. Suffice to say, in the last few cycles, I've been dealing with homesickness, loneliness, and I'd guess some depression as well. But these last few weeks, I've felt more alive than ever. I didn't set out to have a crew this big. Max and Zephyr were supposed to be it. I had it all set out in my head. As they say, though, plans never survive first contact. And mine certainly didn't. He looks down at Benny. I've known Benny longer than the rest of you. I'd never considered that he'd leave Fury. So he was never someone I'd considered to ask to join me. Circumstances clearly had other plans. Whatever happens next, I want you three, and Benny, when he wakes up, to know this. Your crew, your family, the ghost is and always will be your home. Will looks at Maxim and Zephyr now standing side by side holding hands. You both know that I didn't want to get involved. I didn't know about any of this when I rescued you from the Partherians. But thank you for helping me see the right path and do the right thing. Being out here on my own, doing some of the things I've had to do, seeing the things I've seen, I kind of lost track of that for a bit. Is this when we all hug? Gabe asks. Laughter breaks out from all three non-bot crew members and they moved to hug the tall bot. From the speaker in the ceiling, Attention crew, five minutes until arrival on Harith Prime. Okay, team, showtime. This isn't over yet. That peacekeeper carrier is most definitely behind us, possibly all three of them. It's gonna be a fight. Gabe, I know there's not much you can do for our sublight systems, but I have a feeling we'll be landing on the planet so I'll need you in engineering making sure our Atmo engines work. Captain, in case you have forgotten, the port engine pod is gone. And with it, the port repulsor lift. Atmospheric flight, let alone landing, will be tremendously difficult, if not impossible. Gabe warns. Shit. I forgot, actually. Well, it is what it is. I don't think we'll be safe until we're on the ground. That peacekeeper carrier on its own could likely destroy whatever space stations the Earth have. Zephyr turns. Do you think Janus would go that far? You know him better than I do, but yeah, I think he might, Will sighs. This cat is out of the bag, but if he can destroy the evidence and the witnesses, it all becomes circumstantial. The GC isn't going to explain this away easily but they have the resources to make this all look like a gigantic hoax. We have to keep that from happening. Aerith Prime The drop from FTL to sublight is rougher than normal, but considering that the ghost is no longer operating under its own power, this is not surprising. The moment they return to normal space, Will throws the throttle as far forward as it will go, knowing that only about 50% of its top speed is available. The ships that were towing the ghost have detached and are now breaking off, circling back around toward the lone peacekeeper carrier that has dropped out of FTL directly behind them. Incoming message from Commander Shritan, Zephyr announces, putting the message through on the primary display. Commander, Will greets her. Captain, you need to get to the main spaceport at the capital. Hareth Space Control will be calling shortly. The rest of us will cover you. We hope that this Commander Janus will give up once you're clearly out of his grasp. The Quillock cruiser with the GNO reporter will stay to the side to capture as much of the proceedings as possible. Good luck. Without waiting for Will to acknowledge, the screen goes blank, then returns to its default view of the planet below. Incoming missiles. Maxim announces, fleet is maneuvering to intercept. Going evasive. Well, as evasive as we can. Will amends. Incoming hail from Harith Space Control, Zephyr announces, then puts through the call on the primary display. A young Harith in a Harith Navy uniform shows on a screen. Ghost, this is Harith Space Control. We've cleared the airspace over and around Shakri Spaceport. 
Do you require any other assistance? Hey there, Hair Space Control. That's mighty nice of you, and we appreciate it. We will most definitely need help. Our port engine pod is damaged. Well, okay, it's actually mostly gone. That uh, leaves us one repulsor lift shy of what we need for atmospheric flight. Our Atmo engines are functional, but this ship isn't designed to fly on lift alone, I'm afraid. Will is fighting the controls and jerking the ship left and right as best he can to avoid as much fire as possible. Thankfully, a Zangar frigate has taken up a position above and behind the Ghost, using its shields to protect the smaller craft mostly. The young officer nods. Acknowledge, Ghost. We'll dispatch a landing assist drone. It will meet you once you clear the outer atmosphere. Unfortunately, they're not designed for reentry, so you'll have to get there on your own. But after that, it'll link up with your ship's computer and attach itself to your port side. The ship rattles, skimming the upper atmosphere. Acknowledged, and thanks, Will says, focusing on his controls. The primary display resumes the default view, a rapidly growing planet directly ahead and below the ship. Okay, everyone, hang on to something. Gabe, we good on the Atmos? Overhead, the reply comes back, garbled and barely coherent. Yes, Captain. The atmospheric engines are ready to go. I've also diverted all remaining shield power to the forward shields. Good call. Will has both hands on the flight controls. Maxim and Zephyr are hanging on to their stations tightly. On the primary display, the planet is becoming obscured by the superheated plasma forming along the deflector shields. The ship is rattling non-stop now and shaking violently. Behind the ship, the battle hasn't stopped raging. The Peacekeeper Carrier is plummeting toward the upper atmosphere, being harried at every turn by the few remaining ships capable of fighting, including the Quillant ship assigned to hold back to ensure a recording of the battle survives. A damaged Zangar frigate plows directly into the carrier, exploding and causing explosions all along the side of the ship. The Peacekeeper craft is unloading every missile battery it has, swamping the shields and defense capabilities of the defenders. A Quillant ship explodes right next to a Harith rebel cruiser, which then also explodes. This is Monel Farage with GNO for what might be my last report. The lights around the newscaster flicker, and smoke is visible everywhere. The Quillant battle cruiser we were on originally was going to stay on the sidelines to ensure a record of this incident is captured, but the Peacekeeper Carrier has devastated the defenders to the point that this very cruiser is one of the few left to bravely defend the Ghost. As you can see, we've taken a lot of damage, and I've heard there are massive casualties across the ship. I'm told the few remaining vessels that helped the Ghost into FTL to make the trip to Hareth Prime have had their numbers cut in half already. She ducks off screen as sparks erupt nearby. I'm not sure if this vessel will survive this engagement, but as long as the truth is revealed, I've done my job. Back to you in the studio. Any landing you can walk away from. As the primary display clears and the planet below comes into focus, Will can see cities covering much of the terrain, with large green spaces and forests spanning the gaps, just kilometer after kilometer of green and growing things. Will whistles appreciatively at the sight. Incoming contact, Maxim reports. The flight assist drone? Will had only seen a drone like this in use once. A freighter on its approach to a spaceport he happened to be docked at had experienced a blowout in one of its repulsors. Probably based on the appearance of the freighter from neglecting regular maintenance. The spaceport had scrambled a flight assist drone. Two, actually in the case the first suffered damage. Flight assist drones are little more than large repulsor systems with basic AI capabilities, which help get them close to the target and lock on. Once attached, the AI shuts down and shunts all controls to the ship it's assisting via a slave circuit. From that point forward, the drone is little more than a slightly ugly repulsor grav-locked onto the vessel. Once the ship is on the ground, the drone AI reactivates and takes control flying back to its base of operation. Looks like it. I've never actually seen one, but yeah, that must be it, the big Pelorian replies. Will glances over to Zephyr. Hail it and guide it in. I'm a bit busy. If you need something, call out. Otherwise, I'm going to do my best to keep us moving in a straight line. 
The drone is moving fast toward the ghost and only slows as the gap between them closes. By the time the ghost screams past overhead, the drone is almost matching its velocity. Zephyr has opened a comm link to the pilot AI, and she is guiding it in, helping to identify hard points on the hull that the drone can attach itself to. Sending you a velocity adjustment, she shouts. Acknowledged, Will replies, making the changes needed. Seconds later, the sound of something large latching onto the ship reverberates throughout. Momentarily, the controls go sluggish due to the substantial increase in weight and the drag the drone has suddenly added. But within another second, the main control display shows a repulsor active where the port engine would be, completely slaved into the ghost's central control systems. Okay, <laughs> this is kind of cool, Will says, adjusting power between the two repulsors and the atmospheric engines. Only minutes later, they're approaching the spaceport. Their target landing pad is right out front of the administration center. Several adjacent pads have been cleared. Probably a good idea, Will thinks. He's working the controls to slow the ghost down, still about a kilometer from the spaceport, when Maxim shouts something that's lost in the sound of explosions and metal tearing. Four missiles launched from the Peacekeeper carrier, at an angle impossible for the defenders to intercept have taken a wide course through the atmosphere to eventually collide with the ghost on its final approach. The flight assist drone is gone, Will gathers, as is the starboard engine pod and its repulsor. The poor atmospheric engine is also offline. He can't tell if it's there or gone. Hang on, he shouts, slamming the throttle for the atmospheric engines to full power. A loud boom resonates through the ship as the lone engine pushes the ghost up to supersonic speed. Everyone is slammed back into their seats as the ghost, which had for one second been falling like a rock, is now falling more forward than downward, though technically it's still falling. Brace! Will shouts as the ghost approaches the outer wall of the spaceport, barely clearing it. A loud scraping erupts from below. Warnings go off everywhere and the computer is saying something, but Will can't hear over the noise of his ship screaming through the air. Once past the outer wall, Will cuts the power to the engines. The ghost, still moving incredibly fast, drops to the ground below. The drop does little to slow the speed of the ship, which is now scraping and bouncing across the spaceport landing area, hitting random ships and bouncing like a pinball as it makes its way to the empty space that had been set aside for it. The entire bridge is dark now, the primary display first crackling with more static, then going dark, then finally in a burst of hot metal and glass, shattering completely. The three crew members hold on for dear life as their ship continues to bounce and slide across the landing area, leaving a tremendous gouge in its wake. The ghost finally comes to a slow, wobbling halt right in front of the main administration building. At least we parked where they wanted us to, Will says, then passes out. Outside the ship, Fire and rescue vessels are buzzing across the spaceport like angry insects, extinguishing fires all over the landing area and the ghost itself. Chapter 17 Aftermath Consciousness comes slowly. First in fits and starts, then a moment that feels like awakening, then nothing. Then another fit of wakefulness, followed by darkness again. How long this continues is anyone's guess, at least from Will's perspective, before the waking moments become more frequent and last longer. Voices drift in and out of his hearing, mostly sounds that aren't recognizable, but sometimes a voice that is. There's pain, too, so much pain, but there's no focus to it. Like he remembers from broken bones just an all-over, head-to-toe ache. It starts as only a slightly less complete darkness. Then there's some haziness, before the haziness begins to take on shapes. At the same time, the voices, both familiar and not, have returned. Gradually, the haze lessens. Uh, Will rasps out. Did anyone get the number of that dump truck that sat on me? What's a dump truck? One of the familiar voices says. As the haze clears more, Will can see there is a giant of a man next to his bed, Maxim. 
Oh, hey, Max. Will's voice is a whisper. His throat is dry. Water, anyone? He feels a straw touch his lips and drinks down a small bit of the water. His throat loosens, the dryness fades. He is slowly feeling more human, not that he recalls what that means anymore. Better. Another familiar voice speaks. Does this mean I can't have his quarters? There's a shuffling, then a thunk. Then the same voice saying, ouch! Will grimaces. He lived, huh? Benny lets out a growl. Nice to see you too! He looks more or less intact, Will can see now. The auto doc did a great job setting his broken bones, so instead of a cast on his arm and leg, he only has bandages. Will smiles and blinks a few times. The haze retreats, the room coming back into focus. It's a hospital of some type. Zephyr and Maxim are there, Benny too. But where's Gabe? There's also a nurse and a doctor, or at least that's what Will assumes they are, both Harith. We're on Harith Prime. We didn't die, Will says. At least I hope we didn't die, because if this is the afterlife, I want my money back. Do any of you know what he's talking about? The doctor asks, looking around the room. We rarely do, Zephyr replies. It's apparently a human thing. She shrugs and reaches down to grasp Will's forearm. It's good to see you, Will. We were worried there for a while. You were pretty beat up when they found us. She and Maxim both look fairly good. Throw scrapes and bruises are visible, almost healed, and Maxim has a bandage of some type on his arm and hand, mostly hidden by his shirt. Will looks around. I don't remember anything after taking those missiles. What happened? The doctor, a tall Harith woman, raises a hand to interrupt. Captain Calder, I'm Dr. Shrin Natath. You've been in a coma for five weeks. We honestly weren't sure you'd come out of it. We've never treated one of your kind before, and it seems neither has anyone in our sector. She consults the tablet she's holding, taps a few things. As far as I can tell, you're fine now. We were able to repair the physical damage and hoped that the rest would work out. Not very scientific, but it was all we could do. She nods to Will as if pleased. I'll come back later to check on you. I expect your crew has much to tell you. She turns to leave, the nurse following her. Will looks at Zephyr, trying to take it all in. A coma? Five weeks? She nods. What happened? Where's Gabe? He has a terrible thought. Who's going to pay for this? Zephyr pushes his leg aside and sits down on the bed. Maxim and Benny drop into chairs they've pulled up beside the bed. It's been an interesting few weeks, to say the least. She raises her hand to stop whatever Will is about to say. Gabe saved us. I can't say for certain who went down first. But what I know is that when Gabe forced his way into the bridge, all three of us were unconscious. A large section of the ceiling had fallen on you either before or after you passed out. He pulled all three of us out through the airlock, where the rescue crews were gathering, then went back in to get Benny from the med bay. Don't worry, I can tell from the look on your face what you're thinking. Gabe is okay. He's with the ship overseeing the repairs. He stopped in to see you, then went to the spaceport. He hasn't left the ship once. Will smiles. You could have started with the whole Gabe is okay thing. Zephyr snorts. I'm a warrior, not a storyteller. Shall I go on? He nods. Once we were on the ground and the rescue crews had us, Janus took his ship and fled. No one has seen him or his ship since. And they're looking, believe me. The Hareth have filed suit against the GC, as have the Zangar and the Quillant. The peacekeepers have been recalled from most of their patrols and posts for review and overhaul. They're doing everything they can to save face. They've already publicly disavowed Janus, and those identified in the data Gabe captured or those I saw in the documents I stumbled on. But he hasn't surfaced? Aren't there like a few thousand people aboard a peacekeeper carrier? How would they all be on board with this plan? Will tries to sit up in bed. Peacekeepers are loyal, Maxim chimes in. Sometimes to a fault. It's likely Janus and his conspirators have been planning this for a while, and that whole time he was shifting people around so that the most blindly loyal and possibly corrupt were aboard his ship. Those not loyal are likely floating in space somewhere. Zephyr picks back up the story. Commander Shritan and two other ships 
one of them the Quillant vessel with the newswoman on it, gave chase, but the carrier jumped to FTL, and they lost it. Benny jumps up in his chair. You forgot the part about the rebels. Zephyr looks over at him and nods, and he grins, delighted with his chance to speak. So, obviously, the rebels realized they were played, right? They joined in a fight after we transmitted our data. But that's not all. Once things got back to the Hareth Prime, the rebels rolled over completely. Apparently, whatever their goals, they weren't willing to put their people and system in more jeopardy. The rebel leaders on the moon hunted down every contact they had. Contacts they now knew were peacekeeper agents. Two days after we crashed here, a shuttle landed at the government compound with the rebel leaders and their prisoners. They turned themselves in along with the peacekeepers. The trial started last week. The little hacker drops back into his seat, having made his contribution to the story. Zephyr nods. The GC and the peacekeepers did their best not to let the trial proceed, but then two of their members, the Quillant and the Zangar, sent more ships to blockade the planet from peacekeeper forces. The GC had no choice but to let the trial go forward. Of course, those agents have only been disavowed and left to their own device. She shakes her head. Deplorable, all of it. New Beginnings For the next two weeks, Will is confined to the hospital, where he is visited daily by his crew apart from Gabe, who so far had only sent his well-wishes. Besides his team, the doctor has been his most constant visitor. Mostly, he assumes, to learn as much as she can about humans. She's fond of poking him with things and measuring the responses. He's thankful the poking hasn't been too invasive. Monel Farage has also been to see him, once with her camera bot to record an official interview, the other times on her own, to collect background information. She had been a little banged up too, and bore a few lingering bruises from her ordeal in space, but she seemed to have taken the experience in her stride. Will is hesitant to tell her too much about his world, especially with the GC and peacekeepers in a state of turmoil. He doesn't want to risk anything happening to Earth because of this. On the day he's set to be released, he's visited by an elderly Hareth man in very nice clothes. The man closes the door behind himself before speaking. You're taller than I expected, he says by way of starting the conversation. Will just stares blankly. I'm Chancellor Tretanak. My people and I are in your debt, Captain Calder. I don't know if you grasp how close we were to giving in to the peacekeepers and letting them take care of the rebellion. As I'm sure you know, that would have been the beginning of the end of Harith Autonomy. We avoided disaster thanks to you. He bows, then walks over to the side of the bed, resting a hand on Will's shoulder. I don't know how much your crew has told you, but I take our debt to you seriously. To start with, we have hired a small army of Ankarans to come and repair your vessel. The peacekeepers protested a little, but it seemed to be the most logical place to start, and frankly, from what I'm told, was the only way to get your engineering bot to stop harassing the spaceport administrator. The old man smiles. He can be quite a force, you know that. Will smiles and nods. I haven't known him that long, to be honest. But yeah, I'm getting the sense that he's a force to be reckoned with. Agreeing to the repairs was, in fact, the only way he'd acquiesce to undergoing a forensic scan to validate the data packet you transmitted. Without him and your first officer, the case against the GC and peacekeepers would be largely circumstantial. Of course, besides all that, we've covered the hospital bills for you and your crew, as well as room and board for them while they've waited for you to recover. Will nods. Thank you. Thank you for taking care of them, of, of us. As I said, we owe you a debt, which in truth will never be repaid in full. It cannot be overstated how you secured the continued sovereignty of the Harith people. That's not exactly a small thing, the old politician smiles. At any rate, I know you are due to be released today, and I wanted to stop by and see you before the crowds get to you. Will makes a face, and the old man smiles. Oh, yes. Did your crew not tell you? Your planetary heroes. There's been a crowd outside this hospital for weeks. 
ever since it was leaked that this was the facility where the crew of the ghost was being treated. I suspect your Braylac friend might have had something to do with that. A leak, huh? Will smiles. I'm guessing this crowd has been helpful in stoking the anti-GC fires you've needed for the trials here on Tarsus. Are all humans so insightful? Something like that, Will laughs. Well, young man, I will take my leave. I'm sure your crew is here to take you to the spaceport. The Ankarans are quite fast at their work, I'm told. The old man turns and opens the door. Outside it, Zephyr, Maxim, and Benny are waiting, smiling. Benny rushes in. Come on, let's go. Aren't you ready to leave yet? He's pawing at Will, tugging at him to get up. Will stands, with some difficulty, and grabs the duffel he has already packed. I'm ready, I'm ready. Cut it out, he laughs, swatting away Benny's hands. Just like new. Chancellor Tretanok wasn't lying when he said there was a crowd outside the hospital. Easily a few thousand beings, mostly Harith, are blocking the street and several side streets in front of and rear of the hospital. Thankfully, Zephyr and Maxim have already mapped a way out of the hospital and into a ground car, which is parked a few blocks away. The trip to the spaceport is thankfully quiet. No one sees them leave, so the crowd stays at the hospital unaware. They have already called ahead, so the spaceport is ready when they arrive. It hasn't occurred to Will to ask, and no one has mentioned it, but now as the car enters the spaceport grounds, passing roadblocks and work crews, Will sees for the first time how much damage has been done. Nearly a kilometer away at the far end of the spaceport, a section of the main retaining wall is broken and crumbling, only recently covered in reinforced mesh by work crews. The gouge that marks the path the ghost had taken is still visible, but in most places now is just a section of fresh Duracrete and paint. As they come around a work truck of some type, Will sees it. His breath catches in his throat, and he lets out a kind of sobbing, choking noise. Benny looks at him with some worry. Maybe he's not better. Will smiles. I'm fine. I'm fine. I just can't believe it. She's more beautiful than ever. Tears are freely flowing down his face. They get out of the car together and walk toward the ghost. She is no longer resting on her lower hull, but sitting on the deployed landing gear. The port engine pod is where it should be attached to the ship. The various rents and gashes that Will knows once existed are all gone. The forward section isn't crumbled and dented. The cargo ramp leads to an intact cargo hold. Will lets out a low whistle. The entire hole is unblemished. Even dings and dents that existed before this whole adventure started are gone. It's like the Ankarans built an entirely new ship instead of repairing the one he had. Where are they? He asks. The Ankarans. They left two days ago, Maxim answers. Not a very chatty bunch. We tried to get them to stay so you could thank them in person. They declined. From the top of the cargo ramp comes a voice. Hello, Captain. I hope you will forgive me for not coming to see you in the hospital more frequently. As an engineer, there was nothing for me to do there and plenty for me to do here. Gabe starts to walk down the cargo ramp. Will walks up to meet him and puts his hand on the big bot's shoulder. I understand. Thank you for looking after her. Gabe bows slightly. Of course. Well, Megan and Zarsix, things are certainly getting interesting. I'm still on Harith Prime for what some are calling the trial of the century. The accused peacekeeper agents are taking the stand tomorrow, and it's anyone's guess what they'll say. They've been publicly disavowed by both the peacekeepers and the GC, but have maintained their innocence, saying they were just following orders from their superiors. Monel Farage is standing outside a building amid a large crowd of protesters and reporters alike. As this trial is hitting a critical phase, the hunt for the renegade peacekeeper, Commander Janus, and his ship have so far turned up nothing. Some say that this is further peacekeeper interference and that the ship has been located but the peacekeepers just aren't telling anyone. Who can say at this point which is the more likely scenario? 
She pauses, listening to something in her earpiece. Yes, that's correct. The last member of the crew of the Ghost, its Captain Will Calder, has been released from the hospital and is reportedly at the spaceport now. I say reportedly because, somehow, despite the sizable crowd around the hospital, Calder and his team have not been seen coming or going. I suspect they're trying their best to avoid the limelight right now. New day, same problems. Will wakes up, thankfully, in his own bed, in his quarters aboard the Ghost. It's been a week since his release from the hospital, and he's anxious to get on with his life. Despite the Ankarans leaving, the Ghost wasn't exactly ready to fly. Gabe had a few more things to do that the Ankarans deemed within his abilities to manage without them. Plus, there was the little issue of explaining the existence of the XPX-1900 missile still in the Ghost magazine. The crowd from the hospital hadn't taken long to relocate to the spaceport. Thankfully, the local police and armed forces are keeping a secure perimeter, since technically the port is closed while the repairs to its structure are being completed. The traffic is being diverted to two other spaceports nearby. Will walks into the main crew lounge to find all the others at the table eating breakfast. Benny looks up. Morning, Sleepy. Will grunts and makes his way to the coffee machine, out of habit, he reaches out to hit it a few times before remembering that Gabe had fixed it. It makes coffee now without abuse. He takes a sip from the steaming cup that it dispensed, then another, and sits down next to Benny. Okay, now I can deal with you. Benny grunts. Just then, the computer speaks up. Captain, there's an incoming message for you from a Mr. Zarsix. Well, shit. Will sighs, looking up at the ceiling. Take a message. A moment later, the computer chirps. He's saying you owe him, and you're not off the hook. Will looks around the table. Guess we'd better get going, so... Will Calder, you grow-lacking Krebneck. You're dead, you hear me? That little stunt you pulled on Hareth Prime almost ruined me. The data I went to great lengths to still, it's worthless now. My operations on Malkor are in shambles, and the consortium somehow has the idea that I'm behind the break-in at their secure storage station. Thankfully, I was able to deflect that last charge a little by giving an anonymous tip about the real identity of the thieves. Good luck. You're going to need it. Good morning. I'm Monel Farage, coming to you live from the Hareth Prime Central Courthouse. The Peacekeeper Eight, as they're being called, have been found guilty on all counts. The verdict was read moments ago, and as you can hear, the crowd outside the courthouse is elated. The convicted Peacekeeper agents will be sentenced later today, and it's assumed that they'll face the maximum punishment of life imprisonment at labor camp contributing to the overall good of Harith Prime for the rest of their lives. She puts a hand on her ear, listening. Yes, that's correct, Megan. All eight were found guilty. No, the crew of the ghost hasn't been seen since two of them testified a few days ago, but they are. She pauses and looks skyward where a roar can be heard. Correction, they were until just now, still here on Harith Prime. Another pause to listen. Yes, I'm told the trials on Atrax 3, brought by members of the GC, are nearing their middle as well, with the defense set to begin its case any day now. Now that this trial has wrapped up, I'll be making my way to Tarsus to assist our team in their coverage. Back to you in the studio. The ghost is an ever-decreasing dot overhead, atmospheric engines roaring as it gains altitude. The End I hope you've enjoyed this first adventure of The Crew of the Ghost, and that you'll continue the adventure with Space Rogues 2. Big ship, lots of guns. This has been Space Rogues, The Epic Adventures of Will Calder, Space Smuggler, Book 1. Written by John Wilker. Performed by K.C. Johnston. Copyright 2017-2018 by John Wilker. Production copyright by John Wilker.